location. Also designated location here is very important to keep in mind. So obviously, um, for when it comes to this, you know, you get that giant box and you know, these are large printers for businesses. You know, you unpack it and then you make sure everything's there, right? You make sure it has all parts and cables and then you put it together, plug it in and you know, plug it into printer into power network port at the designated location. Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it. And that kind of goes back to our designated location. For this designated location where we have placed our new printer, we have to kind of take note of the port that is there for the network uh, cable that is connected to, right? We, we, we would know, okay, well, this is the port number for this, you know, for this location. And then we would talk to our network guy or we would do it ourselves and make sure that we have a static IP address available and assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean. If you go to your network adapter properties and look at the those those settings there, you go to properties, right? And you would make sure that you have a static IP address available to you. So if you have a static IP address that you want to use for that port, uh, this can be assigned um, through the switch itself and that port would simply just use that and it would never change. And that's the whole point. It's static. We don't want it to change because we want users to connect to it every time. So when you go here into the the Ethernet adapter properties and select Internet Protocol version 4. If your company is using uh, IP version 4, you will go in here and if you have to, you would specify the static IP address. So I'm just kind of showing it to you on the computer itself, but this is what you would do inside the printer. You would say use this you know ip address if this is something you have to do this is just me explaining to you what a static ip address is and why you would need it for a printer so that users can always connect to it and know where it's at so that way they can install it on their computer afterwards and i'll show you that as well and also i would acquire driver pa package for the specific model printer unless the printer is set up to push the drivers automatically upon a request. So if printer for some reason doesn't come with driver package or software, obviously you would go to the manufacturer website, download all the drivers that you need. So let's say it's an HP, it's a HP printer, you would go to HP and specify model, get this information. And then the reason for that is if needed, we would um, basically go to Active Directory and tell Active Directory to push this driver. But just kind of hold on to that thought uh, because most new printers automatically push the drivers. So if it's a brand new computer, a brand new uh, printer, it would automatically push the driver to the user that is trying to install it. And I will go back to the Active Directory part that I've. Uh, that I've uh, that I spoke about. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added. So this is where that comes in. It needs to be, it, it would know it needs to know that it's added and it added to the domain itself, right? Active Directory, you know, domain. So what happens is you would take a host name. You would create a host name for this printer. You would assign a host name and then you would add it to the Active Directory. So that Active Directory knows that there is a printer connected to this domain. So that way it can control who can use this printer through GPO or a group policy. And what this does is it only allows certain users of that department to use the printer. So basically, once you have a group of people group of users for a specific department you can literally just add all of those people into the permissions to use that printer that's been added to actor directory so actor directory is a simple simple way to control who can who can use the printer and who cannot and that kind of goes back to our part 
uh, where it's kind of related to the driver package. If you have to specifically get the driver package, you can set up Active Directory to push the driver as somebody tries to install it. So, uh, but again, new printers will just do this automatically on their own whenever somebody tries to add it. And that is done by the uh, static IP address or the host name. And this is why I talked about it here. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well and in Active Directory. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. So of course, you would have to help them because that's your job. Remember how we talked about a static IP address here? Well, your printer with the static IP address that you assigned it to would be used by users or you would do it for them. Let me just pull up my printers menu and here we would add our printer. So the way would we would do it, we know with printers um, menu, we would simply just select add printer. So now it's searching for the printers, but usually you saw how that little that popped up this link. It usually doesn't find it right away. So you have to specifically tell it. So with the users, when it comes to users, you would simply give them the IP address and say, hey, this is the IP address for this printer. Just add it in there and it's going to automatically install it for you. But a lot of times you would do it for them. So you just click this printer that I want isn't listed because it's not going to find it most of the time. And that's okay. And now we have this menu that you may be familiar with. Uh, and remember how we talked about that IP address? Well, here it is. We can add the printer using TCP IP address or host name. So we can either use the IP address or the host name. Usually what I do, I just, you know, go by the IP address because uh, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I prefer it, but it really doesn't matter. So you have select that and then we would select next and it brings us to this menu. Here we would, for example, just type in the, you know, IP address that we've assigned it and we would, in my case, I'm just going to, you know, come up with an IP address. Let's say it's 192.168.100.1. So let's just assume that that's where our printer is located and that's its IP address. And something to keep in mind when it comes to installing the drivers, if it's a newer printer, you'll be able to simply select the check mark here if not selected. By default, it is, I believe. And what that does is queries the printer. It pings the printer and says, hey, do you have a driver? And the printer says, yes, I do. And it then automatically installs it on your computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you don't, you can later on specify the driver that you want to use. But this should be set up so it automatically does it. And then simply you will select next. And it's going to look for it. And then it's going to install it. Of course, I, I forget to mention the printer may have a port assigned to it as well. And uh, you would simply type that in after the IP address that I showed you. Okay, let's see. Uh, lastly, I would notify the users, the new printers, and the IP address. I said that already. And that was the last part of this. If you have any questions in regards to this, I know this is a little bit complicated. And that's the whole point. The title of this article is Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. Because, you know, you have to explain your steps on how to do this and I wanted to make these type of videos so you guys can kind of learn from this and to at least make it as easy to understand as possible. Whether you have experience or not, it's good to have this type of knowledge or refresher for, you know, uh, my friends that are already IT professionals like me. All right, guys, please like this video, share it with your buddies. I'm sure they will like it. And don't forget, I have those two other videos you can watch. There is a link in the description. And hey, if you want to check out my computer setup that I have, there's also a link in the description below. So if you want to check that out, that's cool too. All right, guys, I wish you best of luck and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. Today's video, I want to emphasize a video that I made in 2016. It was fairly popular uh, because it talked about unknown factors and unknown issues that you may encounter during your tech support. So this video is going to be help good for help desk or desktop support, uh, tier one help desk, tier two help desk. All of the stuff that I'm teaching is all real world experience and it will kind of go to, goes to show that I made this video in 2016 and I'll show you a screenshot uh, that I actually have done so. My point is that I have a lot of experience in working in IT, so what I'm doing is actually sharing my knowledge for free with everybody in the world. That hopefully they can learn something from it and benefit or even get a job from it. I really hope that's the case here. That being said, if you like my content, please click the like button. I really appreciate it. That's the only thing I asked in return. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And with that being said, let's take a look at this video that I made in 2016. Keep in mind, it's a little bit slower pace because at the time I was still kind of fresh when it comes to making videos, but it's an excellent video because it touches on all kinds of different things from access issues to websites not working to Outlook issues. A really good video. I hope you like it. Today I want to talk about very specific things that are related to desktop support issues that are being reported to you as desktop support personnel and this specific issue is always presented to you and i don't mean in a specific uh, trouble ticket that you receive but in specific uh, manner the trouble tickets are presented to you meaning that they are very hard to understand for example you get a ticket that just says i do not have access to something random, for example, a website or um, access to some kind of a drive or some kind of a folder or some kind of an email. But the tickets are very vague sometimes, so you cannot determine what the actual cause is because user simply cannot explain it in an efficient manner. And I understand this can be very frustrating sometimes, um, you know, dealing with users like this, customers like this, but it is important to stay calm because this happens uh, more often than than some people may realize uh, before they apply for a desktop support type of position. So again, it's incredibly um, important to be understanding as well, you know, because some folks don't simply don't understand um, you know computers I guess in the way we do right I mean that's just being realistic it doesn't mean that they are not better at other things than we are okay so let's say for example you get you know a trouble ticket says I do not have access to this drive so let's go ahead and pull this up right I don't have access to this drive and so there are a few things that could be you know that, that that could be causing the issue and we just don't know we just kind of have to go through the motions with this user in order to you know effectively and you know troubleshoot this right so we have to ask questions for example do you need access as in do you need permission access meaning that um, let's say they have a network drive installed for example like right here let's pretend this is a network drive this is this root of c and so we need to ask them do you actually need access as in being able to enter this drive right because if they don't have access permissions access to this specific drive they when they try to select this it'll just say access denied right they'll get a pop-up right or do they need simply this network drive mapped right so in this case we would just simply map the network drive right we would just simply add it pick whatever they want and you know that would be that sometimes user thinks that access is simply that right not being able to reach something rather than not having you know permissions access right but at the same time you will get you know a, a trouble ticket that says i need access to the z drive right so what is the z drive we don't know right especially if you work in a well you know most likely it will be a big organization that you work for you know in desktop support um, but you, Z drive could be anything, right? That is my point, right? What is the Z drive? So you have to ask him for specifics about it, right? Which Z drive? What is the name? What is the actual name of the Z drive, right? We could, 
we could name it anything. We could pick any letter, but if we don't know the folder path or you know the network path for this drive, we, we just simply would be just guessing. It could be anything, right? But again, it's important to be you know calm and dealing with these type of situations because this comes up of all the all the time. So we would ask him for specific. Is it share drive? Is is it called that? Is it called share drive? And which specific folder do you want it to be mapped to, right? So we need to get these specifics for them, but all they simply were stated is we need access. I need Z drive. I need access to this Z drive. But it could be any of those things. It could be you know permissions access or simply just adding it so that they have it installed of course when I click here it's it's not actually going to add it because it doesn't exist so I'm just gonna cancel out of that but same goes for you know different type of situations that you may encounter it could be saying uh, you know simple things like I don't have access to this website right we, we don't have I don't have access to the website you know making it sound like it's a you know a computer issue when in fact it might be just a website issue especially if it's an external website so um, the user might be looking at this screen basically that just says the page cannot be displayed right user could be simply looking at this so let's have a look at these images here that we found in Google right user could be looking at any of these things right the page cannot be displayed the page cannot be displayed. Um, the page cannot be displayed, right? These are just one of those things where user might say, I don't have access to this website, you know, assuming that there is something, you know, at you know, at their local PC that's causing the issue when in fact the the page simply doesn't exist, right? This is typical 404 type of page where page doesn't exist. So we have to get this type of information um, you know this type of information and kind of take it as in like you know we we simply have to research you know more into this in order to figure out what's causing it in this case chances are that user simply has the wrong link right the user simply has the wrong link we have to ask them that you know has you know ask them is, is it is it that would this start today or do you how often do you access this website and, and especially if it's one of those things is one of those things that are you know that user doesn't access on a regular basis chances are that this link has changed right but we don't know that because agent or agent or agent user or your customer simply did not provide enough information for us to you know resolve this type of issue right and that's the whole point of this video, you know, kind of being able to, you know, have the means, not well, not just the means, but the, you know, patience to deal with these type of issues quickly because we need to get more information to resolve their issue as quickly as possible, right? Another example is, you know, Outlook, Outlook issues where, you know, missing email, right? Missing emails, right? This type of thing, you know, will come up often too or and, and that could be caused by many different things too you can look at it um you know in many different ways we just have to get more information is it the archives that you're missing is it actual email that you're missing from your inbox if it's an archive you could simply be they could be simple situation where you just add the, the you know the archive file to their email fold to, to their email right um, you know that the PST file you would add it in, in, into their Outlook and they would now have access to their archive and then but to them it could be just email you know or they could be even say I'm missing a folder from my email and they could also be archived too but again it could be something that's missing from their inbox as well right it could be something that's missing from their inbox as well let me see if I can find the screenshot of that here we go so here's uh, an example. It's a little bit blurry. Let me see if I can. Oh, I hope this doesn't take me somewhere weird. Okay. Uh... Okay, let's go. <laughs> let's go back. Um, I just need a screenshot of, of an inbox. Here we go. 
I think this is it, right? So in inbox, right? And within inbox, you could have multiple folders, right? Anybody can just add folders and you can have a bunch of different, you know, folders. Well, chances are that user simply deleted the folder or uh, deleted email, as you can see here, or simply dragged, dragged their folder that's underneath this, you know, usually underneath the inbox and dragged it into God knows what, right? We simply don't have enough information, but they, all they say is, I am missing emails. I'm missing this and that, you know. But if they are, if they did delete, just to kind of throw this out there, if they did delete their folders within their inbox or their, their emails, um, you would have to have access. Um, I mean, it depends how long ago it was deleted, you know. It depends how long ago. it could be simply just located in their deleted folders, right? It could be just simply located in their deleted folders, deleted items, like right there, for example. You know, this is. I believe this is an older, probably Outlook 2000, 2007. Okay, so it could be simply deleted in there, but if it's permanently deleted, um, you may have to um, have access to the Exchange server, which is the email server for Outlook, right? So again, my point of this, um, almost a ramble, if you will, is that this type of issue will come up all the time in desktop support situations. So you have to have the patience to deal with this because as soon as you start getting frustrated you will overlook many things that that you would know how to fix that you normally would know how to fix so it's kind of it's it's very important to stay calm and 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 just kind of concentrate and be to the point and don't let the um you know you have to kind of take control in 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 a polite manner by asking the right questions of the user to provide so you can provide a, an effective solution to them and an efficient an efficient solution to them you know all right guys thank you so much for watching if you have time please go to facebook.com forward slash couple man like my page also i have a website called cosmicnova.com if you like technology news and and, and science um science articles um you can go visit that as well thank you guys so much i appreciate you very much well there you have it friends i hope this is very educational and very useful to you most important very useful if you like this content and you appreciate it and you feel like i've deserved your subscription please subscribe i really appreciate it thank you so much and i hope to see you next time take care hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kobo man in today's video we're going to talk about vpn virtual private network this video is really good for people trying to get into help desk or desktop support first video or first part of this video is going to be a presentation on vpn it's going to explain what vpn is how it functions why we use it and this and that the second video is going to be a VPN troubleshooting example on how to troubleshoot VPN, things to look out for. And the third part of the video is kind of a things to kind of watch out for when it comes to dealing with a VPN, especially when it comes to resetting passwords for users while they're on VPN connection. This is a really good and important video to learn, and I hope you find it very easy to follow. That being said, please take one second to click like on this button. It really means a lot to me when I when you guys do that. It really is just kind of a, a excellent and a wonderful way that makes me happy that you guys do for me. I really appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. So what is a VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And the way that usually works is, let's say you start working for some business, for some company, and they decide that they want you to work from home occasionally, right? So what they do is they give you a laptop. They give you a laptop or maybe even a desktop, but typically it's just a laptop. They give you a computer and they say, okay, take this home and then VPN from home so that way you can work for us. What does that mean? Well, they want you to connect from home to the company's network so you have access to all the resources that you normally do so that you can work from home, right? That's what the VPN is in the nutshell. So where can you VPN from? You can VPN from home, you can VPN from coffee shop, a restaurant, a store, um, you know, anywhere there is internet access, right? So this is how it kind of works. You create a virtual private connection from any other location that has access to the internet, which allows you to connect to the company's network 
and I've, I will explain what how this works. Your company has a centralized computer that deals specifically for VPN. There are servers that uh, there act as a proxy, if you will, that allows you to have access to all of the other uh, computers on that same network, on your work network, right? So you have a, a server that's a VPN server that you connect to, and this allows you to have access to the company's network, right? VPN is encrypted and it's safe. It's fully encrypted and it's safe. This is where uh, authentication comes in um, in a couple of different uh, forms, right? Um, the first thing that we need to do and have is software, right? VPN uses software. You basically open up this software that's going to be installed on your computer. You open it up and this software will typically ask you for authentication, meaning login and password. However, there is a little bit more to it, right? You come to this screen and it says username and password. And, you know, you have your normal username and password that you use for your normal computer for, for your, you know, for your computer that you go to work, you know, you go to work, you, you know, you log in with your login and password and that's fine. However, VPN is different. It's going to have a little bit more to it. Um, a lot of times, and I hope most of the time, there's a, um, a some form of token authentication involved, whether it's hard token or soft token. So what I mean by that is it's a generated, it's a randomly generated number that you use in combination with your password, right? You have your username that's most likely not going to change. It's your regular username. However, you'll have a password and combination of, of the numbers that come from the token. So imagine a hard token is basically something that's kind of small, sort of like a thumb drive size and has a randomly generated number on it that changes typically every 60 seconds. You can have the soft token that basically does the same thing. You open it up on your computer and it just displays a bunch of random numbers that change every 60 seconds. So you type in your username, your password, and the randomly generated number, and then you will log in. As a result, when you're authentica authenticated, now you have full VPN connection, which is encrypted. The company's network says, oh, okay, you're fine. Now you have full access to the network resources at the company that you work for. So it's the same as if you were sitting at the company's office, at your office, right? It's the same thing. You have full access to your work files, your emails, and everything else that's available to you at your office, right? That's the whole point of VPN. You have full access while you're at home when you create a VPN connection to all the resources at work. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hide your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right. So this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet 
from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be the exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here, where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through vpn when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. so this is the main thing that you see when it comes to vpn uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk there most of the time they're going to say i can't connect to the vpn the main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from. Let me see here from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in US. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they are launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically they tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already. 
meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%, but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software, to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So, for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, get my VPN software.com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link and keep in mind they're they're still there at this time they're not connected their problem is they cannot connect the vpn and they don't have software either so they what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to and once they go to that link they can download the software and install it so you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN. You, you see what I'm saying? There has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right, guys, I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But Keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security. So some companies, as far as I know, may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly, but you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know, maintenance, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be, it's going to vary a little bit, but in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. They're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work, so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires. Their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So 
The only thing they can do, as they typically do, is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we've gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or force to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory.
All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right click the users folder and select find. In here, you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that, you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin C-A-N so we can find this user here since we found it already we don't have to dig through the actor directory a lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it you don't have to dig and kind of like you know your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user you can just find it here and then right click and reset password and we're going to change the password to something temporarily And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Please share it with your friends. Let them know about me and ask them what they think. Are these videos useful to you. I think they are. I appreciate you watching. Have a good day and don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I wanted to talk about one of the questions that I have in my article that is called Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. And in this video, I will want to go into more of a detailed and demonstration on the answer itself. So let's go ahead and look at question number two that is within this article. And um, the question is, a user has transferred to another department within the company and their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? So the, my answer is basically in a format where you think out loud and you explain your steps on how you troubleshoot computer issues and basically is a good way for interviewer to understand that you do know how to troubleshoot. Um, various computer issues. So I explain it in first, second, third, and last format. So it's first, 
second, third, and lastly, which makes my format to answer this question four parts. So let's go to look at the first. I would ask the user if they moved to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine, right? So if somebody literally switches computers, of course, that new computer is not going to have those files that are stored at, at the other machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. So if the new computer does not have the same program, of course, it's not going to have those icons. So let's have a look at an example of how that looks like. Here is a brand new login or brand new local profile created for this computer. And if I go inside my downloads, for example, it will be empty because it's a new computer. If I go inside of documents, it's going to be empty because I moved to a new computer. If I go to desktop, it's going to be empty because I moved to another computer. And this is just a shortcut to Microsoft Edge. And what I'm talking about missing files. So it's going to miss all those files that you created on the desktop. So let's say, let me, let me show you here what I mean. So if I go here and create a, you know, just a new file, it's going to show up on their desktop. So that's considered a you know, new file. This here is just a shortcut to the file. So of course you move to another computer you haven't transferred any of your files, you haven't, you know, moved them to another computer, of course, it's going to be empty. So that's why I explained it in such a way. Second thing is, let's say you missing icons for the computer. Of course, you're just going to have whatever's installed on this computer. This computer just happens to have Audacity, Google Chrome, OBS Studio, Open Office, you know, and etc. But if you happen to have, you know, Microsoft Office, and you had a shortcut to Outlook, to Excel, to anything else on your desktop, of course, it's not going to be there because this computer doesn't have that installed. Okay, now let's go to the second uh, part of that answer. Okay, and second here, it says, if user has not moved to another machine, I would check the actor directory um, if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for users, new department are affecting the ability to create, view, or edit files. So let's have a look what I mean. If someone has been moved within Active Directory or their domain, chances are that their permissions to view, edit, or modify files have been changed, which could reflect on the way things look like on their computer. So if somebody moved to another department and that department has new restrictions in place where it doesn't allow them to view a lot of things which can be modified. For example, you would go in here and look at this PC or previously known as my computer in Windows 7. Chances are they may not even be able to see this. They may not even be able to see local C, let alone any files that are within the hard drive, right? Because changes on the domain level or within Active Directory have suddenly, you know, are suddenly preventing you or the new user to access, view, or edit any of these files. This sometimes happens. Some departments have more restrictions on their users or on their associates. They don't want them to do certain things. They don't want them to view certain things. So suddenly, they got migrated to the new new uh, part of the Active Directory where they have more restrictions. This has replicated and chances are whenever they go in here, they won't be able to see any of this. So, uh, by the way, one way, if, if you're missing, if you can't see local C drives or any of these drives listed here, you can just simply type in C. A lot of times that's actually open like that. So, let's go ahead and have a look at our third part of this answer user may have received a new domain login which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile which has the old login id attached to it so if somebody you know moves to a new department and they decide to tell them okay now you're going to use this login you know when they log in it would be just like this you know they log in and 
it would be just like this. Their new profile. This is their new profile that they got. Their, their new login is their new profile, right? And it would be empty. It would be empty just like this. So what is the reason for that? It's because their old profile has all the stuff. So let's look at root of C again and our users folder. Once we go inside of here, let's say, and, and this is the fact now, I am using this one, right? YT login. That's my login ID right now. If I previously used this one, everything that's inside of that, it's going to stay inside of that. So now I'm suddenly using this one. Of course, it's going to be empty. So in order to restore that, obviously, you will go back inside of this. Go into the, you know, if you have the permissions, obviously. Um, go inside and, you know, copy paste all the data that's within their documents and everything else on their desktop and just restore it back here, you know, into their new login. And that's the reason for that. Any time you change login ID, it's going to, you know, create everything brand new. And, you know, all the old stuff is going to be located on the old profile, which you can transfer back. Okay, now let's have a look at uh, my last last thing that I would say within, in the as, a, as an answer to this question uh, with you know during an interview. Lastly, if any of the situations described apply, I would act accordingly to resolve the issue. If user files are located somewhere else and if permitted by the company policy, very important, I would transfer them back to the user. Same goes for any missing software. So what I'm saying here is that if, if it's a common practice for their company to create backups, I would restore all of their, uh, all of their documents to them. And I would also transfer all the software that they used to have to the new computer if they happen to move to a new computer. Of course, this is all you know, depending on the company's policy, their manager at the new department may say, nope, they don't need this. So of course you would double check that to make sure that that is allowed as well. So this is very fun thing to think about because this happens a lot in desktop support where, you know, suddenly all, everything's missing and they don't know what happened because users don't know. And, you know, sometimes they'll panic and they would go and they're like, oh, I'm missing everything. Everything's missing. And you sure enough, you go in, desktop is pretty much empty. Documents are empty. Everything's empty, but they don't know what happened. So hopefully you help them or you've been notified ahead of time. So if you're a local desktop support, uh, hopefully you've been notified ahead of time that this person is moving to another department and then you can help them, you know, by creating, you know, you know, a backup of that, of their local profile, or simply moving it from one computer to another, which you can simply do over the network. You know, you can just simply go through the back door and just type in backslash, backslash, two backslashes, name of the computer, you know, name of the computer where they used to sit, and just type in C and dollar sign. This should be able to access their old computer. And once you do that, basically, it will just, you know, it will basically get you into the root of C like this. It would just say the name of the computer there rather than just C. And then it would say name of the computer would see, you know, backslash C. And then you, in here, you can just go, you know, what is that? What is their old profile? And then you find it. And then, you know, usually what I do is, you know, I go like this desktop documents i would highlight all of this usually their favorites then i would copy and then access her or his or her computer remotely that they're using currently you know go back here find their new profile whatever that may be at the, the other computer and then just paste it you know um usually <laughs> it didn't it did it like that because I did it on the same login. But if I go into and find another login, it would simply just update the profile or the folders that are there. It's not going to create duplicates. Then that only did that because I did it on the same local profile. Uh, trust me, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. All right, guys, I hope you find this video helpful in your help desk. 
desktop support or whatever it is that you're doing right so let me know if you have any questions i'm here for you to help you out so don't be shy i'll help you with any questions that you may have and let me know if you like this type of stuff smash the like button tell tell your friends about me if you you know if you like this type of stuff they might like it too all right guys i appreciate you thank you so much and have a good day Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. In today's video, we're going to talk about BitLocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment, if you will. BitLocker is used for encrypting of your drive. So for example, let's say you have a computer at work, chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software, typically would be the C drive, for example, here. So there are many types of encryption software. And for example, one of them is Sophos, but a lot of businesses are going towards a BitLocker because BitLocker is part of Windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well. BitLocker uses AES-256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it and basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access, hardware access to it. So in addition, what I'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can use BitLocker. So for BitLocker to work, you have to have Windows 10 Pro Enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 professional so that won't work if you have windows home okay i digress so let's move on so let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption so what happens is if somebody steals this computer they can literally take this c drive here they can take it out of the computer and they can plug it into their computer and they're going to slave it to their computer it's going to kind of look like this it may show up as local disk d for example and they're going to try to access it however if it's encrypted they won't be able to access it at all it would just say well you need the key to unlock this drive so there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker so if they have access to your computer let's say they steal it and you know chances are that you have a password right most of us have a password before they can log into their computer so they can't get past the password so they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer and if you don't have encryption they can literally just go inside of c they can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside and have full access to it you can see there are some important stuff in here and then we don't want them to have any access to that especially if you have passwords that are saved for example in a notepad let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password for example let's say you see you have your gmail password and then you have your login chances are you know gmail login and then you may have it saved on a in a notepad and there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption so keep that in mind if you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such which is completely normal you if you don't have drive encryption then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody you know god forbid you know this is just the worst type of you know scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways right so that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted. In our case, why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe. In this case, I don't have to play an advertisement for you. Instead of waiting 30 seconds, you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe. I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. So let me show you how BitLocker is enabled. If you just have a personal computer, you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on BitLocker. So what happens is when you click turn on BitLocker, the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible 
with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can, there are many options of doing this. For me personally, I have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know, you can, so here's an option. You can save it on an external USB if you really want to. You can save it on, uh, you can send it to your email. You can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to. Those are certainly options that you have here. And of course you have an option here that says save to your Microsoft account. I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business, it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a, you know, a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location. So it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash. So let's say user reports an issue where he says, or he or she says, my computer crashed. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this is a hardware hardware problem, let's say a motherboard died or something like that. And the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer. It won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC. So you only, the only way to do, the only thing you can do here is slave the drive. And let me just cancel this or no, let me just move this out of the way. You can slave it to your drive and they would kind of show up like this, like local disk D and then you would have an option, you would have a, like a lock key, and I'll show you this, and it would ask you for recovery key. So that's the thing, it would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote, and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else, so in case of a crash, of a hardware failure, you would have the system or a tool, it really depends on the business setup environment, it could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere, we don't know. but. I digress, you would have that key and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer. You would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save, and you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just gonna leave the BitLocker recovery key as it is. So that way I don't need, I don't need to change it anything. It's self-explanatory, I already know what it is. But I wanna show you what happens if I was just to click save here. And you can see right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC, please choose uh, another location. So let's go ahead and try desktop. We're gonna click save. Again, says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't, so that way you can recover the data, right? In case of a crash or anything like that. I mean, as far as I know, you may like, you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key. As long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it to another drive. I'm gonna to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker Keys. And I'm going to go inside of that and then I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that bit locker key where's our thing bit locker keys and here's our file if we look inside of it here are 
are keys. Here's the recovery key, here's the identifier for it, and that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well. And uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash. So you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes, and this is 256-bit encryption for your drive. Okay, now that we have the key saved, I can go ahead and, and click next. It gives you an option on how to encrypt it. You can see the encrypt disk usage, encrypt used disk space only, and it's faster. And that's set up for base brand new computer. So if it's a brand new install, this is what typically what happens. And anything else that's added to it, you save new files, programs, this and that, it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here. And But if you have a computer that's been used for a long time, you might want to encrypt the entire drive, which is slower, but this is what happens. So, you know, chances are, if you remember that you know, once your computer is reimaged, just, you know, use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well. So it's going to click next, new encryption mode. Here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use. As you can see here, there's a two different types of mode. Uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 1511 of Windows 10. And if you're unsure, you can just leave it at compatible mode. So that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of Windows that you may be running. If you're not worried about it, you can just leave it in new encryption mode because I believe the newest version of operating system, I believe it's 19 something so we're well past that either way it's fine uh, I'm just gonna leave it in compatibility mode just in case and then I'm going to it's gonna ask you are you ready to encrypt this drive encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive he says you can keep working which is fine although your PC might run more slowly so it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check in this case all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition, meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself. And you can certainly do that just to be sure. So let's go ahead and do that. And then again, don't forget, I will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a, an, an encrypted BitLocker drive. So what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the BitLocker hard drive. This is the error they get. You can see it's referring to a recovery key ID. And if you remember, it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive. So I literally put it in another computer, try to boot it from that drive as well. And then now it's saying, well, you need the key to even, even attempt to even get to the login screen of this PC. And here's our reference number. We can compare it exactly to our key. And it's this here. And then we have the identifier for it. So now it's asking for this specifically. All right, now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive. So here we are. Our encrypted drive is now slaved. Now we can see that it has a little lock key on it. So let's double check it and see what happens. Here we go again. It's asking for that bit locker recovery key. All right, let's give it a shot and see what happens with that. I'm going to open up our recovery file. Here is our key. I'm going to copy this entire key like so. I'm going to try it again. I'm going to paste that in there. I'm going to hit unlock. And there you have it, guys. Now you can see the little lock is unlocked. And now we can go inside of this, make any changes, and recover user data, which is typically located in users and under their login profile. And lastly, going back to our computer where we have encrypted it originally, we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a BitLocker. If we right click the C drive and select Manage BitLocker, we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it, or you can also turn off BitLocker if you choose so. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your support. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If you have any comments, I'll be glad to entertain them as well. And if you get a moment, please share this video with your friends. Thank you so much. I hope this helps you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, I will talk about app data. So what is the app data? What does it do? And what's inside of it? So let's go ahead and find app data 
uh, app data folder and see what we can find out and learn about it, right? This is an awesome thing to know, especially if you're in desktop support, help desk, or some kind of a system administration. By the way, if you haven't watched my video on the local profiles, I highly encourage you to watch that first. And I will go ahead and post a link right up here um, as a pop-up. So before you actually watch this video, because this kind of goes into the local profile part of it, and you need to know about local profiles before you actually start learning about this. Okay, so let's get to it. Now in C, if you go to our C, we will find our users folder, and then we're going to find our local profile. In this case, we're going to play around with uh, BUCO local profile. Once you go inside of it, we need to find our app data folder. By the way, app data is always inside of the local profile. However, sometimes it's hidden. So if you go in here and if the hidden is unchecked, the app data folder will not show up. However, if you type in app data after your local profile name, you will get inside of app data folder. And again, I'm going to go back here and I like to show hidden items because I am an IT professional, just like you guys. And now we can see that app data is there. So let's go to inside of it. Inside of app data, we have three different folders. And all these three different folders contain configuration settings. And let me tell you what the difference is. The first local folder, if we go inside of it, you can see there are a bunch of different folders for a bunch of different applications or software, if you will. And that's exactly it. Local folder for the app data contains configuration settings for all of these programs that you see. So any of these will have configuration settings for these specified applications, right? So if we go inside of, for example, uh, let's go to my side of Microsoft, we can see that there are a bunch of different things that are specific to the Microsoft products that would have configuration settings inside of it. So let's go ahead and go inside of Office. You can see there are a bunch of different configuration files. And this is why it's important to know about app data. Every time you deal with configuration um, files or configuration issues for any of applications that you're dealing with, this is where you would find the settings. So for example, let's say you're installing, let's say at your work, you're working desktop support and you're working on, let's say some kind of a, I don't know, phone software that requires you to configure it automatically or I'm sorry, manually, then you would go inside of this folder. Well, chances are you would go inside of this folder and look for those settings. This is also one way to reset settings. So let's say you want to, you know, reset settings for, let's say, Google. You you can simply go in here and just, you know, rename this entire folder or delete it, and that would reset Google settings, local Google settings. So let me go back real quick. Local pertains to only local files that are stored on your computer, hence the name local. Local low does the same thing. However, there are this is used by applications who have uh, restrictions, right? For example, let's say a program only has only is only allowed to write to certain folders and does not have access to the local regular local folder. It would go inside a local low and create a folder inside of it because local low has less restrictions. This is what would happen. Either way, both of these folders are going to be local only for this computer. So this local profile for this BUCO um, will only save these settings locally. So if you go to another computer, we'll not follow you. This is where our roaming, pro roaming uh, folder comes in. So if you see the one that says roaming, that means this is something that is roaming if you move to another computer. So this only works in a domain type of environment, meaning that you have a, uh, an account through Active Directory that you use to log into a computer at work. So you have your roaming profile, and then when you anything that's inside of this will carry over to another computer. So this is the point of the roaming and then it saves it inside of it. So let's say I am using a, you know, the main login for this, let's say, and then I log into another computer, the inside of app data, whatever's here in roaming will also carry over to another computer. All in all, app data folder contains configuration settings for all the applications, whether they're local, local low or roaming. In a nutshell, if an application cannot write to local, it will write 
to local low and install the settings there. And then if it's something that needs to follow you, it will be inside of it roaming profile, right? As simple as that. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Check out my other videos on stuff like this. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Leave a like, share, subscribe, tell your friends about me, and I wish you best of luck. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobolman. In today's video, I wanted to talk about the program data folder. This is different from app data folder, which is something I talked about in my previous video. If you're interested in that, there will be a pop-up link right up here, also at the end of the video. It's totally different because it's not user specific. So what do I mean by that? So let's go ahead and find our program data folder. If we go to root of C, um, program data folder is actually within here, but you can't see it because it's set to be a hidden object. If you enable hidden items, program data folder will show up. So it's root of C and then program data. Once we go inside of it, you can see there are a bunch of different folders in here. So what is it? Th what is this used for? In my personal experience, especially when it comes to desktop support or PC support or any kind of administration, it's related to program data that it's not user specific. So for example, let's say we have an antivirus software, which in this case, this is it right here, ImmuNet. This is what I have installed on this computer. If we go inside of it, what we'll have will be just a simple data that's shared across all users that are using this computer. So you can see here, all it is, is just an installation part of it, right? So this is where it stores it. However, some older applications will actually have an entire application installed within program data, and then it's then used and shared by all users that are using this computer. Again, this is different from app data, which consists of configuration files, and it's found under local profiles. And again, I highly encourage you to watch the video on, on app data. If you go to inside of local profile, you can see the app data folder and it has local, local, low and roaming. This is all configuration settings and data for specific programs within these files. Again, this is on another video. And if you want to watch that, please do. So if we go back to local C and pro, um, root of C and program data, it will have similar files within here. And this could be anything from entire application that's shared across all users that are using this computer or configuration settings like so. You can see there's a bunch of them here, right? And this can also have just different executables that are related to any application that's being installed. This is what I typically see nowadays. And it can also have cache data and everything else. But the main thing to keep in mind when it comes to PC support, desktop support, or help desk is that it can have settings or even entire program within program data. So this is usually, again, this is usually older program that may exist. Again, this is used for shared data across all of the users that are using this computer. And most of the time it's just data that you don't have to worry about. Again, if you go in, into any of these, you can see that it's just mostly just temporary data that you don't necessarily have to worry about or backup because it's shared, right? So whenever user, you know, is logged into this computer and they're using new profile they will have access to that and every and if the user decides to move the most important part that are within uh, their local profile which would be in roaming will be carried over anyways right so there you have it guys now you know in the nutshell what program data consists of and what its purpose is all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like it, share it, leave a comment. I'll answer any questions you may have. Don't forget to subscribe. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about three different videos, three different topics for desktop support. And if you're also learning help desk, very useful stuff. The first one is about ping command, how to use ping command and how to resolve issues using it. Second one is about trace route. Ever heard about trace RT command? Well, I'm going to talk about it and we're going to learn about it. Very cool and interesting stuff. Last thing we're going to talk about is reliability monitor. A lot of people don't know about it, but reliability monitor is kind of like software, but it's actually built into Windows. I know it's actually software, but it's part of Windows. And uh, we're going to learn about it because it's kind of cool and not many people know about it. And it can help you resolve weird computer issues that are kind of apparent and easy to actually visualize using Reliability Monitor. 
It really tells you what's going on. All right, guys, let's check it out. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. It really makes a big difference to me and my channel. It really helps me grow and whatnot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing that. So if you're doing tech support or desktop, desktop support or what have you, chances are you'll be using Pin Command. So what is Pin Command and its use? I'm going to talk about the first part of it and explain the whole thing. But my written answer here is generally the Pin Command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. So anything that is considered external resources is anything that's outside of the connection of your computer. So let's say you're using a desktop PC at work or a laptop, and then you're trying to access an external resource like a shared drive or a server or a website, whether it's internal or external, and you are you can't connect to it or there's a you know issue with latency or a lag of some sort it's running slow that's how ping command would be used and all these things are considered as external resources so something that your computer connects to over the network okay now through command prompt cmd you can type in for example ping www.microsoft.com and this is an example of a ping command so let's go ahead and open up cmd I'm going to open up command line, command prompt, or whatever you call it. I keep saying command prompt, command line. I use Linux too, so sometimes I forget which one is which. Anyways, we're going to use this example that we have here, and it's ping www.microsoft.com. So let's see what happens when a normal working website is up and running and see the result from it. Did I misspell that? Of course I did microsoft.com i'm trying to multitask here so <laughs> you will forgive me <laughs> okay so one of the first things that comes up that you will notice here is a number which is an ip address which is uh, controlled by the dns and the dns basically what it does is takes a domain name in this case microsoft.com and translates it into a an ip address which is the location of this website on a server so the server for microsoft.com is located at 23.45.133.21 so that's the ip address for the server uh, of the server for the mic for microsoft.com okay so now these are real results of the ping command for a normal running website that is up and running and there are no problems so what happens is Pin command sends four packets of data. So you can see here that it sent four packets. They are size of 32 bytes. And then it waits for a response and how long it takes to respond, which is shown here in milliseconds. So this is the first attempt from uh, of the ping to this IP address. And we can see that the response time here, that it took 14 milliseconds to respond. And then the ping command does it again, which is the second time. And this time it replied in 15 milliseconds. And then the third time, also 15 milliseconds. And then fourth time, also 15 milliseconds. Hence, four packets sent. Right? Very, very easy to understand. But of course, for it to actually respond, for actually to have a response of any sort, it has to send back four packets as well. So you can see here that the server at 23.45.133.21 also sent back four packets which were received at the same size. And then we can see that lost zero, that means it was successful. That means none of the packets failed, that all the four pings were successful. That's a, an example of successful ping command. We know everything is okay with this website. So let's go find a website that doesn't work. So I went to this website and this website kind of tells you of some of the, you know, big websites that are down. So let's kind of pick a random one here. Let's pick Trivago.com here. That's a safe website. We're going to type in ping Trivago. Well, let's do www.trivago.com. Dot com. Now, 
if this website is down like it says it is we're going to get some negative results which would be a good example of use of, of how you use a ping command and how to help you troubleshoot the issues so so far we can see that it's timing out what does that mean that the first packet was sent and it didn't connect it waited a certain amount of time didn't connect to the server or the server didn't reply i should say and then it timed out and then the second time as well i'm sorry first time second time and we're waiting for the third one third one timed out i'm sorry i didn't mean to go all full screen here let me kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so it's easier to see and we can see that all four packets sent timed out that means that the server just we you know the the ping you know waited waited you know we waited and the server didn't respond time out there's only a certain amount of time ping command will wait for a response and that's what happened and we can again see here that four packets are sent so and then zero received and in this example trivago.com is located at this ip address that's the server that's the web server for the trivago.com and now we can see that we sent four we waited we waited nothing happened we received zero because it's down and then we lost four that means we sent four and they never came back which gives us 100 percent loss of packets so how does this help us well for for one thing we know the website is down or you know a server that you're trying to access at your job is down right we can you know web server or some some other network component some other network resources you know if you have the name for it or the ip address you can just ping the ip address if you wanted to you can just type in ping you know ip address 35179.002.200 and here we go again we're pinging trivago's server again except we're just directly bypassing the domain name now we're bypassing the DN well we're not necessarily bypassing the, but we're bypassing the uh, domain name we're going directly to pinging the server itself and again it's timing out which is another indicator that the website is down so going back to the uh, my question of how does this help us aside from knowing that the website is down so if it's an external website what we would have to do is find the web uh, webmaster for it or a person who has access to the server same thing goes for if it's ex internal website so let's say your business the, the business that you work for has some kind of internal website that everybody goes to everybody uses it you know this and that and you know you don't have necessarily access to it you would find that webmaster and contact them so how would you go about that well if you know who the owner of Travago.com is, you would contact them directly, obviously. But if you don't know who the owner is based off the, the name of the Travago.com, based off the domain name, you can see who the owner is of this IP address. And this is something that uh, this is something that your company would provide this to you if you're doing tech support. So you would basically have a tool that lets you tool or you know some kind of notes or something i don't know if this is all depends on this varies from place to place you know but for example at my main job i know i will know who owns this ip address so not only can i look up to see who owns trivago.com for example i can also look up who owns this ip address and then i would contact that guy who is the owner of this ip address or a guy or a gal or whatever um, I, I would contact them and say, hey, this website is down. But the only time I would do that is if I don't have direct access to this. So let's say it, this is a server that I have, you know, that I'm running and everybody in the business here is using it as just a storage location. You know, let's say this is just a web server that hosts files for everybody in my building that I support. Well, I would simply just try this. You know, if I don't have physical access to it, I would open up remote desktop connection, type in 8.35.179.200. See if I can connect to it. 
you know and it's gonna fail because obviously I don't have access to it and you know that's okay but if I have physical access to it and I know where it's located in the data center or in a server room or whatever it is chances are this you know this server might be just turned off or you know there might be something else bad with it but at least I will know that there is something wrong going on by using the ping command and that will get me to either me fixing it or finding who can fix it and that's how you would use ping command in a business environment either way uh, for this we're going to need a command line which we're going to open up right now so in order to use traceroute we're basically going to use the example from the article it's simply typed in trace rt <clears throat> pardon me, trace RT followed by the name of the website you're trying to reach. This doesn't have to be a website. It could be a server of some sort or a switch, or I should say just an IP address of uh, a network uh, component or a location. So, and that gets me into why would you want to use trace RT? Before I even hit enter here and then a bunch of stuff comes up, I want you to understand why you would want to use it. So let's say at your work, at your office, for some reason, you cannot reach CosmicNova.com. However, from your phone, which is, by the way, on a network, on a different network entirely, you can reach Cosmic Novo just fine. Also, another example is an application that uses... Um, network connection to work for example an application that has to reach to a database that could be located in totally different state country this and that it could be at the end of the world it could be that it's not working that's another reason you would want to use traceroute or simply there is a server somewhere we can't reach whether it's used for storage or this and that we would want to use traceroute to figure out why you can't reach it from your office network but you can reach it from any other network so what it does in the nutshell traceroute it traces all the routes taken on the network to reach cosmicnovo.com in this example so it's going to map it out for me <clears throat> so think about it this way Let's say you have a date or you are going somewhere that you've never been before. You open up your phone, you go to Google or Apple or whatever it is that you're using, you type in in your navigation the address that you want to visit. And it gives you all these routes that it takes. You know, it says go straight, go left, go right, this and that. The trace route kind of does the same thing in a sense. However, trace route, it will tell you whether there are certain roads or routes that you cannot take or that they're broken or non-existent. So that's a very simple explanation of what trace route does. It tells you whether a certain turn is broken or non-existent. Hence the name trace route. I hope that's an easy one to understand there. So we're going to see an example of this. As soon as I hit enter here, we're going to see what happens and I'm going to explain uh, all the steps that it's going through. All right, hitting enter. With trace out executed, this is typically what happens. It takes maximum of 30 hops, as in 30 roads or 30 paths, if you will, in order to reach the final destination, which is this IP address for this website. And this may take a while. This is why I have a finished trace route of all the routes taken for that website and i will show you what that is right now so let's have a look at some of the things that kind of stand out the first thing the first hop that shows up is basically pinging my ip address of the local computer so the computer i'm using right now local um, ip address for that is 192.168.1.1 so that's a typical local ip address Second hop is basically trying to ping my IP address, external IP address for the internet. So my internet provider, which is Charter, is actually blocking that information for security reasons. It automatically blocks it 
There's nothing I can do about it, but it's perfectly normal to see a second hop fail timeout like this. And then you can see that hops three through eight are all from my internet provider, charter.com. Is Charter is my internet provider. And you can see all these, if you will, switches that it takes in order to access the internet that goes the outside of the charters network. So it goes through all of these and it seems everything seems fine. So that's perfectly fine. And then finally it reaches the internet and then it has to go through this switch here. And again, it looks normal. This route is normal. And then it goes to the number 10. Again, it's normal. Then we look at 11 and we can see that there is increased millisecond response not necessarily too bad because we're not talking like 80 milliseconds 100 plus or something like that however something does stand out here and that there is a third on on the third response or third attempt ping of it is there is no response whatsoever a timed out so if we are having issues connecting to the final destination potentially we could look at the switches or servers that are located at these two IP addresses. So the first one is 7214.232, I'm sorry, dot seven zero, and this other one that starts with 172. So because we see uh, no response here at all for the third uh, ping there, we can kind of possibly assume that there might be some kind of a latency issue with these two switches or nodes if you will or they could be server or whatever it is that they are we can look at that because it could be a server somewhere and the reason i say server is in a sense depending on which type of thing are we troubleshooting are we troubleshooting a website are we troubleshooting application connection this and that so it could be a you know part of the final destination of like for example application that maybe uses some kind of database that is located at the server or whatnot or server itself could be the firewall we don't know but we need to know kind of why what's causing this you know delay or lack of response whatsoever if there is a problem right but typically that's associated with higher millisecond response time so in our case this is probably just normal and chances are that these servers here just have a limit of how many times you can ping it so we're going to move on from that and then it goes through a bunch of different nodes here which could mean that it's just blocking this is very typical that these nodes are literally just blocking these type of um, connection requests which is fine we can this is pretty normal but every time you see a gap in between where it fails somewhere this is something we would have to be concerned about and we'll potentially look at that here in a moment but this is an example of a good trace route response and then finally reaches uh, the uh, destination of 130.211.160.1 uh, which is where cosmicnovo.com is located as you can see here so it took all the routes and it took it 23 routes to get to the final destination and we know that everything is okay here all right so i found a website that's supposed to be down a safe website and let's see do i have that going here yep i had it uh, tested it's anthem.com which is basically insurance provider health insurance provider and i saw that it's down let me just double check here one more time i'm going to ping it one more time to double sh to, to make sure that it's down and then we're going to do a trace route on it to see if we can figure out what's uh, causing the problem chances are it's the web server itself but it could be something in between too so i'm going to do a trace out on that as well and then i'm going to and you can see that it failed you know sent for received zero it's timing out definitely down so we're going to do a trace route rt anthem.com and see what kind of response we can get Again, this may take a while, which I will just fast forward to the results so we can see what's going on with that. So as we are looking at the results of Anthem.com, you can see that 
they are similar to what we had earlier in the sense that it's taking same routes initially. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. See, this is the first one, and we can tell that it takes, you know, hits my LAN, and then it goes through all of these charter uh, switches, if you will. And if we go back here, we can see that they are the same switches, and it takes that same route. However, after it hits those, it decides to go another way, which was indicated, which was dictated by a this switch. This switch says, okay, well, now, you know, you're done with the charter network. Now you have to go through this something else. So let's look at the previous one. I'm sorry. Let's look at the previous one here. And did we take the same one five, one six six? So in our case, after the one six six, Charter sent us to this other one, which ends with one two, which by the way is probably next to it. So there is a switch probably next to it in the same data center. You can see how it's only off by three IP addresses. Anyways, it decided. In this case, for the anthem.com, which is this top one, it decided to bypass the next switch, which typically would have been this one, to route to cosmicnova.com. Um, well, well, it had to take another one here. So instead of going to any of these other ones, you can see that this one just said, okay, well, this is going somewhere else. And it takes a different route, and it goes to this other, probably, internet provider of some sort, which I'm assuming is related to AT&T. And it doesn't say that here, but the reason I know is if you look at these seven through 10, you can see that the switches names are STL, which is, stands for St. Louis, ORD probably stands for Orlando, Florida. And uh, you can see that they're called atlas.cogento kajentco.com and you can see the IP address that are connected to there. However, if you look at number 10, you can see that it says ATT here, so which is AT&T, probably Orlando. So it goes through Florida somewhere and then it continues with switches that are located or that are that belong to AT&T and then routes it further. And you can see that it hits another three gateways uh, most likely um, in uh, on, on an AT&T server before it reaches its final destination. This is still taking forever, so once it's finished, I'll, I'll show you uh, what the end result is for Anthem.com. However, I want to talk about a point of failure that may occur that may show up in trace route command. And here's a really good example. We can look at these AT&T switches here, so 11, through 13. Traceroute is can tell you immediately whether something failed and in, in the path that it's taking. So it's we can imagine that in this example that number 12 here timed out. So let's pretend this one timed out, literally timed out and we need to figure out where is it at? Who wh what's wrong with this? Chances are if it timed out that either it's blocking the uh, this type of uh, information from being sent back, which happens with my IP address here. Uh, but however, if it's just kind of in the middle here, and we know kind of just kind of by intuition that it's supposed to take another route because it goes to the third one here, but for some reason just one this one in the middle times out. That's a clear indicator of a switch that is or the switch that is just bad. So. How do we find out, you know, if it's bad or not? Well, we would have to reach out to this guy or this company and ask them, okay, well, we need to get somebody from AT&T on the call or call them or contact them and say, hey, there's a problem here. And they'll be like, okay, well, let's send me the results of Traceroute from your location. And they send it, you send it to them, and then suddenly they're like, oh, the number 12 failed, but we still know it's kind of on their network because it keeps going to their network. You see what I'm saying? It goes to AT&T. We know all three of these hops are going to be AT&T, but the middle one fails. 
that means it's still on their network and the problem is on their network and they need to look at this and they would know it would I know it would say timed out here but they would know what the next one would be or should be or whether there is a break of some sort that prevents everybody and that one switch is causing the problem so they would look at this and they say okay well we know it's on this network let's scour our network and look for this broken switch and that's the point of traceroute of course there could be other examples of that and that is let's say this one doesn't time out but there is a huge huge latency issue here that would also indicate that would also be indicated by traceroute that there is a problem so let's say their response time is like 100 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds this cause connection timeouts on the application and or a user end as well so let's say there's a huge latency here there's another reason why they would want to look at that switch or server and kind of see what's going on the reason i say server is because it could be the final destination we don't know but in our case we know it's not it's just a switch that it's taking and then with the trace route information we can send forward this information to them and say okay well you know this is probably what's going on now this thing is going to time out and i'm going to kind of tell it to skip by hitting enter the attempt for some reason it gets stuck like this waiting to get a re uh, response from the switch and then I'm going to fast forward this to the end result. So as the final result of the trace route is coming up, we can see that the uh, anthem.com is just simply down. This is what it tells us. The normal response from the trace route when everything's okay is indicated in my other window here. And you can see that the final hop gives us the final destination address in our case of anthem.com it doesn't it never reaches it and this is clear indication that there's something wrong at the web server level so the webmaster for anthem.com needs to look at it and resolve the issue at the server level so but you know when we know that the website is down for everybody this is not necessarily the reason we would use traceroute.com or traceroute to command four we would simply just use ping command to see if it's up or down but if there is an issue of latency if there is an issue of website or an application working for some people but not others that are on a different network that's when we would use a traceroute so it's for troubleshooting connection issues that are specific to a network you know meaning that just because I can reach it doesn't mean that some other people can as well. So this is how you would use Traceout to figure out where is the breaking point on their end and why can't they reach or why can't I reach a certain web server, application server, or what not. And in today's video, we're going to talk about Reliability Monitor. It's one of those tools that comes with Windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention. But it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events. So it's similar to Event Viewer, except it's a little bit easier to follow, a little bit easier to navigate through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So let's go ahead and pull up Reliability Monitor. You can simply search for it and just type in Reliability Monitor and what comes up is View Reliability History. Alternative way to get into it is through Control Panel. If you go to Control Panel, select Security Maintenance here and then expand maintenance and then from here we need to click on view reliability history we're going to click on that and now it expands our reliability monitor once more so what is again reliability monitor you can think of reliability monitor for example as a highly filtered version of event viewer so instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer, um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow. And it kind of mostly points out um, software updates and critical issues that may happen on your computer. It lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well, crashes, apps, and programs that stopped responding and other errors, of course, 
on a time-based scale. So what does that mean? That means it shows you events for every viewer, every day, I'm sorry, just like event viewer, except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this. You can see the only main thing that Keep in mind is that reliability monitor, monitor only goes back as far as one month. So it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer, which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening. So you don't necessarily need to go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer. On top of that, uh, reliability monitor it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well and that can be determined by the events that happened and it can also kind of gives you an idea why for example my computer is crashing what happened with the application why did it stop you know this and that so again it's an event viewer in a sense except it's a lot more user friendly if you will or IT support friendly. So with a reliability monitor, let's go ahead and look at an example. And here's a good one. It says here that on October 5th, 2019, something happened. So if we just click on this bar, we can see that it gives you the details as well, but it also points out a critical event with this circle, with a, a red circle with the X in it. And then we have the uh, warning one uh, war exclamation mark here which is in yellow and then we just uh, we have regular event here which is in blue so let's look at the first critical event and it says windows was not properly shut down and you can see how it's easily laid out for you and it gives you the date here and it says you know it's october 5th at 8 a.m and then of course on the right hand side of it you can click on view technical details which will give you more information on it if you select that so you can imagine you know your let's say your computer is unstable and says you know your computer is shutting down just randomly windows was not properly shut down so what does that mean it means that either somebody pulled the plug the power went out or something caused the crash so let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it and it gives you a little bit more information but as far as the computer knows it just it just knows that windows was not properly shut down so this could mean literally that it lost power and then it also in description it says the previous system shut down on uh, let's see what is this six days ago was unexpected so it gives you an idea that hey this happened also five days ago so that can give you a clue of what might be happening so you can either ask the user hey do you remember it shutting down before or you can simply confirm what the user is saying hey this happened before and then you look and look at it you, you can say hey did this happen about five days ago and then you can see that there's a pattern going on here so very similar to event viewer and of course i have a video on event viewer if you want to check that out i'll toss a link on the right hand side here so let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here Google update helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 8.08 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome for example because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer and of course it's going to have a Google update helper and then I can see well all right well something's going on here and then obviously it says here unsuccessful application reconfiguration so i'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information and again it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top and then in the description it says windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is google update helper and it gives you product version product language manufacturer google llc and then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status so at this point we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration as far as we know it could be just permission issues but at least we have an error status which is the error code 1638 so we can simply google this and find out on the internet what the what this error actually means but again it could be just simple permissions issue you know and if user is complaining about google not working properly or google chrome or this and that this kind of gives you a clue at least a starting point so let's just look at some of the uh, uh blue 
um, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another google update help uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update. So generally speaking, informational events are just that. It gives you information that something usually just happened normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC. So with this tool, we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events. You can see some of them are just blank. There is basically just means there's no issues on those days. And then we got, again, just the, you know, the blue event that happened and it's just normal. But what, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 8 53 a.m. and then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened and it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening and sure i can go through all this stuff together with you and let's just go ahead and take a quick look this one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe and it says again stop responding at 8 53 a.m and it gives you quite a bit more detail and this is going to vary from program to program of course but again it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is and for example this one says stop interacting with windows and it was closed to see uh, more information about the problem um, check the problem history in the security maintenance control panel so it gives you another starting point here it also gives you application path in some cases and you can see where this program is located and this is a windows component and then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath it, it says Notepad++ unsuccessful application installation. And uh, we can see more details of this one as well. Again, this one happened on 8.51 a.m. And it says Windows install, install the product, blah, blah, blah. And then installation success or error status. So this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information well there you have it guys this is a very useful tool in my opinion if you don't want to look all the information um, in the event viewer if you find that confusing because i can see how event viewer could be uh, harder to navigate through especially for new people to tech support so hey if you get an issue from a user or a report or user reports an issue it says hey my computer is unstable i don't know what's going on reliability monitor monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that pc all right i hope you like this video please share it with friends if you have any questions please let me know leave any likes and i will See you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video, I will talk about Gmail in comparison to Outlook. Here's the thing. A lot of businesses are actually moving away from Outlook to Gmail, probably because of the operation cost when it comes to running Outlook servers and, and this and that. That's besides the point. The point is that I'm going to teach you on how to at least try to make Gmail look like Outlook because what happens is a lot of users that are converted to Gmail from Outlook, they're going to look for similar features that are not apparent when it comes to using Gmail in comparison to Outlook. So these are the things I'm going to teach you real quick so that way you can have an easier time dealing with the transition to Gmail for your business. And of course, this could also be very helpful if you're just trying to learn about Gmail for personal use. 
So let's look at some things that are actually identical when it comes to Gmail and Outlook. You can see on the left hand side we have inbox and typical folders that come with Outlook. So when it comes to sent mail, drafts, um, you know, all email, spam and trash. Um, when it comes to some other things like categories, social promotion, updates and forums, these are not available in Outlook by default. Right. So when it comes to the left hand side functionality of Gmail, it's, I'd say, pretty identical when it comes to Outlook comparison. So, the, you know, of course, you can see that there is a button to compose and that's kind of self-explanatory. You click to compose and then you can create a new email just like in Outlook. Right. So that's pretty similar. So what is here that it's kind of different that you kind of notice right off the bat? Well, you can see that Gmail kind of looks plain. And that actually Google has been working on a little bit. So the reason I'm actually mentioning this is because this is an older version of Gmail. So what we're going to do is actually switch over to the new version of Gmail, which is what most people are starting to use now. So on the right hand side here, there's a little cog here. So for the settings, you can click it and then select try new Gmail, which should be the very first thing that shows up. So it's going to be a look different. There's a new icon that loads up and it looks look nicer and it probably has quite a more quite quite a bit more functions that are better from comparison to the classic Gmail, which you can also go back to if you really wanted to as well. Right. You can see now that on the left hand side, things got changed a little bit. And this is why I didn't talk about them initially first uh, too much about them initially, because it's slightly different. We have a couple of different buttons there that are different. So let me go over these real quick, just so you guys familiar what they are. You know what the inbox is. I don't have to tell you this where all the main, the main email comes through, just like in Outlook. The second thing is called start. Here you can see there's nothing there. Well, the point of this is actually same thing as if you were to flag as an important email in Outlook, right? Except it's kind of groups it into one. So the way you do that is just select a little star, right? You click on it and it's just called it starred. All this is just kind of marked as important. So if you go back to starred, that that email is actually there. You know, that's like one way to marking like important emails. So if I disable that, it's not going to be in there again. And here you can snooze emails, meaning that you can, uh, you know, read them later basically. So you can just set a different time and you can read them later. And I'm going to go over this real quick. And then we got the sent ones, which is basic. And we got drafts, right? So when it comes to that, that's exactly what it said. And of course you have an important tab, which you can also use to um, mark other important emails if you want. In my opinion, I just use stared because I find it more convenient. But if you want to explore this, you can certainly do so. And of course we get chats, which is not available in Outlook. And we also got all mail, right? We have something like this similar in Outlook. So basically that happens in Outlook. Whenever you search for something, you can choose. So let's say I'm searching for a test email. Then in the right hand side right here, when it comes to Outlook, and let me show you here. This is just something I was looking at previously. This is a broken Outlook, but I can show you nonetheless. If I type in test here, I can use a drop down here and just say all mailboxes. And it's going to search all of them, right? Same difference. When it comes to this here, if you select all mail, it will show all mail that is available so you can search through it. Right. And of course you got spam and trash, right? All right. Moving on to other comparison things that we need to adjust. So we make it look like outlook at least so that the users have an easier time transitioning over. All right. So the next thing that most people are kind of missing here is a preview pane right now. If you select on this email from Andy from Google. It's just going to pop it up and some people like this, you know, this is fine. And whenever you click reply, and by the way, when I click reply here, it will pop up on the bottom like so. And it kind of looks like a chat box, doesn't it? This is one thing I don't particularly care for when it comes to Google, but it is their design. But nonetheless, it's similar when it comes to Outlook, except in Outlook, it a lot of times it's just another pop up box. Um, of course, if you have preview pane enabled, which we will do right now, um, 
it's kind of similar to Outlook when it comes to that, right? So by default, the Outlook has a preview pane. Let me go back to the inbox so we can demonstrate the preview pane. So whenever you select an email, you will have a preview. By default, the preview pane is on vertically on the right side in Outlook. So we're going to enable that. If you go to settings here, which is a little cog here, it's going to bring us it's going to bring us to our settings. So the next thing we want to actually look for is advanced tab, which is third to last right here. And this is why I didn't want to go through this on the classic version because it's a bit different. And um, you know, this one actually has more things when it comes to uh, settings. So it's going to be a third to last tab. And then we're going to look for our preview pane, which is going to be down here. So we're going to have to select enable for the preview pane and we're gonna select save changes. Now it's going to reload Gmail and then we're gonna have a, another button that we can actually use to create different types of preview panes, which is actually right here. If you look on the right hand side, if you hover over, it says toggle split pane mode. And if we do that, it's going to toggle the mode. However, if you do a little drop down here, you can specify which, do you, which one you want. So if you select vertical split, this is how it's this is how it looks like. So if you select on any of these emails, let's click on Andy's email, you can see that there's a preview pane just like in Outlook by default. Of course, you can change this to horizontal split and it's gonna bring it down here, right? Simply some people like it that way, you know? So that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I'm just gonna go back to default, which is this, right? This is how it looks like, looks like on default email from now, uh, Outlook's default uh, format when it comes to email preview pane, right? So if we go here and select reply, it's going to pop up with our little reply. And this is kind of what Outlook does. It just looks slightly different, but Outlook kind of does the same thing when you have preview pane enabled, all right? So let me go ahead and remove that. And I'll actually go back to the reply part of it just so I can help you out some some very basic things that we actually need to work on when it comes to setting up our gmail properly to make sure we have a smooth transition uh, but let me show you how to change something real quick which i personally don't care for and that is a default feature within gmail that basically groups all the similar emails into one group of emails into just one for example let's see here's a, a email from google and there's another email from google um, gmail has a habit of grouping these similar emails into one group so instead of just having two emails like this it would say two just here and then when you click it it would expand and you have the ability to actually use other you can see the other related emails that came through and i don't like that because it kind of groups them together right i like to see individual emails like so right just like it is in outlook so we have to make sure that this is disabled if you are like me and you don't like your emails grouped right um so if you go back to settings here on the right hand side and then select settings this one is actually going to be in our general tab so we don't have to switch anything up here and if we just have to scroll down and look for conversation view and this is the thing that i was telling you about when it sees the emails that were the same topic are grouped together it's going to group them together if you have things that are with similar topics right or same topics if you will and it's disabled oh it's it's enabled by default so if you want to disable it just select conversation view off and now all the emails will be individual and that's how they would show up and that's the way i like it because i simply want to keep track of every single email that comes through i don't want it to be to group i don't want them to be grouped because that way i can miss especially if there's you know i don't know 20 different emails related to the same thing you know this is um the way i'm setting it up to have an outlook default feel so we're just going to keep going with that theme when it comes to this so the next thing we need to do is set up our reply signatures right you know how we can have automatic reply signatures same thing we we can set this up in gmail and then we if we go back to settings once more right we open up settings it's still going to be in our general tab and if we scroll down if we scroll down we just have to look for our signature tab it's very simple by default it's turned off but if we go here and select our radio uh, tab uh, we're just gonna click it right radio button i should say and we're gonna type in you know the typical stuff that you would type in you know and then you can sign off you know at i don't know 
cobleman.com, you know, and then type in your phone number, you know, 555, let's see, 555, 5555, right? So typical type of signature that, you know, whatever you want, whatever is custom for you. Once you insert that, you can select save. You have to always select save if you want any changes to take effect. So if you go back here and we want to reply to Andy, we say reply, right? We can see that, you know, where, where's, where's our signature, right? You know, usually we would just say thank you. And then we would type in body of the email, you know, and then blah blah right and i'm like okay where's where's my signature i like my signature to be right after i type things right after the body i wanted to finish off there here's the problem with when you set it up by default it actually doesn't do that and i i personally do not like that so what happens is if you if i click here show trimmed content it's actually going to show it that it's, it's going to show it as in the last thing after the initial email sent to me which doesn't make sense to me whatsoever. Why should I sign off on an email that was already sent to me by somebody else? I don't like that. I want this, I want this to appear, to appear right up here, right up here, right? And if you're like me, this is how you will do it. Let's go back to settings, right? Settings. And then we're going to scroll down once more. And the only thing we have to do now is select here this little checkbox and it says insert the signature before quoted text in replies and that's exactly what we want of course we're going to have to save again and now we go over here and try to reply to andy we can see that it inserted our signature right where we want it so if i type in thank you body of the email blah blah I can see that my signature is inserted there automatically exactly where I want it to be. One last thing as a kind of a tip that a lot of people also ask is how to change this so it doesn't look so bright. I don't like it bright either, you know what I mean? So let's go ahead and change the art theme. But before that, let me talk about the calendar as one of the last things that I almost forgot to talk about. A lot of people you know, like to use their calendar. I do. I love it. I love the reminders in Outlook. It's one of the best things that are part of Outlook. In this case, our calendar is on the right hand side here, and this is only available, I'm pretty sure, in the new version of Gmail. So if you're using a classic one, it means that it may not be there. I, we can double check. Let's go back to classic real quick. And hopefully it doesn't mess up my other settings. And sure enough, it's not there. You know, you have to kind of go over here and then look, you know, for the calendar. So if we go back to new Gmail, we can see that our calendar is actually on the right hand side. As soon as it loads, I know I selected it. There it goes. Okay, now we have our calendar, which is kind of similar as Outlook, except Outlook's calendar is on the bottom, uh, like here, you know, that's where it's at. And uh, unfortunately, it's on the right hand side when it comes to Gmail. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's a way to move it, unfortunately, but let's go ahead and have a look how it, you know, just take a look how it looks like. So if we select the calendar, it's gonna load whatever's available and it says, welcome, you know, that's fine. And now it's just going to show it as default just for our, for today, right? So if you have anything set up here, it's gonna show it just for today. Or you can just click on previous day forward, you know, any type of days that you want to look at, right? This, this is something I don't necessarily care for because if you, if you go back to calendar here, it kind of shows the whole calendar, right? In Outlook. So unfortunately, the only way to actually get to the full calendar thing that I know of, and I'll be very curious if you guys know a better way to go about this is to actually open in the new tab, right? So now, you know, now we have our calendar and we can actually change this to a different type of calendar that will show not just days or weeks, but even months or a year. So if you select that to months, we can see there are kind of looks like the Google's calendar in comparison, right? 
this is how I like it, right? So you can do that. And unfortunately, I don't think there is a way to do it, the, any other way to do it, unless you actually open it in a new tab, as in like a full window, right? So that's one way you can make it closer to how Outlook looks like over here, right? So as I promised, last thing we're going to do is change the theme so it's not so bright. If we go here <laughs> on our settings tab and then we select themes, we can choose from a bunch of different ones. I personally, I mean, there are a bunch of colorful ones. If, if you like that, then, you know, just kind of play around. I personally like really dark ones like this black one. And then when I switch to that, it looks so much better and easier on the eyes. In my opinion, of course, this is one of those personal preferences. So there you have it, guys. Now we have our Gmail set up to look as, as best as we could as the Outlook, right? All right, guys, I hope you like this video. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Share this video with friends if you like it. Leave a like if you like it. Hey, if you dislike it, click a dislike. That's fine, too. But again, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I have a lot of other desktop support, help desk, network administration, system administration, web development, and all kinds of other IT videos, including hardware, if you want to check that out. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I wish you best of luck and have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuma. And in today's video, I will show you how to create an archive folder within Outlook. As a desktop support personnel or help desk, you will be doing this a lot. You will get troubleshooting tickets that simply ask, can you create an archive for me? Or can you help me locate an archive file for me? Be sure to stick around because I will show you the difference between a PST and OST file because they're quite different. And the reason why you should know this and its location within user's local profile. So let's get to it. There are a couple of different ways to go about creating an archive file. There's a longer way and there's a shorter way. I will first show you the longer way, which is if you look to your left hand side on the upper left corner, there's a, a button called file, which is right up here. It's usually yellow like this. Go ahead and select that. This will basically take you to your account settings. Within here, or when you just need to select account settings and then account settings once more. And here, when we have this pop up, it will be a second tab over here where it says data file. Once we select that here, we can add an archive file. If you want to add an archive file, you would simply select add. And here you will basically choose a location for your Outlook archive file. In our case, this is the default location for, we're just gonna leave it at that. So we're just gonna rename it to our new archive. So that way we can find it and I can show you exactly where it's at and just go ahead and select okay. Now, if you noticed on our left-hand side right here, a new thing has appeared and this is our archive folder. So let's go ahead and close this so we can see what we have here. This is our new archive, and if you expand that, there's really nothing there besides delete items folder and search folders file. If you want to recommend the users, you can simply say, if you want to create new folders within, you can simply do so by right-clicking it and then create a new folder. They can name it whatever they want. Let's say they can call it inbox, right? They can call it inbox, and now they have an inbox folder. And if they want to drag and drop things from their inbox, right now mine is empty, but if there were emails right here, they would select on their main inbox and they would drag, drag and drop their files that they want to store inside of this archive folder. You can also set up a rule that basically moves all of your old emails into this new inbox. And you can set this up based off of how old it is. Let's say if emails are older than you know six months, have them automatically moved to here. And again, you can create new files or I should say new folders. Let's say this is just a, a name, let's say, uh, uh, old emails, right? Let's just call it old emails. Now we have a folder called old emails. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine too. But in a nutshell, this is how you do it real quick. Another way to do it is just from within here. And this is a little bit faster. If you select this second icon here where it says new items, if you select that and go all the way down, see where it says more items, let that expand and then move to the right. And you're going to have an option to select Outlook data file. This essentially does the same thing. And this one, we're just going to call it second archive. And a lot of people that need help with this will also have, chances are we'll have multiple archives. And then once we select that, then we're going to have our second 
archive folder here that we can do the exact same stuff that we did with this previous one, right? Now, let me show you the difference between that and an OST file and where these are located. So let's say somebody, you know, contacts you, let's say your help desk or desktop support, and they say, hey, I can't find my archive file. Well, I'll show you the default location where they are located. I'm just going to minimize this real quick, and then we're going to go to our root of C, right? And then we're going to go to user's local profile, and this is located in the root of C. And then we're going to select users. And here, in our case, we're logged in as the administrator. So whatever their login uh, login ID is, that's probably what's going to be the name of their local profile in here. So let's say I logged in with Koboman1. This is where uh, the archives would be that I've just created. However, I'm logged in as administrator, so I'm just going to go inside of that. So just to kind of go back real quick, we are in a root of C, right? Root of C, folder called users. And then we selected the name for the login of this user. In my case, it's the administrator. The Outlook archives are by default located in our Documents folder. So if we double click Documents, we will see our Outlook Files folder. Once we open that, we can see all the archives that we created, right? So let me just go back here again because I really like to show this as slow as possible. So it's root of C, Users, Login ID for the user that's logged in, Documents, and then Outlook files, right? Now, this is not to be confused. Uh, okay, let me show you real quick here what the file extension of this is. You can see that it's a .pst. This is why it's called a PST. This is why it's also called a PST, I should say. So Outlook data file, also known as PST. Now, this is different from an OST, which, be, which will be located in our app data. So let's go back to our um, local profile. So we're inside of our local profile. Now we need to go inside of an app data folder. In our case, it's by default app data is set to be invisible, but we know it's there. There's a folder within here called app data, right? It's hidden by default. Um, so in order to go to it, we can just simply dive in backslash app data, and it's there. Now we're inside of our app data. Just to kind of go over it again, root of C, users, name, login name for the person that's logged in. In my case, it's an administrator and then app data, right? Now we're going to look for our OST file. And the next place, a couple of more folders that we need to navigate. The next one is local and then Microsoft, right? See, app data, local, Microsoft. And then one more, which is also called Outlook. Now, once we go inside of this, then there won't be a file name in their OST at all because I am not connected to the Exchange server right now. As you can see here, there is no, I'm actually not connected. But once you go in here, there will be a file with similar icons as the, uh, the archive folder, but it will be called OST. The difference between that and the archive file is that the OST is essentially offline version of your inbox. So let's say you connect to the Exchange server, the first time you connect, it's going to start populating this. All of this is going to start to get populated because you'll have emails, this and that. Well, that has to go somewhere, right? Well, it's stored inside of the OST file, which is typically located here, right? I'm just going to create a file here just so it's better, easier to visualize. And we're going to call it, um, you know, offline email, right? Because I really want you guys to understand this. And the extension will be OST, right? It'll be something, the way it's going to look like is actually going to be similar to, uh, basically, a lot of times it's the uh, name of the user. So in our case, it's the administrator. So it'll be their login ID, and then, you know, some, you know, numbers or, or letters, you know, depending how it's set up. But it's going to be offline email for that user, right? So that's how you would basically reset it. So let's say there are any issues with the inbox, their local inbox, not the archive. You would basically go in here, right? And then you would delete their OST file. You delete it. So when the user goes back in here, it's going to be blank. They're, all their stuff will be gone, but it will be, it will repopulate. On, underneath here, you would see that, you know, when it connects to the Exchange server, it's going to say updating the folders, and it's going to eventually update this, all of this. Well, since I already have you guys here, let me show you something real quick, and that is how to reset email. So let's say a person's profile is corrupted, their email is corrupted, and 
there are issues that, uh, you know, the cars and email, you know, they can't receive, they can't send this and that. One way to receive their email profile is if you go to control panel, I'm sure you guys know how to, you know, go to control panel. If you're in Windows 10, just type in control panel. And if you're in Windows uh, 7 or something older, you can just go to start and control panel, all right? Once you have control panel open, look for an icon called mail. This controls basically everything that is about your mail, except you don't have Outlook open. If you have Outlook open, you won't be able to make any changes. So make sure that Outlook is closed before you mess with these settings. Go ahead and open up your mail, uh, double click your mail icon. And here you can view your email account. So if you select email account, let me slow down here, guys. I don't want to go too fast. So if you select email account, you will get this pop up and it looks similar to what we, would do, what we did earlier, right? It's, it's identical. It's ex essentially the same thing. If you go to data files here, we can see our archive files. Here you can remove them add them, this and that. And of course, if, if you want to add somebody's uh, archive folder, you can certainly do that. Let's say it's not added here and it's not visible in their Outlook. This is how you do it. You just click add and then you look for it, right? You will look for it, find it and click okay. And then, then it's going to appear on their left-hand side. Then that way they can see their Outlook um, archive again, right? Here we can delete also delete and remove email accounts. If you select new, we can connect to the exchange or you know do whatever we want and that's how we would add a new email account uh, this user can you know log into it this and that but how do we fully reset it right let's go ahead and close this and the way we do that is by removing the profile for the user and that would be the third tab down here right if we click on that the second tab here is just same place we were here a minute ago right a second ago i should say for data files right so it's essentially the same thing we can get to from here but anyways what i'm talking about is profile email profile right we can reset this and create a brand new profile that everything is brand new to it i mean there's a way to reset this if you go manually and look for the folders uh, that that are related to this in app data this and that but this is an easy way for you guys to uh, actually do it and it will just do it for you so if you select show profiles you can see that i have one profile this is mine profile let's say this one is corrupt well we can actually create a new one so if we just click add and we name it new profile right let's call it new profile click ok now we can collect uh, select new profile right we can, you know, once it connects, you put in all the information, it's going to create a new one here, right? So I went ahead and created a new profile, right? Now we have a new profile. So how do we actually use that new profile, right? Well, if we go back in and just click OK, whenever the user launches Outlook again, it's going to go to their old one, right? And why is that? Well, because we haven't selected a new profile. So if we open it back up, go to Show Profiles, we can see that there are two of them, right? But what we need to actually change is always use this profile down here, right? And then we need to select it and check new profile, right? And then click apply, click okay. And now when the user launches Outlook again, it's gonna create a brand new profile. It's gonna reset everything for them and hopefully resolve all the issues, right? All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I try to make this one as, as clear to understand as possible. Just a reminder, I have a Patreon page. If you'd like to support me, uh, there's a link in the description box below. Also, I will be posting this video on Twitch. I'm thinking about actually using uh, using using Twitch for some live sessions, uh, I guess free tech support or whatnot. So if you're interested in that type of stuff, please let me know in below and then I might set up a, uh, a scheduled type of, I guess, meeting, if you will, where you guys can ask me questions. We can resolve some text tech related or IT related desktop support issues together. Thank you so much for watching guys. I appreciate you very much. Have a good one. Bye bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kaboomen. This is a quick desktop support tutorial on how to share an extra drive over the network. So why would you want to do this? If you want to have a centralized point on your home network and you want to share a drive that has, for example, some media files on it or some important files that you want to have quick access to or simply take up a lot of space and you want to be able to sit simply access it from another computer on the network, this is how you would do it. One way to do that is to share it. So let's go through this and how to do it. Does it say that this drive here is the drive I want to share. It's called new volume and it's under letter E. We're going to right click it and we're going to select properties and then we're going to look for a tab that says sharing. We're going to select sharing and then underneath what we're looking for is a button called advanced sharing. We're going to select that 
And then we're going to simply do a check mark right here where it says share this folder. And uh, one last thing that we have to do here in order to be able to, you know, read and write on our share drive over the network, we have to change the permissions here, which is super simple. We're going to select permissions here. And we can see that by default, everyone is allowed to do so, which normally is fine. And this is why by default, you can only read, but you cannot change or write or anything like that. And especially you don't have full control. So if you want to simply select full control and allow everyone that's on the network have access to this, you can certainly do so and that would solve your problem. However, I like to add my own login because I don't want everybody to access it. So in order to do that, I'm going to remove these. I'm going to leave it read only so that everyone can see it, but they can't make changes and I'm going to add my own login. So if, if I click add, I can add my own login name, which is used for this computer where this drive is located. This is incredibly important. You want to use the login for this computer. So login name for my computer is Kobuman0 and I'm going to, you can simply double check by click check names if you want, but I, I know it exists obviously, so I'm just going to click OK. Now we can see that it's there and it's under the name of the computer which is called Kobuman and the login name is Kobuman0. So this is important to remember here that the name of this computer where this drive is located is called Kobuman. So before we leave this pop up, or before we leave this uh, box, we have to make sure that our login is selected and then we select full control. Because if you go down to here, we can still see that everyone only has read option. And then if we do select Kobuman, we can still see that it is full control. This will allow us to create new files, folders, drop, drag and drop anything we want and full access to it. Incredibly important, all right? Now let's click apply and OK. After you click apply and OK, you can see that now this drive is being shared and it's indicated by two little guys here as an icon. Now let's go to the other computer and see what we can do to access this. Here we go. Here's our other computer that we're at. And now we just need to access it. So how do we do that? We remember the name of the computer, which is Kobuman, correct? We're going to type in backslash backslash Kobuman and then another backslash and we're going to type in the letter E which was the drive letter for our drive that is being shared over there. I'm going to hit enter and there we go. We have access to it. But wait, this is under everyone. Remember, we didn't put in our credentials at all. It may ask you at some point if you're doing this for the first time to actually put in your credentials. But if you didn't get a pop-up, you'll be using it on the default, which is everyone. So how do we rectify that? I mean, it's great. If you got the pop-up, you can just simply put in your login information. But this is just us able to access it. Let's go ahead and create what would look like just like a regular hard drive. And that is called mapping the network drive. So we're going to select our computer and we're going to select map network drive. Now let me go back, make sure you're at this tab where it says this PC and then select computer up here and then select map network drive. And here we can leave the drive letter to whatever we want. And then we're going to type in again, backslash, backslash, name of the computer, which is Kobuman, and then backslash and then drive letter. One thing to make sure to do is place a check mark right here, which says connect to using different credentials. This will let us specify the login we want to use with full control. And with a pop up here, uh, we can see that um, I already tried this earlier, but let's go ahead and this is how it looked like. I'm going to click, you know, use different account. And then I'm going to type in the name for the login on the remote computer, which is Kobuman0. And then I'm going to type in my password and select remember my credentials. You know, kind of remember to select that, click OK. And now we're inside of our drive. You can see now it comes up as a network location. Another way to do this is add a network location, but I just map it as a network drive. So now that we go inside of it, we have direct access to it. We can create new folder. We can go inside, create new files, drag and drop, whatever we want. And it's all great and dandy. This is also a good way to 
use a remote drive as a backup location if you are doing desktop support. For example, let's say you're you know, reimaging a computer and you need a remote location to use as a backup for users' profiles. This is a good way of doing it. So you have a backup. Also, if you're replacing your hard drive or something like that, that you need a good remote place to quickly back up all your files. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please share it or like it. If you have any questions, I am here to help you answer them. So feel free to ask me anything. Thank you and have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to Desktop Support Training Medley. This video serves as a training for someone who wants to do desktop support. So what I've taken is two of my very popular videos and created 18 various problems and solutions scenario for you to learn or test your desktop support skills. If you find that you can answer or deal with any of these issues on your own, well, congratulations, you are ready to apply for desktop support. If you like this video, please share it or like it. I really appreciate it and I wish you best of luck. Have a nice day. Welcome to top 10 desktop PC issues and problems. In this video, we will talk about top 10 desktop PC issues and how to resolve them. Of course, there are multiple ways to resolve any computer issues and the ones presented here provide an example of that. If you know a better solution, please leave me a comment. I would love to learn about other possible solutions for any of these issues. If you are interested in additional educational material, my channel youtube.com forward slash Kobuman has over 300 videos that you can enjoy. Additionally, if you'd like to support me, you can do so through patreon.com forward slash Kobuman link in description below. Number one, blue screen of death. Cause, typically caused by driver or hardware conflict. Solution, take a look at the dump file to figure out exactly what the cause of the error is. Alternatively, update hardware drivers, or consider the situation in which blue screen of death happen. For example, you've installed new hardware or software. Also, you might want to run hardware diagnostics. Number two, missing DLL files. Cause, typically caused by incomplete software installation. Solution. Reinstall software, find the missing DLL, and copy it to System32 and or SysWow6432 folder. Register DLL if needed through command prompt. Example, regsvr32 space and then the name of the DLL. Number three, software or application will not install. Cause, not enough drive space. Newer version already installed. You didn't install prerequisite software. For example, VC Red Disk X64, MS.NET, or DirectX, or not compatible with the operating system. Solution. Free up space on hard drive. Look for previous installation of newer software. Install all prerequisites. Acquire compatible OS. 
Number four, software or OS is running slow. Cause, lack of resources such as RAM, CPU, or hard drive. Virus or malware infection. Missing updates. Solution. Open Task Manager and look for RAM or virtual memory allocation. Any applications use all of the RAM? Adjust virtual memory if necessary. Check CPU usage levels. Check your hard drive space. Through Task Manager, check the system processes and look for sketchy names using a lot of CPU or RAM. Virus can have similar name to common Windows components. Perform full system scan for viruses. If you have a virus that you can't remove, consider OS reimage or reinstall. Install all updates for your computer. Let them finish reboot. Updates can take up resources and time. As a side note, you can also upgrade to an SSD storage for a huge boost in OS performance. Link in description below. Number five. Computer restarting multiple times. Cause. Software or Windows updates. Or a virus. Solution. Let the Windows updates finish. Windows updates alone can restart the computer many times and take a long time. Run virus scan. Number six. Suddenly, applications or computer behaving abnormally. For example, software keeps crashing, missing files, or runs slow. Cause. Virus infection or hard drive going bad. Solution. Run virus scan. Check Windows system logs for NTFS system errors or other or other hard drive related logs. Replace hard drive if necessary. Number seven. Internet or website issue. Error. 404 page not found. Cause. Page is missing or deleted. Wrong website link. Or website is down. Solution. If specific page is missing, search the website for desired content. Double check the website link because it may have been changed. If all pages are 404, contact website owner. Number 8. Computer is running hot, overheating. Cause. Poor airflow. Not enough system fans. Dust or dirt 
accumulation. CPU fan not working. CPU heatsink is loose. Power supply unit fan is not working. Computer case is open. Overclocking. Room or ambient temperature is too high. Solution. Add system case fans. Clean your computer from dust. If CPU fan is not working, replace it. If CPU heatsink is loose, attach it. If power supply unit fan is not working, replace power supply. Close the computer case. Stop overclocking. Lower room temperature or move the computer. Number 9. Low memory RAM or hard drive storage. Cause. Too many programs open, such as games, video editing software, large Excel spreadsheets, and etc. See Task Manager. Hard drive storage too small. Solution. Close application that use too much RAM and only use one at a time. Perform this cleanup to free up space. This should remove recycle bin, download folder, cache data, temp files, old operating system restore points. Alternatively, you can purchase more RAM or add a second hard drive link in description. Number 10. Very slow internet. Cause. Too many downloads at the same time. Too many computers sharing internet connection. Bad Wi-Fi signal. Virus or malware infection. Solution. Limit downloads. If too many people are sharing internet, you can limit or set max speed in router for even distribution of bandwidth. Check Wi-Fi signal distance and adjust in router. Check PC for virus or malware infection. Reset router. Call internet provider. Question number one. When using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not reachable by using a host name. What would be the troubleshooting steps to take in order to resolve this issue? Keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on and on the same physical network. First, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. Also, would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the main if it has been added. Second, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, it would determine my next step. For example, if message is cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. Third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable 
with IP address. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it could indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. Lastly, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. However, this is unlikely if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for the same time. Question number two. A user has transferred to another department within company and their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? First, I would ask the users if they move to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. Second, if user has not moved to another machine, I would check the Active Directory if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for users new department are affecting the ability to create, view, or edit files, which could also be the reason for not seeing certain desktop icons. Third, user may have received a new domain login ID, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. Lastly, if any of the situations described apply, I would act accordingly to resolve the issue. If users' files are located somewhere else, and if permitted by the company's policy, I would transfer them back to user. Same goes for any software that is missing. Question number three. Your office receives a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. How would you go about installing this printer in direct IP printing setup? First, I would unpack the printer and make sure that it has all parts and cables. Then I would connect and plug in the printer into power and network port available at designated location. Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it and acquire driver package for a specific model of the printer, unless the printer is set up to push the driver automatically and upon request. Typically, printer would push the driver. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added to the domain, and this can be done by assigning a printer hostname and adjusting GPO settings that allows the users of that department to use that printer. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. Question number four. What is the best way to install OS on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any automated systems available. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to domain. This can be assigned through Active Directory. Third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS install media to use, for example, CD or USBs. Afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. Lastly, upon image completion, I would ensure that each computer has a host name attached and is added to domain or workgroup. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. Let's just pause for a few seconds here. As you may have noticed, all of these questions require you to explain your way of doing things. 
I also have top 20 desktop support questions and answers that talk about specific technical aspects of the interview. Link in the video description below. Question number five. From a desktop support point of view, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? How would you deal with users affected by this change? First, I would make sure that users and their management is aware that this change is coming and how it will affect them. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This can be communicated with the network team. Third, I would reach out to department managers to coordinate the switch so that the production impact is minimized. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. Lastly, once all testing on a new domain is successful, a green light would be given to convert all other host machines to the new domain. Question number six. The entire building is switching over to the gigabit network and you are to assist with this process. How would you handle this project? First, I would work with the network team to decide on the new IP network ranges and make sure that certain machines receive static IP addresses. Second, if any network cables need to be upgraded, it would be coordinated with members of desktop support and the network team. For example, CAT5E is a minimum cable rating for gigabit speeds. Third, if any changes affect printers and other static devices such as servers, this has to be communicated to users and make appropriate changes to each machine. Lastly, the most important thing would be the testing part before deployment because there is a chance that certain applications require firewall exceptions for their IP or our range of IP addresses. Question number seven. One day you come into work and find that major systems are down. However, you also see that ticketing system has 50 plus unassigned or unworked tickets. How would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with both problems? First, I would ask which systems are down and how many users are impacted. This will determine which issue to work on first. Tickets would be the last priority. Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own, if possible. If issues are not related, in that case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assigned individually if manager is not present. Third, I would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manage specific aspects of systems affected. In this case, support team is essential to resolve major issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. Lastly, once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work, then I would concentrate on resolving tickets unassigned. Of course, it goes without saying that during crisis issue, all of the management would be notified of progress and solution and lastly, the root cause. Question number eight, explain a situation in which you had to deal with difficult problem and how you went about resolving it. First, an example of which I had difficulty resolving happened all the time, and this is due to not having immediate access to systems involved. Anytime I had to deal with a server network or website issue that I don't have access to, I would have to involve other groups or members of IT IT team to assist. Second, a more specific example would be a web-based systems application stopped functioning, which affected 500 plus users. And since I don't have access to the application server, the support team for that application was immediately contacted because the issue was affecting multiple users, which means the issue is not local due to that fact. Of course, the first thing I would look at is the error information that would provide clues to what the issue may be. Third, I would gather all information related to the system outage, which would typically include number of users, specific errors, example computer IP addresses affected, 
time the issue occurred and also test to see if issue persists using alternative methods. To make sure that this issue res is resolved as fast as possible, this information is crucial. Upon having this information available, appropriate support teams would be contacted. Lastly, I would work with the support team and users affected to help resolve the issue by providing feedback and testing as required. In the meantime, it is also important that management is aware of the situation and receives regular updates on the matter. This includes IT and users management. If you appreciate this video, please leave a like or share this video. Thank you so much and I wish you best of luck, my friends. Hello everyone, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. Today we're talking about an extreme situation in which we have to configure 1000 computers as soon as possible. What has happened is in this situation, your manager, your boss comes to you and he says, okay, last night, 1000 computers received this brand new application. However, it failed to configure and we need to configure it now. And we don't have time to redeploy this application with configuration files that are needed to make it work. So we need to do this right now as soon as possible. So how do we go about figuring out how to resolve this? Let's have a look. So let's get this going. First thing we need to figure out is the host names for 1000 computers. So host names or PC names, right? It's the same thing. Piece host name or PC name is exactly the same thing. What are they for 1000 computers, right? What are they? We need to find these out because we need to find this out because we need to connect to them remotely, right? So how do we find out what our PC name is? Well, we would just simply go to our computer properties and look at what the PC name is, right? In our case, see where it says computer name, um, it's test dash PC. So let's say this first computer is test dash PC. Chances are the next computer on our network will be test two, test three, and so on, right? So we need to know what are the 1000 PC names that we need to connect to, right? And I'm sure you can get this, right? The reason I'm explaining this like this because a lot of beginners in desktop support are watching my videos and I'd like to explain things just like this, you know? So now that we have 1000 computer names, we need to figure out how to configure this new program. For the sake of demonstration, let's assume that Immunet here, this program is the program that we need to configure on one of 1000 of these computers, right? So in this case, let's just go ahead and open up and see where it's, where it's located. So if you right click it, if you right click it, you can select open file location, and now we can tell where it's installed, right? This is the installation um, folder for this program, we can tell it's installed in program files, regular program files, which tells us it's a 64 bit uh, application. And as opposed to 32 bit, if it was a 32 bit application, it would be installed in program files x86. But we know now that it's a 64 bit, that's therefore it's installed in program files under ImmuNet, right? So, and it's actually within here that it was pointing to. So now we just need to figure out what are these configuration settings that we need to change, right? Chances are if your boss came up, came to you and he said, okay, I need you to configure 1000 computers. He will tell you exactly which values need to be changed and to what, right? But sometimes you just kind of have to figure out yourself. Um, if you're unsure what settings need, what settings need to be configured, you would simply open up the application, go to settings and look for the part of it that will that will point to the value that you need to use for configuration, right? Of course, it's going to be different for every program. So it's not something I can find within here, right? But this is what we need to know, you know, we need to know, you know, what are the values? You know, what are the values? Is it IP address? or something else, 
right? Depending, depending what needs to be done, right? So we need to know some of these basic things before we proceed to go to registry. Moving on, let's go ahead and open up our registry editor. Um, this will be um, located in our start menu and then in the search box type in reg edit. This is, by the way, identical in Windows 10. So you, you don't have to worry about that. Windows 7, Windows 10 registry editor is virtually identical. So now we know that we have a 64-bit application called Immunet. Let's go ahead and find it. Let's go ahead and find it. And we need to look for it in our H key local machine registry string. So let's go ahead and expand that. So it's always going to be H key local machine for the program that's installed for everyone to use, right? If it, it's some, there are some occasions where it will be, some programs will be installed for specific users, but that's not the case. It's fairly rare too. Okay, so we need H key local machine, and then we're going to go down to here to software, right? We know it's software, so this is kind of self, uh, self explanatory, which is actually nice because a lot of people are afraid of registry editor. And uh, yes, you can break things, but you can also do a lot of good things. So let's go to software and go ahead and expand this. So now we are we have we see a bunch of things here, and and don't let this scare you or anything like that. Uh, so, so, not, so since we know that this is 64-bit application, we need to actually look for a f uh, registry uh, name that it's called WOW6432Node. Um, and this is only found within 64-bit operating systems. If we go back here, we can tell that this is a 64-bit operating system here, right? 32-bit operating systems will not have this WOW6432Node. Node. Without going too much into that, let's go ahead and expand this because we know our software will be in here, right? And sure enough, here's our ImmuNet Protect registry settings for for this application, right? So next thing we need to do is look for a configuration file. And here are in, in our config in in our case, it says here it's a configuration file, right? And we can tell um, that there are some um, settings within it. That we can adjust right so when we look at this we can see some numbers right it says this is just an example one created by my by yours truly so if we double click this we can see that there is a hexadecimal version of it right if we actually click on decimal version you can tell that it's just one two three four five so if you have to for example just type in you know let's say it's a an ip address that you have to type in you would just go back in here and type in your IP address instead of one, two, three, four, five. For example, um, if we change these things, see how now the hexadecimal version of one, two, three, four, okay, one, two, three, four, five, right? Hexadecimal version of that is three, zero, three, nine, which is reflected here, right? I really want you to see this because sometimes it will not actually be numbers. See, it's three, zero, three, nine, that's the hexadecimal version. But it's actually decimal version is one two three four five as you can see here in parentheses right but if we change this let's say for example to one six five five for example and we go here to hexadecimal it's going to be six seven seven but if we just go type in here one six zero it's going to be b one it's going to be a zero right so sometimes you will see a combination of letters and numbers here as the hexadecimal version of that, right? So this is the this is just something to keep in mind. But generally speaking, this is what we need to change, right? This is what we need to change, right? Okay. So now that we know that this is the part of the software that we need to make adjustments on, we can figure out how to do this. It, it's very simple for each remote thousand computers that we have, right? Let's go ahead and close this, okay? And now we need to connect to each one of these computers remotely. It's very simple. Now that we know our names, our computer names, we can just simply go here, file, connect network registry, and let's say type in test-pc, and then we click check names. I know it says here, enter the object name, but it's actually the host names. And if we click check names, it will actually find it in our work group the name of our PC, which is here, right? We already, we already talked about this. It's called, my computer's name is test PC. And sure enough, it found that under our work group that this virtual machine is connected to. This is, uh, this computer is actually on, in this work group 
and it's called test PC. So if you're in the desktop environment, chances are well it will just it'll be slightly different. It will just have a domain name before the name of the computer, but that's fine, same difference. And if we click OK here, it will actually create another underneath here, it will create name, it would say test PC, it would say test PC here, and it would have maybe not all of these registry settings, but it will have majority of these settings. And HQ local machine will be one of them, chances are really high. So once we click OK, it will actually create a submenu. It will just be called test PC. It will, it will say test PC here, and it would have these settings in here, right? So it, it's not going to do it now because this is the name of the PC. It'll just say you cannot connect to your own computer, right? But you can get the idea that this computer, once we connect to it, let's say we did test two, and I can't do it right now because I actually don't have test two computer connected to this network, right? Uh, this is just virtually speaking. Uh, when we click OK, it will pop up with the exact same menu. And now that you are connected to this remote computer, you can do the same thing we just went through here. Open up HK Local Machine, go to Software, expand that. Go to Software, expand the software, look for a 64-bit version of this software, find it. And then we have our configuration settings of the remote computer here. We can go back here, select decimal if we want, and change this to 55555, or whatever it is that you need to change it to, right? And now you can see that it, it, it changes in a real time, and you're done. And you're done. You close all of this, go back here, connect network settings, go to the next one, test, test 2 dash PC click OK, it will connect to the next one. And then you go back here, rinse and repeat, expand software, wow, 64 bit, um, 64 bit, right. And then <laughs> select the MUNET, go back here to the next one. And, and let's say, let's say we changed our, our settings. Let's go to 666. Click OK, boom, done, next. And this way you can actually configure a lot more computers at once. Sure, you can create a batch script that will do this for you. And that's very, very much more advanced. This is just a quick way of, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the quickest way of figuring out how to configure all of these computers at once. Guys, I hope this video wasn't too complicated and, and that I went slow enough so you guys can understand the point of this and, and, and how you can actually configure a lot of computers at once. You know, so with let's say thousand computers, you can actually do this within, I don't know, an hour rather than going to thousand computers yourself, logging into manually, look for the application setting within the application. Let's say you open it up and you have to, where is it? Is it under settings here? Where is it? Where do I need to do this? And then you have to, you know, go in there and you type it in and then you have to close it and then you go back in and you have to log off the computer and then physically move to another next one, right? Instead of spending days, maybe even weeks on trying to configure 1000 computers like that with registry settings, you can do this within an hour, you know, within an hour, let's say two, it's still better than weeks or even a month, depending how busy you are. It's not like, it's not like you have no other things to do, right? Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this, share it with friends. If you're interested in science and technology news, I have a new website. It's called CosmicNovo.com. Do check that out. Share this with your friends. And I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, I am talking about user migration to a new domain. And this is directly found in my article that it's called Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. I will provide a link to that at the end of this video as a thumbnail so you guys can just click it. This is a fifth part um, out of 10 um, in the series that I am making for this. If you wanna watch the other ones, um, they're also very useful and very educational and 
a good refresher, a good practical refresher for us, the IT professionals. By the way, if you're interested in to uh, see what kind of gear I use or computers that I use at home and stuff that I have, there's also a link in the description to that if you want to check out to see what I'm using. Anyway, let's get to it, guys. So this is question number five. From a desktop support point of view and not Active Directory, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? And how would you deal with users affected by this change? So it's a two-part question. And uh, the starting of it says, from a desktop support point of view, meaning you're just a guy that works tech support, right? So this is not for somebody who is interviewing for network administration, because when I say here, not Active Directory, that would mean somebody who is a network admin, that's the part that they would deal with and not necessarily somebody who does desktop support or tech support, if you will, right? And um, how would you deal with the users affected by this change? Incredibly important. The way I explain all of my uh, answers um, is in four part format where I go from first, second, third and a last point or explanation that I give to the potential employer that might be asking me this type of question. The reason for that is so that they know that I know what I'm talking about or that you know what you're talking about as well. So that's a good way to basically present your knowledge to them so they can see, oh yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Simple as that. All right, let's get to it. So first part of my answer would be, I would make sure that users and management is aware that the change is coming and how it will affect them. So I would let them know, I would go to the users and you know their management and uh, let them know that this change is coming and I would tell them how it will affect them. So the way I would do this is, you know, there are a couple of ways you can do this. You can go to them directly and you know, go to the management first and tell them, hey, we're going, we're gonna do this. There's a big project coming. Uh, we are switching all the users. We're switching everybody to a new domain. You don't have to be too technical about it. You just kind of have to get them a gist of it because they don't, they won't necessarily know the technical parts of, of any of this. Or you can just send an email um, to everybody that is being affected. Uh, but a lot of times management will say, okay, we will handle uh, the part of letting the users know. So this is just something you would have to figure out. But the reason for that is when you switch to a new domain, uh, there are a couple of changes that could happen. Uh, users could get new local profiles. And uh, let me show you what, what I mean here. Depending how it's set up, depending how things are set up, I'm, I'm gonna wake up my here, uh, my uh, remote computer is asleep. Uh, in case you didn't know this, this actually pings the computer to, uh, it will wake up um, as soon as you do it a couple of times, it takes like three seconds, four seconds, and then eventually it gets you to it. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. When it comes to switching to a new domain, if you look at somebody's local profile, in this case, I'm using YT login, as you probably caught that um, earlier, and um, chances are pretty high that if I get switched over to a new domain, the that I may get a new login, or it would be the same login, but it would be a different domain. So ch chances are what I'm trying to say is that a new profile might end up being created next time they log in because they switched over to the new domain. So it might look something like this. So instead of just being called YT login, in my case, it could be called, and let me just create a new folder here just to show you a, um, a kind of fake profile just to show you what might happen next time you log in. So it might say ye, YT, <laughs> I said ye, YT login, and then it might be just something like this, dot new domain, or something like that. And it would specify that, you know, you have now everything that's in this one, original one, is there, but this one is empty. You get it? So. That's what might happen. However, in a you know uh, perfect world, I want to say, I have everything set up so that I have to provide admin privileges to make any changes. So in a perfect setup, this would just basically move all the files 
um, to the new login or to the new profile that I just showed you. So all the files that they had in documents, favorites, all their stuff would be moved over or they would have a different way of just making sure that everything is migrated properly. But you do have to let people know in case things go bad. They would, you know, they would log in next day and they would, wow, wh wh where's my stuff? You know what I mean? That, and that's, that's what might happen. So you just got to let them know to be ready for that. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This is, you know, obviously, guys, very, very important. Every time you work on a project, you want to make sure that you have some testing done. And uh, the way you do this, pick a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. Now, in this case, we are also assuming that computers themselves are also going to the new domain right that would perfectly make sense since users are going to the new domain of course all the computers will be going to a new domain as well so this is something that has to be tested and the way you would do that you would just choose a few machines and then you would communicate this with the network team this is why i kind of uh, said from a desktop support point of view and not Active Directory because chances are you would be working with the network team with the network team on this and they would deal with the Active Directory part of it. So you just tell them, okay, I have, I don't know, let's say five machines, convert them to the new domain and then you can log in and test it. Third, I would reach out to the department managers to coordinate the switch so that the production impact is minimized this is kind of self-explanatory um, you would basically just talk to the department managers and the, or managers in general to kind of uh, pick a good time to do this so you don't want to do it during business hours or anything like that because that would be a production impact you know what if it doesn't work then you got a lot of people potentially a thousand people let's say you have a thousand people at your location that you support then everybody might be down but this is a huge, huge deal. So, you know, we got to make sure we do that. And of course, with those five or few machines that you picked, you can have actual users, people to use them and test them. You don't, you know, you can do testing yourself, but the best way to do it, in my opinion, is to have actual users dedicated uh, that they can test this for you. And you can talk to the managers and say, hey, I need five people to test this. And then you would test this over time. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. And the reason you would, you know, involve testing of applications and website access is because the firewall settings. If the new domain already has exclusions um, for the firewall, um, then that's fine but if it doesn't have the same exclusions as the old domain then chances are some of these websites and applications may not work because the firewall would be an issue so just kind of keep that in mind these are things you have to test before you proceed with converting everybody you know what i mean so um, the last thing we want to do is once all the testing on a new domain is successful a green light would be given to convert all other machines to the new domain as well as the users. So, you know, once everything's working fine, no, there are no problems with the testing. You can, you know, you, if, if you feel comfortable with it, you can convert everybody at once. Or you can just, you know, do, I don't know, 50 at a time or something like that. You know, this is something, you know, you would uh, kind of decide for yourself. And depending on, you know, it's very situational. You know, all the businesses are different. Some businesses may not be affected that much by it. It all, there are so many factors, guys, that you would really have to kind of kind of decide on your own as you're doing the testing. And this would come just from being familiar with the place you work at, you know. And there you have it, guys. That's the end of this video. I will be mo making more. I appreciate you watching me and your support share your share 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 your well you know uh share my video if you'd like with your buddies let them know ask them what they think and uh i uh hope you watch my other videos as well they are really awesome very helpful 
very practical. All right, guys, please leave a like or a comment. I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome to my video, my friends. Uh, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. And today I wanted to talk about remote desktop and some of the troubleshooting methods you can use in order to resolve those type of issues. This idea came from my article that is called Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers that you can find in the link in the description below if you want to read it. So in my previous video, I just wanted to mention I randomly picked a situation in uh, which uh, we created a really good video about and it was related to missing files and desktop icons. If you'd like to check that out, there also will be a link available at the end of this video and in the description uh, below. So let's look at this first question that uh, we are going to uh, talk about today. And uh, it's related to when using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not, not reachable by using a host name. So let's see what happens when you normally try to connect to a remote desktop. I'm going to open up a remote desktop here and I'm going to connect to my computer that's called Tech Support. This is a host name for this computer. Now, not to be confused with the IP address. You can also connect using an IP address to a remote computer. So instead of just typing in tech support, which you would normally do when it comes to a business environment, you can also type in, and let's see, ping tech support. You can also use its IP address. And in our case, this is a version six IP address, which we would use to connect to it at computer. So in a type of, uh, in a business type of environment, chances are you would see a normal, you know, standard type of IP address that's just, you know, regular version four. And, uh, and that's perfectly fine. So instead of using the host name, you would type in that IP address in here and it would connect the same way. But normally all you would do is just type in the host name, uh, click connect, and then you can type in your login ID, which I already have. It's called YT login. And then you would, type in your password and it would connect just like this. Just a moment, let me switch my picture here real quick. There it is, okay. I almost needed to troubleshoot that first. So this is what happens when you connect to a remote computer. Now, you know, you can pretty much do everything that you would normally do and that's the whole point of remote desktop. So this is normal. But let's see what happens when I know that a computer is turned on and we try to connect to it. So my other computer is just called Kobuman. And on it, I have um, it, the remote desktop is disabled. So when I try to connect to it now from this computer, it's going to fail. And uh, we'll see what the errors are. You see, it says remote desktop can't connect to the remote computer for one of the reasons. Remote access to the server is not enabled. So what is that? What is that? Well, let's have a look. If I go to properties of this computer. So you go to properties of this computer. We can see. Okay, I just want to make sure I have this. Okay, there it is says remote access to the server uh, to the server is not enabled. That means that when we go to advanced system settings here, okay, and it's asking me for admin privileges so I can access this. If you go to the advanced system properties, and go to the far uh, right tab, which is called remote, this may be disabled like so, right? That might be the cause and that's what that is talking about. I don't know if you saw that, it actually flashed it for a second. I thought it was gonna disconnect it, although I didn't click apply or okay or anything like that. So, um, and the next thing that it says here, 
the remote computer is not is the remote computer is turned off, which is not, or a third, the remote computer is not available on the network. Right. So those are the key factors for a successful remote desktop session. However, if we go back to our question, it says here, keep keep in mind the remote computer is turned on and it's awake and it's on the same network. You see, it says, keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on, awake, and on the same physical network. So that's not the problem. So what I would, what would I do? What would I do? The way I would answer this question or troubleshoot this is, um, well, first of all, if this is an interview type of situation, I would, you know, present them, you know, few ways of going about it and what it may be. This is just to give the potential employer or a future employer um, an idea of how I troubleshoot things and also that I am indeed knowledgeable and know what I'm talking about. So I would have first, second, third, and last example of what it could be, right? So my first idea would be, well, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. And uh, the way you could check that is by going to the Active Directory you see, you, you you just see if the you know if that host name is there. For example, we used here you know Kobo Man as the name of the host. So I would go inside of Active Directory and say, hey, is Kobo Man, as in the name of the computer host name, is it in there or not? And then go from there. And then also I would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the domain, even if it has been added. So of course it could be part of the domain, but it could also be disabled. So once once it's part of a domain or Active Directory, if you will, you can have a host name in there, but if it's disabled, then it's not usable, right? So second, second thing, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, uh, if if an error comes up, it would determine my next step. So we did a ping here for the tech support, and uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the other one since we started doing that one let's ping Kobuman here cmd ping Kobuman. see there's another proof here that the computer is turned on we just can't reach it and uh the it, this is a normal ping it's a zero loss zero loss that means the computer is turned on and everything's fine there's a perfect there's connection there we just cannot connect to it as we've demonstrated earlier so what could be the problem? Let's go back to our answer for the second. For example, if the message is, it says cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. So that kind of goes back to me connecting to a computer just by using an IP address. So, and that, my third part of that actually ties into that on what the reason for that is. If there is an issue with DNS, meaning that uh, the main name service, the main name service, I think I got that, DNS, the main name service, the main name system, I think that's what it actually stands for. Uh, basically what that does is resolves, um, it basically takes the host name, in our case, Kobuman, and tells uh, the, the server or other computers on the network, what the IP address for that is. So Kobuman as the name of the computer is basically just uh, an alias, right? And the DNS basically takes that and it translates it and it forwards it to the correct IP address automatically. So if I can't connect to the Kobuman by using a host name, but I can connect using the IP address, like this, like this, if I can, <laughs> if I can highlight it. All right, control C. If I can connect to it just like that, without any problems using the IP address, that means that there is an issue with the DNS. That means the DNS is not doing its job. It's not taking Kobuman and translating it into the IP address, which it should be, right? So, if that works, you know, by using an IP address, then, you know, that's fine for now, but there is an issue. Um, third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable via IP address. And that's exactly what, that, what I talked about previously. 
If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it would indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. So, right. So, you know, another reason is, you know, if the computer has, you know, if there is an issue with the DNS, chances are it didn't replicate. So, you know, maybe the computer just got added on there and or it got moved or something like that. And the DNS server could not catch up with the change. It doesn't realize that it moved to another IP address. That could also be an issue. But generally speaking, if it can, if you cannot connect uh, to the remote computer using just a host name, then, but you can with an IP address that indicates just a DNS issue. And lastly, if physical access, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look, or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So basically, if I go to the computer physically, if I have physical access to it, you know, um, if I am at the location there working for some kind of tech, tech support there, um, I would go to the computer, log into it, and look at the D DHCP settings. So what is that? Dynamic host configuration protocol settings that are on your adapter. So I'm going to look up my adapter here and look at DHCP settings. I'm going to go in here, change adapter settings. Here is my local Ethernet too. I'm going to look at the properties. And I'm going to look at the pro properties and then I'm going to, let's see, where is it? Internet protocol version six. So we know we were using internet protocol version six. So we're going to double check that. And then we're going to check at this. If this needs to be configured manually, we would have to do so. Otherwise, this should be just set to automatic. And this is usually what you would see in this type of DHCP setting. Now, not to be confused with DHCP server itself, that's different. That's your actual like switch on the network. Or for example, your home router is a DHCP server, dynamic host configuration protocol. So I would make sure that looks good and also look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So chances are maybe there's a bad cable or, you know, because if it's on the network and it's physically connected, then chances are this is not the issue, you know. However, it's unlikely um, if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for some time. So the worst case scenario here being a DNS issue if you can't reach it with the host name only. And that's exactly what the question was about. So the point of this video is to kind of get you thinking of on how host names work in relation to the DNS and how this issue may come up whenever you use remote desktop sessions. All right, guys, I hope this video was fairly easy to follow. Uh, this is uh, a hard question to answer. Um, hence, it's in my article of top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask me. I'll answer them to my to the best of my knowledge. And uh, if you like this video, please leave a like and uh, share it with your buddies. Thank you so much. I wish you best of luck. Bye-bye. All right, here we go. The main name system, also known as DNS. In this video, I'm going to attempt to explain it in a way where it's easier to understand. Again, that's the shtick of my channel, guys. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, but before we do so, please take one second to like the video. I'm sure you will enjoy it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And let's get into it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about DNS. So for that, I think we're going to start with our most commonly used website, and that is Google.com. Com. Just by typing in google.com, you are using DNS. So even if you're unaware of what DNS is, you are using it every time 
you are using the internet. So keep that in mind. It's very interesting in the way that actually works. So if we type in DNS in google.com, if possible, it's going to pull from the wikipedia.org and it's going to give us an explanation of what it is and possibly a few images of it. We can get back to that, but let's kind of kind of glance over it to see what it says. DNS stands for Domain Name System, and here it uh, implies that it's IP, meaning Internet Protocol. So Domain Name System here implies that it's used by Internet Protocol. So the way I'm going to actually go about this video is explaining DNS to people who are not familiar with the, what DNS is, basically somebody who's new to computer science. So if we look at the quick description here, and this description comes directly from the Wikipedia, it says the main name system is hierarchical and decentralized naming system for computer services and or other resources connected to the internet or a private network. So this seems like a good source for us to actually go to, and uh, we're going to do so. We're going to go to our Wikipedia link there, and we're going to use this as our basically learning material, sort of like a textbook, because Wikipedia, although anybody can technically edit it, uh, generally speaking, is correct with the information that it's proposed or with the information that is presented, I should say. And also it's part of creative comments. So that way it's okay for me to use this text as part of my video. Okay, here we go. The main name system. And we're going to read this again real quick and I'm going to try to teach it in a way just like you would teach it in a classroom. The main name system is hierarchical and decentralized naming system for computer services or other resources connected to the internet or a private network. So if we start from the beginning here and just literally concentrate on the meaning of DNS, it will give us a really good idea and understanding of what DNS is. So if you look at first word here, it says domain. Domain is basically a group of computers a group of computers that are connected on some level in this case it's connected they're connected at the application level which basically is the entirety of the internet so if you look at the here the internet protocol suite here and it talks about application layer and has dns in here application layer is part of the OSI layer, and there are seven layers of that. Now, let's get back to the word domain. Again, domain means just a place. Okay, think of domain as in uh, back in the day of, uh, uh, well, well, okay, let's talk about King Arthur, right? King Arthur's legend, and uh, it, it's a fictional story, obviously, but you know how they have their own kingdoms and domains? That's pretty much what it is. So if King Arthur is within his kingdom, he has his domain. That's basically his area and everything around that, that he controls. That's his domain. So you can look, think about it in the same way as in computers. Okay. And you can have domains at local level, obviously, you know, just because King Arthur controls a certain amount of land and area, and that's his domain, that doesn't mean that businesses for example a large business can have their own private domain this is why it talks about private networks here at the last part of this sentence so if you work at a business they're going to have their own private domain that doesn't necessarily follow the rules or belong to internet at all it's private for security reasons right and then if we look at the other word that kind of connects to the that connects to it so the main name basically it's it's literally that it's the name of the domain so in this example the easiest example and the perfect example of that is where we are right now if you look at wikipedia.org that's called a domain name so you see how that's kind of tying tying in together so you have a domain but of course you got to name it you got to give it a name. In this case, the, the name of this domain name is wikipedia.org. And it could be anything like google.com, yahoo.com, microsoft.com, or whatever. So, where, and, so the question comes up here. 
So how does wikipedia.org here, how does wikipedia.org have a domain? Where does it get it from? Who names this domain? So if we ask King Arthur, what is the name of your domain? You know, he might say, well, it's called Wikipedia, you know, <laughs> and that's kind of, uh, but for that to happen, we need some kind of a system to actually does that. Uh, in this case, we don't, uh, King Arthur can name his domain whatever he wants, as long as it's a private domain uh, and, and you can request that. But if it's a public domain, in this case, wikipedia.org, then we need a system for that. Get it? So it's a domain name system. This is why if you were to go to a website that sells domain names, so let's say you decide that you suddenly want Wikipedia dot org for yourself you search for it and it's gonna say well looks like somebody else already reserved the right to call their uh, website or their domain that so it's a public domain name uh, this is not owned the name wikipedia might be owned by wikipedia company but it's not owned domain is not owned by anybody you cannot own a domain it's a public thing unless you reserve the right and pay for the right to use it. So if Wikipedia forgets to renew their right to use wikipedia.org and let's say I or you go to, I don't know, any of those websites that, that can sell you a domain name for your website and then you reserve it <laughs> there, that it belongs to you for that amount of time that you reserved it for. And for that to happen, you need a DNS or a domain name system, whether it's set up to work in a internet environment, which it is, um, then, or, or whether it's on a private network, in which case a private company will have their own domain, which would be called, I don't know, private network number five.com. You know, you can call whatever you want because it's going to be centralized, you know, and of course for all of, and of course for all of this to happen, you got to have some kind of hierarchy, right? Hierarchy means just an order of things. And for that, the DNS system itself controls that. So whenever you go and, you know, you try to get your own domain name, let's say Bob, Bobson.com. I don't know. It could be anything really. It could be, I want a domain name dot com you know it's are you can reserve that as well but it is a naming system for computers there is a lot more to it uh, than just getting the name for your website there is a part of it uh, that kind of talks about or explains on how it actually works in the background and what what is the other purpose of the dns so it is a naming system for computer services or other resources connected to the internet or a private network so we already explained that but let's see how it actually works why is it why do we even need it why is it even there you know aside from just being a hierarchical uh order of things like a i don't know phone book you know how you have a phone book everybody's got their own names and their phone numbers in it that's the part that's kind of what dns does as well except it instead of instead of just having um names for example wikipedia.org it will also have instead of phone numbers associated with it will have ip addresses associated with it or routed to it and just kind of hold on to that hold on to that thought and uh we will <laughs> we will touch on that here in a moment as well so let's let's read the next sentence it associates various information with the main names assigned to each of the participating entities so what are they talking about here you know how i talked about a phone book and how there are people in the phone book so there is a person's name in there and there is their phone number same thing happens with the dns you have for example wikipedia.org and then we know that's wikipedia.org. Well, the DNS system needs to know what is the IP address 
that it goes to. So in this case, you can say that the wikipedia.org is a person in the phone book, but in order to reach that person, you got to call the number, right? In this case, wikipedia.com, when you type in wikipedia.org, I'm sorry, not .com, wikipedia.org, it dials that number for you in the sense, if you will. But in this case, it's an IP address. So what is this IP address? All right, let's find out. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to co open up a command command prompt, command line. I'm going to ping it. I'm going to ping wikipedia.org. And there it is. <laughs> Here is the IP address for wikipedia.org. So if we were looking at wikipedia.org, if we were looking at a phone book or a directory, in our case, it's going to be a domain name book, domain name book, right? And looked up Wikipedia. Imagine we we're flipping through pages and we we're like Wikipedia, 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 Wikipedia.org. Aha. And then there is the number to dial, basically, to get to it. By pinging Wikipedia.org, we get an IP address of the location where Wikipedia is located, its home address, if you will, if we're still using the analogy of the phone book. Very simple. In this case, I know this looks kind of confusing. This doesn't look like a regular IP address, but this is actually a version 6 IP address. This is why it looks like that. It's a combination of letters and numbers, but I'm sure you guys are used to seeing you know, typical IP addresses like you see at home, for example, 192.168.0.1 or whatever, you know. This is just the version 6 of that IP address. These are the new homes, guys. These are the new homes that are built for the internet. All right. I hope that kind of gives you a an idea of what... I hope I'm actually successful in telling you explain to you what DNS is and what it does at a basic level uh, for somebody who is uh, being introduced to computer science. So, and of course, if you keep reading this, and I highly encourage you that you do go read this uh, on Wikipedia, it says here, most prominently in translates more readily memorize the main names to the numerical IP addresses needed for locating and identifying computer services and devices and devices with the underlying network protocols. So it basically tells you exactly what I told you in just more of a textbook type of way, you know. And then we can, um, you know, I can go through this here and just keep going through each sentence and keep breaking everything down. But then it will kind of confuse you. Uh, even more because literally first two sentences uh, can be used in my for me to explain to you uh, what the DNS stands for and if you want to kind of understand it even more on a more technical level you can literally go through here and read it for yourself uh, but again in this video I just wanted to make sure that DNS is understood for people who are just um, you know, starting to learn DNS or, hey, people, maybe people who just don't know what DNS is. Maybe they heard of it, but they don't know how it works on a basic level. And well, at least they don't know how to, they, maybe they don't understand that um, in the way I explain it. You know, I have a specific way of explaining things. And this is what, uh, uh, this is what makes me unique, I guess. And I think some people like it. And because it's just different way of approaching the same issues in the sense of how do we learn these computer terms. So the way I explain it, I always try to relate it to the real world examples as best as I can. I hope you like my style of teaching. Please let me know what you think. If you have any comments, please leave them below. You know what? If you just need help or if you want me to do make another video, just let me know. I'll gladly do them. And I like the way I teach. I try to relate it to the real world so that way it's easy to understand. I hope you appreciate this. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. You know what the most confusing thing is to somebody who is trying to get in IT? And that is trying to explain something to them right away and being way too technical right off the bat. So let's say somebody asked you to explain what Active Directory is. How would you do it? 
would you suddenly start talking about domain and start talking about user accounts, group policies, and all that stuff, they would be like, what? What are you talking about? In this video, I'm going to show you what Active Directory is to somebody who's never been familiarized with Active Directory whatsoever. They've never heard of it. I'm going to explain to them in such a way that they can relate to so it's easy to understand. As simple as that. After that, if they're interested in Active Directory, then it'd be much easier to start from there. Think about it. I explained it to you what it is in a simple terms. And then once you figure out that first part of it, then you can start to look into technical aspects of it. Imagine just trying to teach somebody how to drive. You can show them, hey, this is the steering wheel. This is how steering wheel moves. These are the brakes. This is the gas pedal. You step on that and then you brake on this and then you steer like that. Those are the basics. The only way they can learn how to drive later is by letting them use it, letting them drive the car, and then afterwards they will learn how to drive a car really well. But it's going to take some time. So this is why I'm going to explain Active Directory in a simple way to understand. So that way, if you're interested in IT, this can get you there. All right, let's have a look to see what I'm talking about here. Let's see if I can succeed in explaining what Active Directory is to people who have no clue what Active Directory is. All right, here we go, guys. But before I proceed, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference on in exposure of this video. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. So here we are. This is virtual machine with Active Directory or server 2019 data center running. What we're going to do is we're going to actually work and add some people into the Active Directory. But before I do that, let me explain to you what Active Directory is to those people who don't understand that. Uh, and by the way, my teaching in this is very unorthodox. The meaning that I don't go by the book in the sense that you sit down and they say, go to this chapter and learn this. And you know, there is a order that you followed going through the book. Well, what I'm going to do is explain it to you in a way where it actually makes sense. At least I hope it comes across as something that makes sense. So Active Directory is basically a place within a server that has your login credentials, meaning your login ID for that computer. So let's say you start working at a company and that company says, okay, you're hired now, congratulations. Here's your login ID and password. So you get your login ID. Let's say your name is Bob Johnson and you type in Bob Johnson or whatever it is as your login ID. And then they give you a password so you can log into the computer. You sit down at the computer, you use those credentials, your login credentials to log into the computer. Well, those credentials are actually coming from the Active Directory. And Active Directory within the server, within, within Windows Server, is actually located here. So if you click on Start button and then you click Windows Administrative Tools and then you select Active Directory users and computers. So get it, you as somebody who's going to use the computer is the user. Get it? You use that login information to use the computer. So Active Directory users and computers are going to be located here. We're going to simply connect or simply click on that. So as soon as this loads up, we're going to add and I'm going to show you where the users are as well. It's very simple. Uh, but we're going to add more users as a practice in this Active Directory. And if you want to follow along, you can download a trial version. You can see this is a valuation version of server. If you want to install it on your virtual machine, uh, which could be, in this case, I'm using Oracle VirtualBox software to install a virtual machine, meaning a virtual computer on my computer. And that way you don't have to have a second computer to run Active Directory on or run the server on. So you can download it. This is completely free. Okay, so we have now Active Directory users and computers. So you are the user. So guess where you would find your login ID? If you're thinking users where it says here, you'd be absolutely right. So your login ID would be in this folder. It's just like the folders that you have in your documents. You know, you go in here, let's say you open up your documents and 
you know, you go to your documents here, and this is the folder with your documents, and inside of that you might have more folders and this and that. That's the exact same thing here in within this server. There's a folder called users, and all the people that you use computers, the users, will be inside of this folder. So, to find yourself in the folder, you can just scroll down and look, where, where is my login, you know? This is a fresh, usually you would see a lot, a lot of people in here within a company, you know? But, you know, we have some in here, so that's fine. But how would you find yourself in here? You can scroll through and just look for Bob. What did we say, Bob Johnson? Here is Bob. Bob J, Bob Johnson, right? I think I said Bob Johnson. But you could also right-click the folder and click Find, which makes it the best way to find yourself or anybody else for that matter. So let's say you start working help desk and Bob Johnson calls in and says, hey, can you look me up? I need you to reset my password. All you got to do is do what I did here. You right-click the folder, you know, you click find like I showed you, and then just type in name, Bob J. I think I have him as Bob J in there. So I'm going to click find, and there's Bob. And now we can go and make changes to it. But before we do any of that, let's kind of expand on this users fat part of it. We need to, in this, um, in this uh, scenario, in this practice, and if you have, it a if you have this installed, you might as well play along while we're doing this. I'm going to go at slower pace in this video just for that. We're going to add five more people in there, at least five, I think. And we're going to come up with some names. So I'm going to come up with some common names. I'm going to say Susan Jackson. And then we're going to add her in, into that folder of the users because she's new. Susan just started working in accounting. We got to give Susan a login so she can sit down at the computer and log in, you know? And then we got uh, Larry um, Buff Buffett, I don't know, Larry Buffett, sure. And then Larry started working in accounting as well. They hired two people for this uh, uh, role-playing scenario. And then we have Mike uh let's see what was his name what, what could we give him his name mike uh bobson <laughs> i don't know i'm just coming up with names and then we're going to uh, create another one and we're going to say laura bailey and then one more we're going to say uh, why am I struggling here? It's early in the morning, guys. For me, it's like 7 in the morning, so I'm struggling to come up with days. This is kind of silly. Okay, okay, one more name. Come on, Irvin, you can do it. You can do it. I'm trying to psych myself up. Um, okay. Uh, Mary Pipkins. <laughs> All right, that's, that's good enough. So we got Susan Jackson, Larry Buffett working in accounting. <laughs> accounting group. And then we got Mike Bobson, Laura Bailey, and Mary Pipkins <laughs> working in collections. All right, collections. call center so there are those collection reps you know you know the ones that call you and collect the money trying to collect money for you okay so we got to give them login ids and passwords so that way they can log into their computers wherever they might be sitting keep in mind this is a domain you can see how it's called techsupport.coboman.com this is a domain meaning that it's a group of computers as you can see here that, that are in there, and usually this will be like populated with a lots of computers and users, uh, just to kind of keep it simple to understand. Uh, so domain is a group of computers and users uh, for an organization. So this is how you 
um, organize and control their login access. So you got to have a way to control everybody's login in a single point, which in this case is this actor directory. So again, I'm not going to go into the technicals. We're just going to learn what actor directory is in relation to just everyday work and people that use um, that you know, they use actor directory without even knowing actor directory. So meaning that you know once you get a login ID and password, you're using actor directory um, indirectly. You know, actor directory gives you the credentials to log in. Okay, so we're going to add uh, where where's our where's our sticky notes? Here it is. Susan Jackson. So to add new user, we can right click the users folder and we can select new. And then guess what? She's a new user, correct? So we're going to add a new user. Other way of doing it is if you make sure that the users folder is selected and then just hover and then click here where it says create new user in the current container, meaning that whatever is selected, it's going to create it inside it. But I like to stick to this. So if you're if you're new to computers, chances are you're going to start with, you know, basic, um, you know, as a basic technician or somebody who's working help desk, which is what you would have access to mainly. So you would right click and then go to new and then create new user. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to start from the very basics. And first person is Susan Jackson. Susan last name Jackson okay and now we can tell tell her or, or basically tell her or give her a user login name so this is the thing that I mentioned over and over again this is what you use as your ID to log into any computer that is controlled by this domain which is domain which is also known as domain controller which is this server that we are literally inside of okay so we're going to give her a login ID, which could be anything. It could be combinations of letters and uh, numbers, and, and that's fine. But we're going to keep it simple here. So we're going to call it Susan J. And if there are more than one Susan Jackson in there, and you want to keep the logins like simple like this, you may want to put in like Susan J2 or Susan J3 or something else that defers her from the other Susan Jackson, if there is another Susan Jackson. So for now, we're just going to say Susan J, and we're just going to leave it at that. So once we click Next here, we can give her a temporary password. So the way you do that is literally just typing in whatever you password you want, but um, make sure that you don't make any changes here. You see how by default it says here, there's a check mark here where it says user must change password at the next login. So whatever we type here as her password uh, is, is, is might as well be something very simple in the sense that she's going to be forced to change the password anyways, the first time she tries to use that password. Not necessarily a secure way of doing it, but we're going to keep it simple here. So I'm going to type in new user one, and then type it again, new user one. So this way she's going to be forced to change the password. And if you're doing this and giving somebody a temporary password, so let's say you are working help desk and Susan calls you and says, I can't log into my computer. You can change your password as well, but make sure there is a secure way of conveying what her temporary password is. So we're going to, type in this time we just use new user one as a simple password and then we're just going to click next because she's going to be forced to change it anyway okay now susan jackson is in there now she can go to any computer and log in using those login credentials meaning login id and password but then and 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 that's fine she's in there but she is now in a general just general group out there in, in, in the environment. She's still not, this is not organized, right? She's here right next to Susan, right next to all of these other people that are in there. So they're all in the same group, which is, which is not organized way of doing things. And then keep in mind, she is now hired to work as somebody in accounting group. 
So we have to have a way of doing this. And we're, I'm going to show you how to do that too. It's very, very simple. But for now, let's just create another login and that's for Larry Buffett here. We're going to add him and then we're going to go in there and or we'll do organizing. But for now, we're going to click right click users again, go to new, and then we're going to click user. And then we're going to create the login ID just like we did for Susan here. We're going to create one for Larry, Larry Buffett. And we're going to call it, we're going to give him a login ID, Larry B. I'm pretty sure he's the only Larry B. Uh, Larry, uh, so if there's another Larry Buffett in there, we're going to, we, we know we would get an error. So we would, but in this case, it's fine. So again, we're going to give him him, same deal. We're going to give him a new, new password, temporary password. We're going to call it new password. And again, I can't stress this enough the company you work for may have different security requirements when it comes to giving new passwords. I distracted myself from that. <laughs> okay, new user one, new user one. They're going to always make sure that this is checked to force them to change the password so they have their own password for security. And then we're going to click next. And then Larry Buffett is in here. Okay, so now we have Larry Buffett and we got Susan Jackson. We can see they're highlighted because they're, you know, we created them recently. And uh, we have to keep in mind that these guys, now they can log into any computer, which is fine. But when it comes to specific groups, for example, in this case, they work for accounting group. The accounting group uh, is chances are we'll have different um, security settings. Let's just call it that. Security settings compared to somebody who works in collections call center. So chances are security settings for accounting group are going to be completely different from collections. So we got to make sure that we put them in their own group. It's literally just a group of people, right? It's just a group of people that belong to certain department or I guess organization, if you will, but in this case, accounting. So what we're going to do here, we're going to, and to keep it simple, um, this is not necessarily a way to organize this. Again, this is just me explaining how this, how Active Directory works for people who don't know what Active Directory is. This is not for system administrators video. So we're going to right click just to keep it in the same place. We're going to right click users folder again, just so we can get to this part where it says new, and there, guess what we're going to create? We're going to create a group. We're going to create a group. But before we do that, and what I was going to do is call create a group called accounting, right? But let's make sure that the group is not in here already. I don't see it. I don't see a group called accounting. Let me just do a quick search, right click, find. I'm going to type in accounting. Yeah, there's no group named, named accounting. So we're going to have to create that group. We're going to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're grouped, right? So we're going to go right click. We're going to go to new and select group. And then we're going to call it accounting, right? We're going to call it accounting. So, and th th what this literally does is creates a way to keep all the same people that belong to the same group, in this case, accounting in one place. It's literally, that's all it does for now. That's all you need to know as somebody who is one wanting to uh, learn Active Directory from very, very beginning. And where it says group scope and all of that, there is a reason you might want to change this, for example, to domain local, but I'm not going to, uh, expand on this again because this is just for somebody who never seen a, uh, never seen actor director so we're just going to keep it super simple and i'm going to leave everything as it is okay just just keep in mind for those people who are watching here and say oh you know you did this or that no this is me literally talking to the people who have no clue what actor directory is no offense to anybody so again sorry about that or a little rant 
But then again, we got to put these two people, Susan Jackson and Larry Buffett, we got to put them somewhere, and that is accounting group. So we're going to create a group called accounting, and we're simply going to put them in there, and I'll show you how. It's uh, very simple. So we, now we have a group in our Act Director. This is accounting group. And for everybody that works in accounting, which includes these two new people that they just hired, we're going to put them inside of that group. So we found accounting, it's there, and we're, the way we're going to add those people in there, we're just going to double click on it, and we're going to add members. You see how it says, it's literally the next thing there, it says add members. And we're going to add Susan and Larry in there. But let me show you again. So here's the group, you can see it's a security group, global in this case, and they belong to accounting. And this is what you would do after you put them in there. So we got Susan, or well, we're going to have to find her again. But there's Larry, and we're going to have to add him to that group. So after we created Larry and Susan, we're going to add him in there. So we find accounting, and then we're just going to double click it. Or if you can't find it in there, we're going to select find, and we're going to type in accounting. So there are multiple ways of finding this group. Anyways, there, the point is what I'm saying is that we need to add them in there so that way it's organized. We've got to have organization within this actor directory. Okay, so we're going to double click accounting and then we're going to add members to this accounting group because remember we hired them. So we're going to click on members. They are members of the group, they're hired for accounting. And then we're going to, in the second tab where it says members, if you're if, uh, if you're following along, and I'm purposely going slower just so you know, so you can catch up, uh, we're going to add them in there. So if you go down and then you click add, we can simply now look for these two people. And I know this kind of looks like, hey, this is just a search box. Where is the drop down menu? Where is like, you know, this looks simple. And that's okay. This is actually really good. This box is really good at finding people. So again, we are in the members tab. We're going to add new members to this accounting group. We're going to click add. And here we can simply just type in Susan. Matter of fact, we're just going to type in Susan J. Let's see if I'll find it. Let's see if it's good at finding it. There it is. It found Susan Jackson right away, right? This is Susan Jackson. We know. And if there are multiple ones, you would know as well. But if you really want to be very specific, you can type in full name and then you can confirm that, yeah, in, indeed, I've just added Susan. And remember, we added, we, we gave her Susan J as her login, right? Susan J, this is what she's going to type in at the computer to log in. And it says at techsupport.kobuman.com, meaning at meaning at the server level, or I should say at the domain level or at the active directory level. These are all the same things that I literally just said. So it's at server level, at, um, at server level, and meaning that their, her credentials coming from the server. Their, her credentials are coming at or from domain, which is the same thing. Koboman.com or techsupport.koboman.com uh, is the name of the domain. Um, Anyways, see, I'm, I'm starting to get technical here right away. See, it's just a bad habit. Anyways, this is where she's getting her login from, from this place where it says tech support, which is the server that we're working on right now. So it, we know it's Susan J. So we're going to click OK. There she is. She's now added to this group. She's now a member of accounting group. And we're going to do the same thing for Larry, right? we got to add Larry in there. We're going to type in Larry. Let's see if just Larry comes up just by typing in Larry. There he is, Larry Buffett. I didn't have to type in anything else. And we know it is the same Larry because we gave him Larry B login right there. Okie dokie. So that's simple, guys, right? This is simple, basic part of it. Matter of fact, if this is all you learn as, you know, somebody who is uh, going to do help desk for now or just basic tech support, like this is all you need to do. Even if you're thinking about doing desktop support, chances are this is all you need to know when it comes to actor directory. And I'm definitely going to expand on this. But since we're done now with these two first two people, we're going to add the other ones too. 
once I'm once I'm here, I want to explain what the point is of uh, what the further point is of putting people in active uh, in in a group within Active Directory. So we now we know that accounting accounting department has two members. These two members, the reason they're organized. So this is Active Directory is all about organizing things, all about organizing things. If it's a huge company, especially. And we can see that we have Larry and Susan in there. And now they're grouped. So you know how when you log into a computer at a company or if you've never if you've never seen that, but what happens is you log into a computer company's computer using these login IDs, using these login passwords. You know, let's say Susan goes in and she just started and she logs in. And then suddenly she realizes that there are certain things she cannot do on a computer. Or she suddenly realizes that she's missing icons on her computer, just like we are seeing here on this uh, virtual server. She's missing all these things. Or suddenly she realizes that she cannot, uh, she cannot, for example, read files or create new files or anything like that. That's chances are because she hasn't, uh, she doesn't have the security or she's not allowed because of the security to do these things. So chances are you can set this up that once you just create somebody like we did and you put them in there like, you know, Susan Jackson just sits here and let's say she's not part of the group. Chances are she wouldn't be able to do any of these things like create new files, you know, access icons or any of that stuff. So the point of us putting her in accounting group here is that so she can get those specific permissions that accounting department is allowed to do. So accounting department has certain permissions. They're allowed to do certain things. So that's the whole point of putting somebody into a group. Again, I'm trying to explain this in a simple way without actually going to system administrator part of it and creating actual security groups and all of this system admin stuff. This is just for somebody to understand what Active Directory is. Okay, now to complete our practice, we're going to add these other people into a collections group as well. And if there is no collections group, we're going to create a collections group. So we got Mike Bobson. We're going to do this again. We're going to right click users and we're going to click new user. And we're going to, is it Bob, Bob Bobson? <clears throat> no, it's Mike Bobson. <laughs> ah, Mike Bobson. And we're going to give him an ID of Mike B. So we got Mike Bobson. There are no other Mikes probably. And <laughs> we're going to give him a login ID of Mike B. Again, at techsupport.com. And yes, if I were to get technical, you can have multiple domains within same actor directory. This is why you have the drop down here. But anyways, I digress. This is a video. I know I apologize for repeating myself, but this is a video to, to explain what actor directory is to somebody who's never, uh, who's not familiar with it. And we're going to give him a password, new user one. All right new user one and make sure you stick around because i will actually show you how to reset their password because they will chances are contact you say i can't log in again so we got to go in sometimes their accounts get uh you know locked out or or even disabled anyways we got mike bobson in there and let's create another one laura bailey <clears throat> all right new <clears throat> Excuse me. Laura Bailey. We're going to call her Laura B. By the way, this is not, the login IDs are not case sensitive. So just because I put Laura B as in cap B, like capital letter B and capital L, doesn't matter. New user one. New user one. 
So we created Laura in here. And then we got Mary Pipkins. Again, we're still we're just only creating basic login for them. Mary Pipkins. Mary P. All right. We got all those three added in there. So now that we know they are part of collections group, we got to, you know, put them into collections. Um, they're part of call center. They're going to be taking collection calls. So let's see if there's collections group in there. We're going to right click the users. Collections. Fine now. And again, when it comes to further organizational point of this, just to touch on just a little bit, somebody who's a system administrator, chances are most of these, the, the, the login IDs and group that you see in here, they will be gone from here. And then you would have different folders in here that control different organizations. You may have a folder that's called groups, you know, separately. That's, I don't want you to worry about that now. I'm just telling, I just want to show you this part of it, uh, how this actually functions. But when it comes to organizational point, this is something you would, you, it would look different, is what my point is. It would look different um, from what this is. This is just basic how it looks like once you, once you install uh, Windows Server. Okay, so there is no group collections. So we're going to have to create this group to put them in their own group called collections. So again, we're going to you know, right-click, new, and then create a group. And we're going to call it collections. Matter of fact, we're going to label it call center. Okay. And now we're going to add those three people to this group. So here is, here's our security group for collections. We're going to put them in collections group because they're part of collections. Again, once we open this, we're going to add members. And it's the second tab again. We're going to click members. And then we're going to add them in there. We're going to click add. And just like we did before, let's see. Who was the first one that we created? Mike Bobson. Mike Bobson. Actually, let's do this. Let's just type in Mike. Let's see what happens. Aha. You see? Once you type in Mike, just Mike, you can see there is another Mike in here. There is a Mike Moser. But we know that Mike Moser is not the guy. We know it's Mike Bobson. Good old Mike B. So we're going to add Mike Bobson, right? Yeah. See, this can actually be fun too, right? So we got Mike Bobson added to our collections group. Now we're going to add somebody else. Who was it? I know it's Mary, but there was the Laura Bailey. Let's type in Laura. Laura. Where is Laura? All right, there's only one Laura, so that's cool. We know it's Laura B. Laura B. We're going to add Laura B in here. And then we got Mary. Of course, we can't forget about Mary, guys. We got to add Mary into the group. Otherwise, Mary can might log into the computer and suddenly realize that she can't do anything. She'll still be able to log into her computer, but chances are she won't be able to do anything because of special permissions for collections. And there's our Mary P. Mary Pipkins. All right. Now we added her, and then, again, just to kind of touch on this, you don't necessarily have to worry about this as somebody who is, um, you know, adding people to Active Directory. Chances are the members off will have things in here. And basically that would, again, control what all of these people in collections can do. That's what that does in here. So <laughs> we're going to leave it at that. And now they're part of collections. Now, whatever collections is allowed to do, these people are put in the collections group. Now they can do all of these things. Okay. So now, as somebody who might start doing basic tech support or you know help desk, they may get a call from, for example, Larry here. It's Larry calls in and says, I can't log into my computer. Well, we can look them up 
in Active Directory, scroll through, but the best way to find them is to right click the users folder and then select find. I always say this, this is the easiest way to navigate this thing. Was it, did I say Larry? Larry Buffett. <laughs> I'm sorry guys, it's early in the morning for me. And uh, you know, I, my short, sometimes my short memory to be honest is not that great. So we search for Larry and Larry Buffett comes up. And uh, just to show you, if we were to search for, was it Mike? If we were to search for Mike, there will be multiple Mikes. So you might want to be specific when you search. So let's say we're searching for Mike here. You can see there's two Mikes again, right? But we know it's Larry. So we're gonna search for Larry. There's Larry Buffett. We found him. Easy peasy. We're going to double click on him. <coughs> I'm sorry, we're not gonna double click on him. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, details about their, anyways, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep it simple, so we're going to close that for now. This is another video. So we found Larry. We, we just want to reset his password. That's it. We just want to reset his password because he can't log in or maybe unlock his account. So we're going to right-click Larry here. It's very simple. We found Larry, whether it's in here or inside of this big thing that we're going to scroll down. It's going to be the same thing. Once you find Larry Buffett, we're going to right-click, right-click with the mouse, and then we're going to, guess what? We're going to reset password. And here we can set new password. And again, it kind of looks like similar to when we created his login ID, right? Remember this thing where it says, user must change password and next login? And it kind of gives you this thing where it says, user must log off and then log on again for changes to take effect. So we're going to have to tell him that if he's logged in already into computer, that he needs to log off. That's the, what it says here before we change his password. So best thing to do is tell him restart your computer, you know, reboot. And it looks just like when we created her where his password. Sometimes people try it too many times and they lock themselves out. There is a limit to how many times you can change, change the, or try to uh, use the wrong password. So if he is locked, what we want to do is click here where it says unlock the user's account. This will do it once we change the once we click OK as well. But we're, we're going to give him a new password. So we're going to give him a new password. And you can call it whatever you want, you know, depending on what security policy is for your company. You can just call it Monday 1. Let's say today is Monday. Let's say today is Friday. You can call it Friday 1, just so it's simple for him to kind of type in. I try to make these simple and keep them very simple for them. <clears throat> as long as I'm allowed to, right? So whatever the password is, you have to confirm it and you're telling this is the new password. And whenever he tries it, he's gonna be forced to change it so that, he's un so, so that way you don't know what his password is. And then we'll make sure that he's unlocked in case he tried way too many times the same old password. So chances are he might be locked. So this way we're going to unlock him. And now the password for Larry has been changed. We can tell Larry, okay, your new Temporary password, keyword temporary password is Monday 1. You're going to have to change it. Make sure, <clears throat> you know, make sure that, uh, you, you know, you do so. And, well, he because otherwise he, he'll have to. He, you just tell him you'll be forced to change your password so you'll have your own password. And that's that. We have reset Larry's password. Now, there are other things within Actor Directory that there are, a lot, there are a lot of other things in Actor Directory. But the point that I'm trying to make with this whole video is to explain to somebody who doesn't have a clue what Actor Directory is. How many people go, I tell you what, within your household, you have people that everybody knows how to use a computer. Go to them and ask them, hey, do you know what Actor Directory is? Do you know what domain is? what the main controller is, they won't know. Chances are really high they have no idea. So the only place you would encounter this is in a business environment. So if you're trying to get a job as a technician or help desk or whatnot, this is a really good intro and a way to uh, introduce yourself to Actor Directory. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. I purposely try to go slow so that way everybody can understand it.
and I, hopefully that worked. I hope so. All right, guys. Um, I guess I'll show you my video outro so you can see my face. Uh, all right, let's get to that. I hope you find this video interesting and educational because that's the whole point. Actor Directory is not super complex. It can become complex, but only at the level of trying to actually build an Active Directory for a business where you have to make sure that certain aspects of security are in place. So if you're a system administrator, that's a whole nother thing. But even before you become a system administrator, you have to learn the basics of Active Directory, right? Again, I go back to my point or correlation with driving. You don't suddenly start driving like a professional driver until you actually start from basic stop and go. I hope this message comes off as clear and understanding. All right, I hope you like it. Thank you so much for taking a moment to like and share this video. I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. So let's get to it. This is from a question number seven. One day you come into work and you find the major systems are down. However, you also see the ticketing system has 50 or more unassigned tickets. What would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with this problem? So here's the thing. If you're being interviewed and somebody asks you this, they want to know what you find as a biggest priority and what you should do when it comes to production impact. So this is incredibly important. The way I would explain this would be in four different steps. Be first, second, third, last. So that's how I would explain it. The reason for that is so that the potential employer can realize that I, you know, that I know what I'm talking about, that I have the basic knowledge, not to sound egotistic or anything. It's just that I have basic and even general knowledge on how to deal with a situation where you have to prioritize your work. So first, I would ask which systems are down and how many users are impacted. This will determine which issue is to be worked first. Tickets would be the last priority. So here's the thing. If a large number of users is impacted by a system that is down, then that's definitely something you would prioritize. So think about it. Let's say there's a company with thousand people and system major system is down. That means we have thousand people that need to be, uh, you know, they need to go back to work basically as soon as possible. So this is why we need to prioritize this. This is some of one of those common sense type of things, but yet, you know, potential employer wants to know this. And this is also good to know if you already are working help desk or some kind of desktop or tech support, right? It's definitely more people than 50, right? And then, then after you're done with that, tickets would be the last priority. Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own if possible, depending on what the issue is. If issues are not related, and in this case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assign individually if manager is not present. So this is incredibly important. If users report that multiple systems are down, which is directly related to the question, then there is a correlation there. Chances are that all of these systems, if they went down at the same time, chances are that they are somehow related to either servers, databases, or whatever it is that they all are, they, they all have relation to. So chances are you might want to handle this issue on your own to make it a more proactive uh, situation handling because it's all related to one thing. So basically what would happen is you see that multiple systems are down, right? And then you realize, you know, especially if you have the experience working for the company, chances are you will know right away. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. W what's wrong here? This website is down. Uh, this application is down and this other thing is down. Are they any way related? Then you, if you, if the, you know, if the answer is yes, then you can say that, okay, just let me know which ones, how many people are affected, 
how many users are affected i should say and then i will report this issue to the people that have access to these systems meaning let's say database is down chances are you doing tech support at the location or help desk that you won't have access to the to this database for a specific system i mean there could be hundreds of systems that are used by a company you know what i mean so you might as well handle all of this or chances are you'll have a crisis bridge or well this is what we call it at my company but there is a bridge or a conference line that you would call and the uh, person on the other line would basically be the mediator and they would handle um you know the the kind of logistics part of it as in you know they would ask you well how many systems are affected which ones and then you'd give them all this information how many people this and that and then they would say okay all right i'm going to start the bridge and i'm going to start paging people meaning that he's going to reach out to proper people that you may not know who they are if issues are not related in that case i would recruit help from coworkers means that if it's not related you cannot handle multiple issues especially if it's a big issue you know so you ask your coworker hey can you help me out with this and chances are they will because you know hopefully you work in a in, at, at a cool place like i do <laughs> uh, anyways and possibly and sign individually if manager is not present so you know chances are a manager would handle um a signing of uh this different uh, situational issues to other coworkers but if they aren't there it if, if if it's a legit place and i mean i shouldn't say like that if it's a cool place to work at and then everybody is on equal terms equal expertise and this and that chances are they will help you and you can just ask them you know can you help me with this so it wouldn't necessarily be a signing individually because manager is not present but you would basically recruit them to help you out recruit their help to help you out deal with other issues because you can't possibly handle uh, multiple issues that are not related right i mean it's it's that that's what i would suggest especially if if it's a huge issue cuz think about it think about it this way if multiple systems are down and they're not related how can you possibly acquire information that these uh application owners or sys- uh database owners or s- server owners how can you possibly give them the information um to that for example let's say okay how many people are affected and you say um i don't know a, a thousand okay give me some examples so you have to handle this you have to go to the users and then you would have to ask them okay uh can you give me this information basically you have to get a lot of information for a certain system in order to troubleshoot this properly if they are not related you can't possibly work with two two different teams on two different issues efficiently third i would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manages specific aspects of systems affected So that kind of ties into what I was saying earlier. You want to have all the information ready because they will ask you, okay, how many people, which systems? Can you give me an example of IP addresses? Which link they're using if it's a website? Well, which application are you using? Which uh version of the application are they using? All of this information you have to have ready if you want it to go smoothly. You know, yes, you can you, you can forget something. You can forget to you know get which version of the system it's being used or you know whatever else that's okay as long as you have the majority of things ready that way we will mitigate the uh, production impact in this case support team uh su- in this case support teamwork is essential to resolve major system issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team so yeah everything everything that i'm talking about here ties in to everything that i said previously support team is essential to resolve major system issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team you know after you reach out to all these people that support these different applications you have to have a th- good teamwork with them in order to resolve this properly lastly once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work then i would concentrate on resolving tickets on a side So yeah I mean of course it goes without saying that during crisis issues all the management would be notified 
of progress and solution and root cause. So this is, you know, very important. Once you come across an issue, you would want to report the statuses or give the status updates to all the management, um, including your own manager, but the management of the people that users report to, because they would want to know why do we have thousand people not working? So you want to send them updates periodically. Usually, this is usually done with just you know email. You send a group email to all the management of the departments that are affected, and maybe some of the users, and um, that way everybody knows on which page you're at or which page you're on, I should say. So that way they know that you're working on it, and usually every half hour you can send. You know, this is this going to depend on on the place you work at and what your management, what your manager requires. But usually, what I do is every half hour I send status updates. That seems like a, a a good time frame to do so. So that way they know what's going on, and then once it's all resolved, um, you would provide a root cause to the management, not necessarily the management of the users, but to your boss. And so that way your boss can follow up with these application owners and uh, work on you know making sure that this doesn't happen again and then we can concentrate on resolving tickets that are unassigned of course you know you, you just go back to work <laughs> and work these 50 plus tickets that's a lot of tickets if it's like just you to do good luck doing it all in one day but hey it's possible i don't know there might be some simple ones so let's go ahead and look at question number two that is within this article and um, the question is a user has transferred to another department within the company and their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons what do you think the issue could be so let's go to look at the first i would ask the user if they move to another computer which could mean that their files are stored at another machine right so if somebody literally switches computers of course, that new computer is not going to have those files that are stored at, at the other machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. So if the new computer does not have the same program, of course, it's not going to have those icons. So let's have a look at an example of how that looks like. Here is a brand new login or brand new local profile created for this computer and if I go inside my downloads for example it will be empty because it's a new computer if I go inside of documents it's going to be empty because I moved to a new computer if I go to desktop it's going to be empty because I moved to another computer and this is just a shortcut to Microsoft Edge and what I'm talking about missing files so it's going to miss all those files that you created on the desktop so let's say let me let me show you here what I mean so if I go here and create a you know just a new file it's going to show up on their desktop so that's considered a, you know new file this here is just a shortcut to the file so of course you move to another computer you haven't transferred any of your files you haven't you know moved them to another computer of course it's going to be empty so that's why I explained it in such a way second thing is let's say you missing icons for the computer of course you're just going to have whatever's installed on this computer this computer just happens to have audacity google chrome obs studio open office you know and etc but if you happen to have you know microsoft office and you had a shortcut to outlook to excel to anything else on your desktop of course it's not going to be there because this computer doesn't have that installed okay now let's go to the second uh, part of that answer okay and second here it says if user has not moved to another machine I would check the active directory um, if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for users new department are affecting the ability to create view or edit files so let's have a look what I mean if someone has been moved within Active Directory or their domain, chances are that their permissions to view, edit, or modify files have been changed, which could reflect 
on the way things look like on their computer. So if somebody moved to another department and that department has new restrictions in place where it doesn't allow them to view a lot of things which can be modified. For example, you would go in here and look at this PC or previously known as my computer in Windows 7. Chances are they may not even be able to see this. They may not even be able to see local C, let alone any files that are within the hard drive, right? Because changes on the domain level or within Active Directory have suddenly, you know, are suddenly preventing you or the new user to access, view, or edit any of these files. This sometimes happens. Some departments have more restrictions on their users or on their associates. They don't want them to do certain things. They don't want them to view certain things. So suddenly they got migrated to the new new uh, part of the Active Directory where they have more restrictions. This has replicated and chances are whenever they go in here, they won't be able to see any of this. So, uh, by the way, one way, if, if you're missing, if you can't see local C drives or any of these drives listed here, you can just simply type in C. A lot of times that's actually open like that. So let's go ahead and have a look at our third part of this answer. User may have received a new domain login, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. So if somebody you know, moves to a new department and they decide to tell them, okay, now you're going to use this login. You know, when they log in, it would be just like this. You know, they log in and it would be just like this, their new profile. This is their new profile that they got. Their, their new login is their new profile, right? And it would be empty. It would be empty just like this. So what is the reason for that? Is because their old profile has all the stuff. So let's look at root of C again and our users folder. Once we go inside of here, let's say, and, and this is the fact now, I am using this one, right? YT login, that's my login ID right now. If I previously used this one, everything that's inside of that, it's going to stay inside of that. So now I'm suddenly using this one, of course it's going to be empty. So in order to restore that, Obviously, you will go back inside of this, go into the, you know, if you have the permissions, obviously, um, go inside and, you know, copy paste all the data that's within their documents and everything else on their desktop and just restore it back here, you know, into their new login. And that's the reason for that. Any time you change login ID, it's going to, you know, create everything brand new and you know all the old stuff is going to be located on the old profile which you can transfer back okay now let's have a look at uh, my last last thing that I would say within in the as a as an answer to this question uh, with you know during an interview lastly if any of the situations described apply I would act accordingly to resolve the issue if user files are located somewhere else and if permitted by the company policy, very important, I would transfer them back to the user. Same goes for any missing software. So what I'm saying here is that if, if it's a common practice for their company to create backups, I would restore all of their, uh, all of their documents to them. And I would also transfer all the software that they used to have to the new computer if they happen to move to a new computer. Of course, this is all, you know, depending on the company's policy, their manager at the new department may say, nope, they don't need this. So of course you would double check that to make sure that that is allowed as well. So this is very fun thing to think about because this happens a lot in desktop support where you know, suddenly all, everything's missing and they don't know what happened because users don't know. And, you know, sometimes they'll panic and they would go and they're like, oh, I'm missing everything. Everything's missing. And you sure enough, you go in, desktop is pretty much empty. Documents are empty. Everything's empty, but they don't know what happened. So hopefully you, 
help them or you've been notified ahead of time. So if you're a local desktop support, uh, hopefully you've been notified ahead of time that this person is moving to another department and then you can help them, you know, by creating, you know, you know, a backup of that of their local profile or simply moving it from one computer to another, which you can simply do over the network. You know, you can just simply go to the back door and just type in backslash backslash two backslashes name of the computer, you know, name of the computer where they used to sit and just type in C and dollar sign. This should be able to access their old computer. And once you do that, basically it will just, you know, it will basically get you into the root of C like this. It would just say the name of the computer there rather than just C. And then it would say name of the computer would see, you know, backslash C. And then you, in here you can just go, you know, what is that? What is their old profile? And then you find it. And then, you know, usually what I do is, you know, I go like this desktop documents i would highlight all of this usually their favorites then i would copy and then access her or his or her computer remotely that they're using currently you know go back here find their new profile whatever that may be add the, the other computer and then just paste it you know um usually <laughs> it didn't it didn't like that because I did it on the same login, but if I go into and find another login, it would simply just update the profile or the folders that are there. It's not gonna create duplicates. Then that only did that because I did it on the same local profile. All right, so let's get to it. The question is, your office received a new printer and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. So. Keep that in mind, it's for a specific department only. How would you go about installing this printer in a direct IP printing setup? The direct IP printing setup also being something to remember. And the way I would start to explain this, I would say first, I would unpack the printer to make sure all parts and cables are there. Uh, then I would connect and plug in the printer into the power and network port available at designated location. Also designated location here is very important to keep in mind. So obviously um, for when it comes to this, you know, you get that giant box and you know, these are large printers for businesses, you know, you unpack it and then you make sure everything's there, right? You make sure it has all parts and cables and then you put it together, plug it in, and you know plug it into printer into power network port at the designated location second i would make sure that this new printer has a static ip address assigned to it and that kind of goes back to our designated location for this designated location where we have placed our new printer we have to kind of take note of the port that is there for the network uh, cable that is connected to right we, we, we would know okay well this is the port number for this, you know, for this location. And then we would talk to our network guy or we would do it ourselves and make sure that we have a static IP address available and assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean. If you go to your network adapter properties and look at the those those settings there, you go to properties, right? And you would make sure that you have a static IP address available to you. So if you have a static IP address that you want to use for that port, uh, this can be assigned um, through the switch itself and that port would simply just use that and it would never change. And that's the whole point. It's static. We don't want it to change because we want users to connect to it every time. So when you go here into the the ethernet adapter properties and select internet protocol version 4 if your company is using uh, ip version 4 you will go in here and if you have to you would specify the static ip address so i'm just kind of showing it to you on the computer itself but this is what you would do inside the printer you would say use this you know ip address if this is something you have to do this is just me explaining to you what a static ip address is 
and why you would need it for a printer so that users can always connect to it and know where it's at. So that way they can install it on their computer afterwards. And I'll show you that as well. And also I would acquire driver pa package for the specific model printer unless the printer is set up to push the drivers automatically upon a request. So if printer for some reason doesn't come with driver package or software, obviously you would go to the manufacturer website, download all the drivers that you need. So let's say it's an HP, it's a HP printer, you would go to HP and specify model, get this information. And then the reason for that is if needed, we would uh, basically go to Active Directory and tell Active Directory to push this driver. But just kind of hold on to that thought uh, because most new printers automatically push the drivers. So if it's a brand new computer, a brand new uh, printer, it would automatically push the driver to the user that is trying to install it. And I will go back to the Active Directory part that I've uh, that I've uh, that I spoke about third Active Directory needs to know of the printer added. So this is where that comes in It needs to be it would know it needs to know that it's added and it added to the domain itself right Active Directory, you know domain. So what happens is you would take a host name you would create a host name for this Printer you would assign a host name and then you would add it to the Active Directory so that Active Directory knows that there is a printer connected to this domain. So that way it can control who can use this printer through GPO or a group policy. And what this does is it only allows certain users of that department to use the printer. So basically, once you have a group of people a group of users for a specific department you can literally just add all of those people in to the permissions to use that printer that's been added to actor directory so actor directory is a simple simple way to control who can who can use the printer and who cannot and that kind of goes back to our part uh, where it's kind of related to the driver package. If you have to specifically get the driver package, you can set up Active Directory to push the driver as somebody tries to install it. So, uh, but again, new printers will just do this automatically on their own whenever somebody tries to add it. And that is done by the uh, static IP address or the host name. And this is why I talked about it here. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well and in Active Directory. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. So of course, you would have to help them because that's your job. Remember how we talked about a static IP address here? Well, your printer with the static IP address that you assigned it to would be used by users or you would do it for them let me just pull up my printers menu and here we would add our printer. So the way we, we would do it, we know with printers um, menu, we would simply just select add printer. So now it's searching for the printers, but usually you saw how that little, that popped up this link. It usually doesn't find it right away. So you have to specifically tell it. So with the users, when it comes to users, you would simply give them the IP address and say, hey, this is the IP address for this printer. Just add it in there and it's going to automatically install it for you. But a lot of times you would do it for them. So you just click this printer that I want isn't listed because it's not going to find it most of the time. And that's okay. And now we have this menu that you may be familiar with. Uh, and remember how we talked about that IP address? Well, here it is. We can add the printer using TCP IP address or host name. So we can either use the IP address or the host name. Usually what I do, I just, you know, go by the IP address because uh, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I prefer it, but it really doesn't matter. So you have select that and then we would select next and it brings us to this menu. Here we would, for example, just type in the, you know, IP address that we've assigned it and we would, in my case, I'm just going to, you know, come up 
with an IP edge, let's say it's 192.168.100.1. So let's just assume that that's where our printer is located and that's its IP address. And something to keep in mind when it comes to installing the drivers, if it's a newer printer, you'll be able to simply select the check mark here if not selected. By default, it is, I believe. And what that does is queries the printer. It pings the printer and says, hey, do you have a driver? And the printer says, yes, I do. And it then automatically installs it on your computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you don't, you can later on specify the driver that you want to use. But this should be set up so it automatically does it. And then simply you will select next. And it's going to look for it. And then it's going to install it. Of course, I, I forget to mention the printer may have a port assigned to it as well. And uh, you would simply type that in after the IP address that I showed you. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, lastly, I would notify the users, the new printers, and the IP address. I said that already. And that was the last part of this. If you have any questions in regards to this, I know this is a little bit complicated. And that's the whole point. The title of this article is Top 10 Hard desktop support interview questions and answers because you know you have to explain your steps on how to do this and I wanted to make these type of videos so you guys can kind of learn from this and to at least make it as easy to understand as possible all right so let's get to it number four what is the best way to install operating system on 100 computers manually meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any ad automated system available. So typically in a large business, everything's automated. If you were to receive 100 computers, you can just connect them to the network. You would get host names for them and you would assign them, you know, which operating system to install, which programs need to be installed as well. And everything would just be done automatically. You just kind of sit back and relax and everything's done. This is why this is a difficult question. And this is how I would go about it. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. And that will tie in a little bit later here. I'll explain that. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. So since I don't have an option of automation, I would make sure that these computers are kind of gathered together in in uh, preferably in, in the same room. I would connect them together, power them on and everything like that. So that way they are uh, there for easy access for me to, you know, schedule a lot or, or start to re-image process on a lot of them. That's the point of that. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to the domain. This is why I was saying, first, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. So that afterwards, I would acquire host names for each machine so they could be added to the domain. And for this to happen properly, all the computers need to be connected to the network and turned on. So this can be assigned through Active Directory, also known as the main controller. So you would go inside of the Active Directory and you would create 100 computer names, also known as the host names. And then you would assign them accordingly to all of these computers that are being re-imaged. And uh, with, it, with them being connected to the network, makes it an easy process. Okay. Third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS installed medias to use, CD or USB. So this kind of goes back to my trying to keep them in the same area for easy access and that's exactly why so that i can use installed media on them um, afterwards i would manually boot to inserted media and execute os imaging process you see how everything kind of ties it ties in the way i would do things it's kind of systematical and everything kind of goes back to itself this is a great way to tell your potential employer that you have a really good way of thinking on how to resolve these big issues because you know trying to install operating system on 100 computers and doing it in a an acceptable time frame you got to know what you're doing and have a good plan you know what i mean 
So lastly, upon image, and image completion, I would ensure that each computer has host names attached and is added to the domain or a work group. Work group um, usually is used you know, in a small type of business. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that if you're interviewing at a big company, but you know, you gotta make sure that is added to the domain and host name attached, meaning that associated with each computer. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. And that kind of goes back to the part of automation that I mentioned earlier that normally happens is you select the type of software that you need and it would install it automatically. In this case, you would have to do it manually, install any software required per department templates or requests. So if somebody needs Microsoft Office professionally installed, this is what we would have to do manually for each computer. And, um, you know, you would have to kind of get that information to make sure you don't spend too much time installing stuff um, on, that's unnecessary stuff. You know what I mean? Because you don't necessarily have to install the same program on all of these computers. Because who knows? doesn't mean that all these computers are going to the same department. So they may have different templates that you would use and go buy. Anyway, let's get to it, guys. So this is question number five. From a desktop support point of view and not Active Directory, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? And how would you deal with users affected by this change? So it's a two-part question. And uh, the starting of it says, from a desktop support point of view, meaning you're just a guy that works tech support, right? So this is not for somebody who is interviewing for network administration. Because when I say here, not Active Directory, that would mean somebody who is a network admin, that's the part that they would deal with and not necessarily somebody who does desktop support or tech support, if you will, right? And um, how would you deal with the users affected by this change? Incredibly important. The way I explain all of my uh, answers um, is in four part format where I go from first, second, third and a last point or explanation that I give to the potential employer that might be asking me this type of question. The reason for that is so that they know that I know what I'm talking about or that you know what you're talking about as well. So that's a good way to basically present your knowledge to them so they can see, oh yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Simple as that. All right, let's get to it. So first part of my answer would be, I would make sure that users and management is aware that the change is coming and how it will affect them. So I would let them know, I would go to the users and you know their management and uh, let them know that this change is coming and I would tell them how it will affect them. So the way I would do this is, you know, there are a couple of ways you can do this. You can go to them directly and you know, go to the management first and tell them, hey, we're going, we're going to do this. There's a big project coming. Uh, we are switching all the users. We're switching everybody to a new domain. You don't have to be too technical about it. You just kind of have to get them a gist of it because they don't, they won't necessarily know the technical parts of, of any of this. Or you can just send an email um, to everybody that is being affected. Uh, but a lot of times management will say, okay, we will handle uh, the part of letting the users know. So this is just something you would have to figure out. But the reason for that is when you switch to a new domain, uh, there are a couple of changes that could happen. Uh, users could get new local profiles. And let me show you what, what I mean here. Depending how it's set up, depending how things are set up, I'm, I'm gonna wake up my here, uh, my uh, remote computer is asleep. Uh, in case you didn't know this, this actually pings the computer to, uh, it will wake up um, as soon as you do it a couple of times, it takes like three seconds, four seconds, and then eventually it gets you to it. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. When it comes to switching to a new domain, if you look at somebody's local profile, in this case I'm using YT login, as you probably caught that um, earlier, and um, chances are pretty high that if I get switched over to a new domain, the that I may get a new login, or it would be the same login, but it would be a different domain. So ch chances are what I'm trying to say is that a new 
profile might end up being created next time they log in because they switched over to the new domain. So it might look something like this. So instead of just being called YT login, in my case, it could be called, and let me just create a new folder here just to show you, a, um, a kind of fake profile just to show you what might happen next time you log in. So it might say ye, YT, <laughs> I said ye, YT login, and then it might be just something like this, dot new domain or something like that. And it would specify that, you know, you have now everything that's in this one, original one is there, but this one is empty. You get it? So that's what might happen. However, in a, you know, uh, perfect world, I want to say, I have everything set up so that I have to provide admin privileges to make any changes. So in a perfect setup, this would just basically move all the files um, to the new login or to the new profile that I just showed you. So all the files that they had in documents, favorites, all their stuff would be moved over or they would have a different way of just making sure that everything is migrated properly. But you do have to let people know in case things go bad. They would, you know, they would log in next day and they would, wow, wh wh where's my stuff? You know what I mean? And that's, that's what might happen. So you just got to let them know to be ready for that. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This is, you know, obviously, guys, very, very important. Every time you work on a project, you want to make sure that you have some testing done. And uh, the way you do this, pick a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. Now, in this case, we are also assuming that computers themselves are also going to the new domain right that would perfectly make sense since users are going to the new domain of course all the computers will be going to a new domain as well so this is something that has to be tested and the way you would do that you would just choose a few machines and then you would communicate this with the network team this is why i kind of uh, said from a desktop support point of view and not Active Directory because chances are you would be working with the network team with the network team on this and they would deal with the Active Directory part of it. So you just tell them, okay, I have, I don't know, let's say five machines. Convert them to the new domain and then you can log in and test it. Third, I would reach out to the department managers to coordinate the switch so that the production impact is minimized this is kind of self-explanatory um, you would basically just talk to the department managers and the, or managers in general to kind of uh, pick a good time to do this so you don't want to do it during business hours or anything like that because that would be a production impact you know what if it doesn't work then you got a lot of people potentially a thousand people let's say you have a thousand people at your location that you support then everybody might be down but this is a huge, huge deal. So, you know, we got to make sure we do that. And of course, with those five or few machines that you picked, you can have actual users, people to use them and test them. You don't, you know, you can do testing yourself, but the best way to do it, in my opinion, is to have actual users dedicated uh, that they can test this for you. And you can talk to the managers and say, hey, I need five people to test this. And then you would test this over time. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. And the reason you would, you know, involve testing of applications and website access is because the firewall settings. If the new domain already has exclusions um, for the firewall, um, then that's fine, but if it doesn't have the same exclusions as the old domain, then chances are some of these websites and applications may not work because the firewall would be an issue. So just kind of keep that in mind. These are things you have to test before you proceed with converting everybody. You know what I mean? So um, the last thing we want to do is once all the testing on a new domain is successful, a green light would be given to convert all other machines 
to the new domain as well as the users so you know once everything's working fine no there are no problems with the testing you can you know you if, if you feel comfortable with it you can convert everybody at once or you can just you know do i don't know 50 at a time or something like that you know this is something you know you would uh, kind of decide for yourself and depending on you know it's very situational you know all the businesses are different some businesses may not be affected that much by it it all there are so many factors guys that you would really have to kind of kind of decide on your own as you're doing the testing and this would come just from being familiar with the place you work at you know let's look at this first question that uh, we are going to uh, talk about today and uh, it's related to when using a remote desktop you come to realize that the remote computer is not not reachable by using a host name so let's see what happens what you normally try to connect to a remote desktop i'm going to open up a remote desktop here and i'm going to connect to my computer that's called tech support this is a host name for this computer now not to be confused with the ip address you can also connect using an ip address to a remote computer so instead of just typing in tech support which you would normally do when it comes to a business environment you can also type in and let's see ping tech support you can also use its ip address and in our case this is a version 6 ip address which we would use to connect to it at computer so in a type of uh, in a business type of environment chances are you would see a normal you know standard type of ip address that's just you know regular version 4 and uh, and that's perfectly fine so instead of using the host name you would type in that ip address in here and it would connect the same way but normally all you would do is just type in the host name uh, click connect and then you can type in your login id which i already have it's called yt login and then you would type in your password and it would connect just like this just a moment let me switch my picture here real quick there it is okay i almost needed to troubleshoot that first so this is what happens when you connect to a remote computer now you know you can pretty much do everything that you would normally do and that's the whole point of remote desktop so this is normal but let's see what happens when i know that a computer is turned on and we try to connect to it so my other computer is just called Kobuman, and on it i have um it the remote desktop is disabled so when i try to connect to it now from this computer it's going to fail and uh, we'll see what the errors are you see it says remote desktop can't connect to the remote computer for one of the reasons remote access to the server is not enabled so what is that what is that well let's have a look if i go to properties of this computer so you go to properties of this computer we can see okay i just want to make sure i have this okay there it is it says remote access to the server uh, to the server is not enabled that means that when we go to advanced system settings here okay and it's asking me for admin privileges so i can access this if you go to the advanced system properties and go to the far uh, right tab which is called remote this may be disabled like so right that might be the cause and that's what that is talking about i don't know if you saw that it actually flashed it for a second i thought it was going to disconnect it although i didn't click apply or okay or anything like that so um and the next thing that it says here uh the remote computer is not is the remote computer is turned off which is not or a third the remote computer is not available on the network right so those are the key factors for a successful remote desktop session however if we go back to our question it says here 
keep keep in mind the remote computer is turned on and it's awake and it's on the same network you see it says keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on awake and on the same physical network so that's not the problem so what i would what would i do what would i do the way i would answer this question or troubleshoot this is um well first of all if this is an interview type of situation i would you know present them you know few ways of going about it and what it may be this is just to give the potential employer or a future employer um, an idea of how i troubleshoot things and also that i am indeed knowledgeable and know what i'm talking about so i would have first second third and last example of what it could be right so my first idea would be well i would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain and uh, the way you could check that is by going to the active directory you see you you, you just see if the you know if that host name is there for example we used here you know kobuman as the name of the host so i would go inside of active directory and say hey is kobuman as in the name of the computer host name is it in there or not and then go from there and then also i would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the domain even if it has been added so of course it could be part of the domain but it could also be disabled so once once it's part of a domain or active directory if you will you can have a host name in there but if it's disabled then it's not usable right so second second thing i would try to ping the computer by using the host name if an error comes up uh, if, if an error comes up, it would determine my next step. So we did a ping here for the tech support. And uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the other one since we started doing that one. Let's ping Kobuman here. CMD ping Kobuman. See, there's another proof here that the computer is turned on. We just can't reach it. And... Uh, the, it, this is a normal ping. It's a zero loss, zero loss. That means the computer is turned on and everything's fine. There's a perfect, there's connection there. We just cannot connect to it as we've demonstrated earlier. So what could be the problem? Let's go back to our a answer for the second. For example, if the message is, it says cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. So that kind of goes back to me connecting to a computer just by using an IP address. So, and that, my third part of that actually ties into that on what the reason for that is. If there is an issue with DNS, meaning that uh, the main name service, the main name service, I think I got there, DNS, the main name service, the, the main name system, I think that's what it actually stands for. Uh, basically what that does is resolves um, it basically takes the host name, in our case, Kobuman, and tells uh, the, the server or other computers on the network what the IP address for that is. So Kobuman, as the name of the computer, is basically just uh, an alias, right? And the DNS basically takes that and it translates it and it forwards it to the correct IP address automatically. So if I can't connect to the Kobo man by using a host name, but I can connect using the IP address like this, like this, if I can, <laughs> if I can highlight it. All right, control C. If I can connect to it just like that without any problems using the IP address, that means that there is an issue with the DNS. That means the DNS is not doing its job. It's not taking Kobo man and translating it into the IP address, which it should be, right? So if that works, you know, by using IP address, then, you know, that's fine for now, but there is an issue. Um, third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable via IP address. And that's exactly what, that, what I talked about previously. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it would indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. So, right. So, you know, another reason is, you know, if the computer has, you know, if there is an issue with the DNS, chances are it didn't replicate. So, you know, 
maybe the computer just got added on there and or it got moved or something like that and the dns server could not catch up with the change it doesn't realize that it moved to another ip address that could also be an issue but generally speaking if it ca if you cannot connect uh to the remote computer using just a host name then but you can with an ip address that indicates just a dns issue and lastly if physical access if i have physical access to the computer i would check the dhcp settings or look or look at possible hardware issues or lan connection issues so basically if i go to the computer physically if i have physical access to it you know um, if i am at the location there working for some kind of tech tech support there um, i would go to the computer log into it and look at the D dhcp settings so what is that dynamic host configuration protocol settings that are on your adapter so i'm going to look up my adapter here and look at dhcp settings i'm going to go in here change adapter settings here is my local ethernet too i'm going to look at the properties and I'm going to look at the pro properties and then I'm going to, let's see, where is it? Internet protocol version six. So we know we were using internet protocol version six. So we're going to double check that. And then we're going to check at this. If this needs to be configured manually, we would have to do so. Otherwise this should be just set to automatic. And this is usually what you would see in this type of DHCP setting. Now, not to be confused with DHCP server itself, that's different. That's your actual like switch on the network. Or for example, your home router is a DHCP server, dynamic host configuration protocol. So I would make sure that looks good and also look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So chances are maybe there's a bad cable or, you know, cause if it's on the network and it's physically connected, then chances are this is not the issue, you know. However, it's unlikely um, if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for some time. So the worst case scenario here being a DNS issue if you can't reach it with the host name only. And that's exactly what the question was about. So the point of this video is to kind of get you thinking of on how host names work in relation to the DNS and how this issue may come up whenever you use remote desktop sessions. All right, let's get to it. The entire building is switching over to Gigabit Network and you are to assist with the process. How would you handle this project? So you can see that this question is specifically tailored for somebody who does text desktop support at the site. So meaning you're physically there and then you are to assist with switching over to the Gigabit Network. The reason you are to assist with the process is because you're not going to do the networking part of it meaning that you won't be you know assigning ip addresses or anything like that that's done by the network team you are the desktop support guy or tech support guy if you will that will basically run the cables and do everything else which i will talk about here shortly first i would work with the network team to decide of the new ip network ranges this is incredibly important if your company has firewall settings or a firewall configuration that is specific to certain applications certain websites then you would need to know what the new new ip network ranges are this is something that you need to have anyways but the main reason is to make sure that all of these applications that are used by people can also go through the firewall so the old ip range um, had firewall settings set up for the new, for the old one. Now you need the new IP network ranges to inform the firewall team to make these changes so that applications and the websites and anything that's external will work properly. Also, sometimes you have to notify the external third parties that allow inbound connections from certain IP ranges. You need to let them know as well. 
and to make sure that certain machines receive static IP addresses. Now, I kind of touched on this uh, on my previous video, which was related to setting up a printer on a network, which requires a static IP address, but that's not the main reason. I mean, that's one of the reasons, but the main reason being is uh, servers. All the servers that you have at your location, they all need IP addresses and they need to be configured with the new IP addresses, including printers. Second, if any network cables need to be upgraded, it will be coordinated with members of desktop support and network team. For example, CAT5E is a minimal cable rating for gigabit speeds. So the way you would uh, do this is that, you know, you would may have to make sure that it's at least CAT5E, which I believe is 1000 megabits per second connection speed, which is uh, basically entry level gigabit network speed. Otherwise you would want to use CAT6. And you would coordinate this with the members of desktop support, meaning hopefully there's somebody else there to, that works with you. I mean, it may not be, you know, if it's a smaller company, but if it's a larger company, there's probably other members there that you may need assistance with, especially if you need to run the new cables through the building, which is a lot, a lot of work. And of course you wouldn't coordinate this with the network team. Basically you just let them know, okay, I've connected all of this, try these ports or something like that. And let's test it out, you know, type of thing. Third, if any changes affects the printers and other static devices, such as servers, this has to be communicated to the users and make appropriate changes to each machine. So this touches on exactly what I talked about earlier related to the, st the static IP addresses. If any changes affect printers, of course, you have to let the users know. You have to communicate this to the users or make the changes yourself and tell them, okay, this, this printer that's here is no longer using this IP address. So you have to go to their computer or tell them to do it and say, okay, you have to add the printer in there again because it's not going to work. It's just going to stop working because the address has changed. And of course, make appropriate changes to each machine. Um, I, I was referring this to the users, but also this needs to be applied to the servers themselves as well or any storage that needs to be you know, static. Lastly, the most important thing would be the testing part before deployment because there's a chance that certain applicants require firewall exceptions for their IP or a range of IP addresses. And this also refers back to the IP ranges that all the applications um, you know, need to have a firewall exclusions, exceptions, or whatever you want to call it. We want to make sure that the new IP range and the IP addresses can go through the firewall. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Share it with your buddies. I'd really appreciate it. I'd made five more videos of this and there will be more. But uh, thank you so much for watching. If you want to check those out again, there will be here as I speak. And I wish you good luck. Best of luck. Enjoy your day. Bye bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. Today's video I wanted to talk about processes and services found within Windows 10. It will be similar with Windows 7 if you're still working with Windows 7 operating system. But mainly this is for desktop support. For example, you get a trouble ticket and the issue is kind of unknown, but you know that the user is, you know, reporting issues with performance or there's a certain application that doesn't run properly or refuses to run. So one of the things we would have to look at is processes or services, you know. I mean, there are many situations in which this could be useful. It just depends on the situation, you know, on the issue at hand. And we just have to spend a little bit more time and trying to figure out what it is that might be causing an issue, right? So obviously the first we uh, the best way to get to the processes and services is through our task manager, right? So I have it open here, but obviously, you guys, I'm sure you know this already. If you right-click on your taskbar, you can just select uh, task manager. Also, if you do control alt delete, um, you will get to a window where you can simply start the task manager. So let's start from the top. And here you can see right off the bat, that there are some programs that are taking up a lot of CPU power, right? If yours is not sorted like this, you can simply select this column, so click on it, and it will sort it out whether you want it 
to display the highest used first or last. By the way, if you recently or never opened up a task manager on your computer, it will look just like this. It will not have any details. It will just have the last application that you have open running like so. You know, in order to bring it back to what used to be default in Windows 7, you would simply select more details here and it would expand it, expand it back to what I consider as normal. Okay, so here we are again, and now we know that there are a couple of applications now using up most of our CPU. So let's say your trouble ticket says, my computer is running slow, you know, and then you can look at this here and you can see that in my case, OBS 64 is taking up most processing power. So what is this OBS 64? See, this is the next thing we need to figure out. If we are suspecting that this is the software causing the issue for the user, we have to kind of figure out what it is. It, it, unless you're familiar with this, you, it could be anything. It's, you just know that it's taken up a lot of processing power and quite a bit of RAM, right? So if I right click on it, right? First of all, I did went ahead and expanded it, right? There's a little arrow here. If you click on it, you will expand it. And you can see other sub sub services or sub processes that are running underneath it, right? This is one thing that Windows 10 is doing. It's kind of grouping the same uh, process or the processes for the same application within um, under under the same tab, if you will. So now that it expanded, we can see individual things that are running. So what is this? Why? What is this? It's causing issue. You know, I could just right click it, you know, and, and task, and that would kill it. However, it would also, there's a chance that it also might come back if it's a part of, part of the processes that belong to a certain program that the user is using. We don't know that yet, so we have to figure out what it is, right? The first thing we have to look at is what is this process? Where is it coming from? Why is it, you know, taking up so much power, uh, so much CPU power on this computer? Well, we can find that out, right? So what we got to do is right click on the actual process and it's not this top part of it, right? This is just a tab. This all tells us is there are three different instances of, of processes related to the same application. The actual process for this application that's taken up this much power is this one, right? It's OBS 64, the actual process, right? So if we right click it and select properties, we can see some details about it, right? We can see that, uh, you know, its location, what kind of uh, executable is. We can tell that it's installed in C program files x86, and we can tell it's OBS Studio. So right there, it kind of, you know, tells us, well, what is this studio? When, when you think about studio, you can think a couple of different things right off the bat video recording, audio recording, something like that, right? So that's a hint right there. And we can tell that it's located within bin folder and it's also uh, under 64-bit folder, right? So this is a typical normal application uh, format for the folders that you would see in within root of C, right? So if we click on details here, we can see a little bit more information about it. We can see the last date it was modified, which was in March 1st, 11.04 a.m. So we know this uh, application executed last time there, right? At that time, I should say. So that's all great, right? This looks okay. We don't see anything, you know, super, super sketchy, right? However, we can also find out more, right? If we right click again on our process and go to open a file location, it will open up that folder location that we looked at within the properties of that process. And here we are, program files x86, OBS Studio bin 64 bit. And now here's our process. It automatically highlight, highlights it for us, right? Which is actually really cool, right? We know that this is the process that it's running in the background and it's causing, um, you know, it's, it's using up a lot of CPU. So now we know that it's there and, you know, by looking at different things here, we can also kind of uh, get a hint that this will deals with AV, which is audio video, and we, we can tell we can tell it says it's Kodak, and then there is an AV filter, and then there's AV format. So what does that tell us? Just by looking at those hints, we can probably assume that this is audio or video 
software right as if as as just like we hinted earlier right and the reason i'm explaining it to you in such a way so that you guys can think uh for yourself whenever you're troubleshooting these type of issues so you can figure out is this application okay or not right but in fact if i were to you know um you know uh, google obs 64 it would tell me that obs is simply screen recording software which indeed is running for us right here, right? So that's how you can find out what type of process is causing the slowdown for the user's computer, right? And you can also at the same time figure out, you know, what kind of software it is, Be even before you go to Google and search what it is, right? Of course, if you worked for the company for a while, You'll, you'll probably have a good idea of what kind of software should be running in the background and something like this wouldn't necessarily be there, right? We certainly wouldn't want to have a recording. Well, you know, we know that users are recorded in, you know, within businesses, but this type of software wouldn't be recording it, right? So this is certainly a no-no. So let's look at a couple other things that, that are present here, right? So let's, let's look at... Uh, I'm just I'm just gonna pick a random because they keep fluctuating right here, but I'm gonna pick a random one that just comes up. So here we go. Uh, okay, client server runtime process. Let's look at that one, right? I'm gonna see what that is. We know that it's a Windows process right off the bat because it's located within the C Windows System 32, right? This is where most of our you know DLLs are located anything that uh, would be registered uh, through registry, right? This is just a regular process that runs in the background. Um, hence, it's located within C Windows System 32, client server runtime process. Um, in our case, again, we can go to our, let's see if I can catch it real quick. There it is. I think I caught it. No, system runtime, <laughs> client server runtime process. There we go. I'm gonna open file location. And here is our C Windows, um, C colon Windows System 32 folder. This is our systems folder. And sure enough, it's right here. And it, again, it's highlighted. And we can say, and we can see that it's been installed um, and you know, modified, I should say, um, 9-29-2017. So it's been on this computer for a while, which is actually a really good indicator um, Unless you know, unless you know, it'll be it'll be kind of crazy to have a virus installed for this long on on the computer and nobody notice. You know what I mean? So most of the time, um, having something this old running in the background as part of Windows, um, you know, processes in the background, it's perfectly fine. Again, if you're unsure what this is, and you know, let's go ahead and do this. Right, client server runtime process. Let's go ahead and look that up in Google, right? And it'll give us a little bit more detailed of what it is. Client server runtime process, right? You Google it and it's uh, it tells you right there what it is. It's a client subsystem is a component of Windows NT family of operating system that provides the user mode side of Windows 32 subsystem and is included within those. So this process, uh, this application has been around since Windows 3, Windows NT 3.1. Perfectly safe. So now you guys have a really good idea on how to troubleshoot these weird uh, processes that might be running in the background. Now, as I promised, we're gonna look at the services, right? Let's go ahead and look at the services. Now, services are important in a way where you have to kind of consider um, what it is that my computer needs when it comes to operating smoothly. And what I mean by that is that certain components of Windows um, or a Windows operating system and certain applications requires these services, uh, require certain services to work um, at certain times. Some applications require them to run at the boot up, at the boot up of the computer at the login of the user and such and such. Otherwise, the application wouldn't work. One example for that is printing, right? If you don't have a printing service enabled 
after you reboot the computer, the printer service starts and that allows you to print, right? As simple as that. And that particular one should be here somewhere. There it is. Print, it's called print spooler, right? This is the service that runs in the background that allows you to print. As simple as that. And of course, you can get to the services if you just go in here and just type in services, right? It gives you, it gets you to the same thing, all right? You can find print services, right? Here we go. Print spooler here. And we can tell also that it's running and it's automatic. So how do we know it actually starts automatically? Well, if we, if we have it here, if we just double click it, we can tell that it's automatic and it happens as soon as your computer restarts, right? And of course, if you stop it, if I click stop here, now I can't print anything. At the same time, some businesses, in order to save paper, you know, environmentally friendly or save ink or whatever the reason may be, you can actually disable this. So if I disable and click apply, now nobody can print on this computer ever afterwards unless you have administrator privileges to change this back, right? So I'm just going to change it back to automatic which means that it will start up whenever it's needed and on the reboot, right? It, it's going to restart itself. So, right, but, you know, after you enable it, you have to obviously click start again to, um, to get it going again. So that's the point of services. Some applications require services to run in the background in order for them to function properly, and some of them are simply part of Windows operating system. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you like this video. If you have any more questions, please leave them below. I also have a forum website at koboman.com if you'd like to check that out. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Share with your friends. Thank you so much. Again, have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, I want to talk about file association. This is a good to know for everybody, for everyday users like me and you, but also for people who do tech support. A lot of times you'll come across an application that requires specific software to run, but sometimes, and for some weird reason, it doesn't work because it doesn't know which application to use. This is usually, or this is typical with apps or applets that need to have a base software to run underneath uh, so that way it can do its thing and that good example of that is java applications or applets or even java plugins so of course we know what the basic file association is if we look at this video file we can see that it opens up using a windows player so if we right click it and go to properties we can see that it opens with movies and tv which is part of windows so it's a windows uh, video player but if you want to open this dot mp4 file with something else we can simply do this click change and for example select the vlc media player click ok select it and now it's using windows media player so that's a quick file association and you know this is pretty easy anybody can do this and it's really quick and really simple but sometimes in tech support in a business environment this breaks even if you have the correct software installed and uh, sometimes it may not prop run properly so let me show you an example that i've kind of recreated to show you what happens so here is a website this is a nasa website they have a bunch of java uh, applets or you know simple java applets that you can run and if we click save it's going to download it to our folder so if we click open folder we can now see that this extension that is jnlp there's nothing associated if i double click on it it's just not going to know what to do because you know it doesn't doesn't even have java installed on this computer however sometimes even if you do have java installed on your computer this file association will break in our case there is no java installed on this computer um, yeah new web browsers like for example chrome here and uh, probably edge as well and i'm assuming um, I, you know i'm not 100 i'm not 100 sure on ie but um, chrome 
uh, I know it uses uh, Java plugins to run. So it wouldn't even need that. I went ahead and downloaded Java. So we're going to install Java here. And you can see that the file association will change immediately. But I will show you nonetheless on how to do it manually and properly in case this breaks and it becomes just a white sheet of paper as it is right now. So simple way to, to resolve this is to make sure you have Java installed. So we're going to install Java and uh, I'm not going to, okay, I'm just going to click Okay, it's just going to install it real quick for you, and then this is going to change, hopefully, into the correct Java um, file association. It should, when it's done, it should know that it's downloading uh, or that it's installing. It should know that Java is installed. Uh, this is typically what happens whenever you install a program. It runs the file association at the end. It changes these settings right away, and it sure works. But again, sometimes it breaks, and then you have to do it manually, and there is a different way of going about it instead of a quick way. So, all right, let's see what happens. I'm going to click Close, and we can see that it, nothing happened. So uh, let me go ahead and refresh this to see nothing happened. So if I double-click it, huh, it actually knows, but it didn't tell us that. So what it does now, it's actually downloading this, uh, it downloaded that little applet from the NASA website, and this is exactly what happens whenever you need that file association. Or otherwise, you'll never get to this point where it's going to run that applet. So now, if we click Run, it's going to start our little application. Can't find the name of Intel ICD Open. <laughs> Okay, so it's not working for me because it doesn't have the OpenGL driver. Anyways, so here's what happens. It actually started using uh, OpenGL on uh, uh, Java without OpenGL, and it's still it's working, so that's good. Now we have this little globe, and now we have file association um, that is working. So let's go ahead and close this real quick, and go through Windows and tell it what it needs to use in order to run properly. So the way we're going to do this is going to right click on this little Windows icon. We're going to select Apps and Features up here. And then we're going to select Default Apps here, very important. And then we're going to scroll down and we're going to select where it says Choose Default Apps by File Type. So this may take a little bit to pull up because it's literally pulling up all the file types in the entire system. So what you're going to see here uh, in a moment here is bunch of, on the left-hand side, dot extensions. So it's going to, for example, have all of these dot 3GP and everything else. So what we're looking for is an extension that is called, uh, let's see here, dot JNLP. I wanted to make sure you guys see that. So it's .jnlp. You can also see it right here. It says JNLP. So we're going to look for that. We're going to scroll down. JNLP. All right. JNLP. JNLP. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. So it already knows to use uh, Java Web Launcher. So to show you where that is, actually, in case it's not detected, um, Java Web Launcher. Uh, it's also known as Java Web Start. So if we go in the root of C and then we look for Program Files x86, Java, JRE, and then uh, bin, and then we're going to look for Java Web Start, which should be Java WS. I probably passed it. Java WS, Java WS. Java CPL, that's the Java control panel, which we will pull up as well, because I wanted to show you the, there it is, Java WS, because I wanted to show you the actual applet that downloaded to your computer. So Java WS, and that's the extension that it needs. So in this case, uh, let's see here, file association for that is correct. So it's Java uh, web Launcher, which is also known as Java Web Start here. You see it says Web Start Launcher. That's the same thing. So since we are here, I'm going to open up a Java Control Panel, which, by the way, is also the same thing as if you were to go to Control Panel of the Windows. So if we just type in Control Panel and open it up, yeah, where is it? Java, there it is. Java 32-bit is the same thing as Java Control Panel which is Java CPL. 
So here we are, and in this here, I'm going to show you what exactly downloaded to the Java applet. And this is always going to be on the first tab. You don't gotta, you don't have to go anywhere else, but you do have to click here where it says temporary internet files, click view. And we can see now that it downloaded that Java applet right here, which is Whirlwind KML, and it's by NASA and you can see that it type is application. So you will see this a lot when you do web, uh, web support. And again, if you're having issues with this, you can literally just delete it uh, right here, just be clicking the X and uh, we're going to reinitiate it again because this applet, all it does here, it just calls for um, downloading off that from NASA website. See, it downloaded it again and it's giving me the stupid error again, but that's not related to that. It's still going to run. Anyways, exit. Come on. Anyways, here it is working again. And that's how you do a file association in tech support and just on your computer, if that's what you're into. Uh, let's see, while I'm here in Java, I want to show you a couple other things to kind of look out for. Uh, the, one of the other typical things is security. Some websites will never get to that point where you get that applet to come up. So if you were to go to here and download it and this and that, uh, you, you may never come up to that point if you remember seeing that security pop-up or are you sure you want to run this type of thing. Uh, that sometimes you have to um, add that website as a trusted website, an exception list. And this is located in security. And this is typically done for uh, uh, web start applications. You can see here, web start applications. And if I click here, edit list, I can literally add the name of that website in there. And after that, it should start working. All right, let me just go to this website here real quick. And then we can copy this here. Cup, cup, <laughs> copy. And then we're going to put it in here. And now, the security prompts, if any, will not pop up and it will allow Java to run uh, automatically. Now let's double check again here, and this is another troubleshooting thing. Let's see where it's downloading from when I run this again. See, it's downloading actually from HTTPS worldwind.ca. So that's another way to troubleshoot this. So we can go in here and type in HTTPS worldwind. Dot CA. I think that's what it was, Whirlwind CA. So if you're having trouble running these type of applets, whirlwind.arc.nasa.gov. Okay, so um, I was wrong. It's the same thing, whirlwind.arc.nasa.gov. Okay, so yeah, because sometimes it does, you know, the applet itself may actually look uh, for a different location to download uh, the application itself um, locally, which... I have shown you that in Java control panel and that was here under view temporary internet files. All right, guys, I hope you find this useful. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. Please leave a like. I really appreciate that. It really helps the channel move forward. Um, it, it helps get more reviews, to be honest. And I really appreciate you guys watching and your support. I, uh, I'm utterly grateful. So <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubum. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to restore users' favorites. This is, happens a lot with desktop support or help desk. You get a troubleshooting ticket. The user says, my favorites are gone, this and that. Well, there are a couple of reasons why that could happen. You either uh, reset users' Internet Explorer and they reset some of the settings so they can't find their favorites, or a lot of times user just deletes them or simply forgets that they moved their favorites, right? So let's have a look why would this happen. So let's say there is an issue with the user's website and you just want to reset their Internet Explorer. You do a full reset. Now let me show you how this is done you go to the internet options and if you've done this before you know exactly what i'm talking about so if you go to internet options and you do a full reset if you do reset advanced settings and then do a full reset and then you delete their personal settings this and that it will remove all of their basically settings for ie so they're going to assume that their favorites are gone however what this happens is especially if the user has you know, uh, favorites bar with a bunch of favorites, their favorites bar is simply removed. So how do we do this in IE? And I will show you this, how to do this in Chrome. 
just in case uh, your business uses Chrome for some reason. And it's very similar. And when it comes to Firefox, it's very similar to IE. So I'm going to omit that for now. So if you want to bring back uh, somebody's, uh, you know, a bookmark toolbar, you would simply right click in an empty place for right here and then select favorites bar. And now their uh, favorites are back, right? So we're done with that one. Now we know if that's the issue. Usually, this is usually what happens basically there. They would say, oh, they're missing, you know, this and that, but they're actually not. They're just their favorites bar is missing. Now let's do this in Chrome real quick. Um, so in Chrome, it's a little bit different. You, you know, you can't really get to that part if you right click up here. So it's a little bit different. But however, there are these three dots here, like a sort of like a vertical dots. If you just go ahead and click them, some people call this, uh, I've, I've heard people call this many different things, but I call them three dots. So let's go ahead and click these three dots and then simply go down to bookmarks and then show bookmark toolbar, right? So there we have it. Now their toolbar is, you know, their bookmark toolbar is restored. Now they have their favorites back. So they should be happy. Now let's say they're actually missing their favorites. I'm gonna show you real quick. And this kind of ties in with my previous two videos that I've talked about um, users profiles and their location of their favorites is always going to be under um, root of C users folder, and then users login name. So whatever they use to log in into their computer, it's going to be under the there's going to be a folder named this, and then their favorite. So let's have a look for mine. I'm just going to go real quick here. You know what, let's just do it like this. And then uh, root of C, right, users. And there, that's my login name, B-U-C-O, right there. So if I double click on that, there's going to be my favorites folder. If I double click on that, you can see that my favorites are here. So this is going to be my regular favorites here. Favorites bar is going to have a separate folder, which is that, right? So if we compare here, you can see that MSN and Google are in my favorites bar, which is right there. So if we go back once to just regular favorites, there's only Bing as in uh, bookmark. And if we look at our bookmarks, if we click on this little star here, we can see that it's only Bing here. So that's how we find out whether where their favorites are. And if they misplace them, if you simply find them, you just go in here and copy paste, right? They'll be just links. Basically, that's what they are. Favorites are just links with icons. So if you go and find the backup of their favorites somewhere else, you would simply just copy paste them in, whether you want them in a favorites bar or simply in their regular favorites. Now, while you have, while I have you guys here, let's do something real quick. Um, if you use Google, uh, by default, you don't see a home button. A lot of people miss this. So this is a really quick tip for you guys. In order to get to that, in order to restore the home button, that's usually either on the right-hand side or left-hand side, depends what you're used to, whether you're using Firefox or Internet Explorer. One way to restore them in Google Chrome, which is missing by default, if you click the three dots again, and if you go to settings, and what I, you know, I usually don't... Uh, um, you know, uh, I I'd like just like in Windows 10, you can do a search and just to kind of help you find certain things. But in this case, we don't have to do a search. Like, for example, I would type in like home button here, you know, just type in home and it would kind of get me to there. But basically, we're looking for this setting that says show home button. Now, let me move back here so it shows default. It's actually, uh, let's see here, a second thing after appearance. So second thing down, it says show home button and it's disabled. If you just click on that little button there, it's going to show it, right? And then you can basically set whether you want it to be a you know certain thing. Let's say Google, Google.com. Sorry, I was typing with my hand and actually holding my microphone in, in the other. So that they'll basically set their home page to that, right? So now they have their home button. It's right back here. So when we click on that, it's going to go to the google.com. All right, guys, this was another desktop support quickie. I hope you really like this one. Um, I just want to mention this real again. I have a Patreon page if you'd like to support me. Link in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, like, comment, share with friends. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I will show you how to update BIOS on HP computers. Whether it's a desktop or a laptop, the method is very similar or identical. This also can be used as a learning tool for other types of computers, name brands, or specific aftermarket motherboards. It's very important that you watch the whole video because there are a lot of issues that you may come across that I explain and I also explain to you how everything is done step by step. Very useful for desktop support or tech support in general. 
So the first thing we got to do is find our BIOS. We got to get the new version of BIOS so we can simply search for that by going to the internet and just search for our, your specific model, whether it's a model of a desktop, laptop, or motherboard, simply type it in. In my case, it's HP 800 G2, and I'm just gonna type in BIOS behind that. This should give me results. And sure enough, the top result talks about BIOS for my specific computer. Once you select that link, typically what you see on any manufacturer website is that you will get a list of all kinds of drivers for all the peripher peripherals that are on your computer. For example, audio, graphics card, networks card, storage, and such. However, we want to concentrate on a specific menu here, and that is BIOS. If we click on that and expand it, we do have a download button. We can simply click download, which we will do. Select download and we're going to click save. This will save the package of the BIOS onto our local computer. That is very straightforward. But let me just go back here and just tell you about something very specific that could be an issue for you if you come across it. It's pretty rare, but it may happen to you. Sometimes you have to update previous version of the BIOS in order to install the most recent one. So basically what happens is you try to install, uh, let's say in this case, version 02.37 version A, you may get an error that says, nope, you cannot install this until you install a previous version. And here is a link for the previous version right underneath it. If you click that, it may say you need to install, for example, version 02.3 zero revision a before you can install for example 0 0.37 so in the nutshell just kind of be on the lookout for that error and if you do get it this is what you have to do and this is where you find the previous versions okay so let's go ahead and open the folder where we downloaded our package copy it to my desktop just so i can have it here separated from everything else and you can see that this is a Microsoft packaged type of executable. We're going to run that here. And this is certainly one way of doing it. So if you go here, this is going to unpack it into C, SW setup, and then backslash SP94599 folder. So once we do that, it's just going to unpack it and it may start to install it from here which is certainly doable. So this thing that came up is basically some update and recovery instructions that you can use. You can also do it from here, which gives us instructions on how to do it. Once we are in a start menu, we're gonna hit F10 to set up BIOS flashing. And then I'm going to actually show you this with an external camera that will record all of my steps externally so you guys can see it. So. Let's look at our unpacked BIOS. So let's see here, it's in the C and it's SW setup and then SP9495999. So here is our flash files. And inside we have a folder called HP BIOS update REC. So we're going to go inside of that and here we have an executable that we can run. So let's see what the, um, you know, what that does for us. So once we initialize this, uh, what it's going to do is going to look for the specific bio settings there on your computer. And then it's going to check to see if the password is set on the BIOS. And if it's not, it's going to deny you installing of this BIOS. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to run this from the windows and again i will show you how to do it from the bios itself so we're going to we can try to do it from here so we can simply click next and our other option is to create a recovery usb flash which is what i wanted to do and uh, that's another way of doing it or you can simply copy bios update file to any file location or create a backup of the current BIOS to any file location. 
So let's go ahead and create a backup just so we have it. And it's going to create a backup of it within the same folder. So this is a really good thing to do first, just to make sure that you do have a copy of the BIOS just in case you have to revert back to the older version, which a lot of times is not even possible, but uh, HP has created this um, utility that allows you to do so, which is not the case in most of the BIOS that you update on motherboards or some other brands of computers. <clears throat> so now we have current BIOS was saved successfully. We're going to finish that. And this is actually really simple. So I don't want you to be kind of turned off by so many steps. And it's very good to learn, especially if you're doing desktop support. You know, this might be something you do. So let's go ahead and try to update it from here. And then we're going to do create recovery USB flash as well. So once we click on the update, we get this warning. It says your current Intel Active Management Technology firmware is affected by critical security vulnerability. Please update the firmware or implement mitigations immediately. So if you click OK, it kind of talks about what this is. And it's uh, Intel Active Management Technology. It's a uh, something that prevents or controls remote privileges for that computer so you know this should be fixed with the bios update if not then we can just ignore it for now and if uh, you know if you're just uh, using it as a personal computer which i am then you don't have to worry about that per se so we're just going to go move on here is an example of what i was telling you about the bios version my current bios version is 2.15 and the one that we're trying to install is 2.37. We're going to click next. It's going to create a backup once more of our current BIOS. And then it's going to proceed or at least attempt to install BIOS through the Windows. And after which we would simply reboot the system and that BIOS update would be complete. That's in the perfect case scenario. This is not necessarily you'd be that you'd be able to do in a business environment, but that's okay. Again, I will show you how to do it manually with a thumb drive. So now it has prepared it. Now when we click restart, it's going to install it basically. So we're going to restart it. And uh, for that, I'm going to bring an external camera so we can see what happens. So here we go. Restart has started. Now we're going to see what happens after we did that. And we're certainly going to check the version that it should be, which I believe is 2.37. So now it gives us a couple of different options here. It gives us an option to update BIOS to 2.37, postpone update, or cancel update. So we're going to go ahead and update it. I'll go ahead and hit enter on that. And as you can see, it is commencing the update. It says do not shut down or remove external power from your computer during this process. Chances are that your aftermarket motherboards will have a system or utility that will allow a BIOS update just like so. You may not even have to do it in such way, but it will basically involve the same thing where it would, it would install it and then reboot and then you'd be pretty much done. Now it's basically just asking to reboot and there's a countdown. So I'm just going to let it do so in three seconds. Two, one, zero. Oh, that's not good. See, I think I broke my computer. After it made those horrible beeps, the computer was shut down and I had to manually turn it on. It turned itself off again 
and now it's rebooting after you saw that message that it says it was finalizing so that took about I want to say 15 to 20 seconds after for the uh, finalizing of the BIOS update of course we can confirm whether this actually happened and I will bring I will record that on screen just so you can see so with the update completed we can double check to see if indeed it worked and there are a couple of ways of doing it you can initiate this executable once more I'm sorry this is the package but the executable that we looked at earlier and it will tell you the current version of the BIOS that's on the system so if we go back to C SW setup SP HP BIOS run this again it will show you what the current version is but you can also do it with just going into your search bar and just type in system <coughs> system information open that up and where it says BIOS version it says here that we have version 2.37 that was last created or updated on January 2nd 2019 which is a little bit more than two months ago okay now let me show you how to manually get into the BIOS update so with our USB drive plugged in here under F what we can do is run that executable once more we're going to go inside of C SW setup SP94599 and HP BIOS update folder we're going to run that executable again and as soon as it comes up there it is we're going to create a recovery USB flash this will create a copy of our BIOS make sure you have the correct drive connected and now it's copying files and it's going to put it inside of a folder called Hewlett Packard I believe that's what it said and here's a little notification which says to recover a device with a flash drive please follow these instructions insert the flash drive into USB power on device you may restart up to three times which we will do now let's just double check to see where it's at before we get to that USB drive Hewlett Packard now here's a pro tip if you go inside a BIOS update folder here it says it's empty right but that doesn't make sense much but if you go into the BIOS folder and look at current it actually will show you the current one which is 2.15 but it will also show you the update file for the most recent one which is 2.37 so sometimes the BIOS once you go inside a BIOS and I'll show you that in a minute to update it manually it will just say I can't find these so what you have to do is actually go back here and go back inside of BIOS and where it says new and previous you, you should copy them you should copy those files that I showed you accordingly so you can see that it's empty the new one and the previous one is empty so we're going to put them inside of that I'm surprised that HP in our case didn't do that so I know this is the old one 2.15 so we're going to go back here and that's going to be the previous one we're going to put it in there I'm going to make a copy of it because the BIOS thinks it's there a lot of times so that's a pro tip right there so and then I'm going to make a copy of this one make a copy of this one which is 2.37 this is something else that I'm copying over so you can ignore that so and I'm gonna put that into the new it's gonna copy it over real quick and there it is so now BIOS will know exactly what to look for we have previous Oh, where did it go we have new and then we have previous where did I put the previous one okay well let's go back here here's the previous one copy BIOS previous okay copy it over there it is okay now we have previous and new installed which something you shouldn't have to do but if you get an error where it says I can't find it it's not there not located this is what you have to do to fix uh, that okay let's move on to the manual BIOS update procedure
you may have to press a different key combination to get to the BIOS boot menu, but it should be the escape key. And if you remember our instructions that popped up when we downloaded BIOS, it said to hit F10. I'm going to go down so you can see which menu we need. And it says BIOS setup. So in the main menu, this is how it was. We need to move one, two down where it says update system BIOS. And as we have a copy of the BIOS, of the new BIOS on the USB drive that's plugged in right now, we can go here, we can go down here and select update BIOS using local media. So if we hit enter, it's going to give us options to do so. But since we've already done it, the only option that's given us is to roll back the previous version, which is 2.15 as indicated. Otherwise, it would just give us an option to update to the newest version, which would then we would simply select it on our USB external storage, which is very self-explanatory. All right, my friends, I really hope that this video helps you, whether you're doing it for your personal computer or you need to learn something like this as a desktop or tech support person. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. This is what I'm here for, and I'm here to help you out with any questions that you may have. If you like this video, please share it with your friends, select the like button, or subscribe. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, we're going to talk about Windows updates. Windows updates is one of those things that happens in the background. People don't really think about it too much. But when it comes to desktop support, it's incredibly important to know what they are. Especially if you're the guy that pushes all the Windows updates to all the computers in a business environment. What we're going to do in this video, we're going to talk about Windows updates, what they mean, how you can find what they're about before you actually push them to all the computers in your business. We want to make sure that we don't break all the computers before we do anything like that. So it's kind of, it's incredibly important to know this type of stuff. This is going to be one of those fun videos, not just for desktop support, but also for help desk. If you like to learn about IT, stick around as we are going to go through this and we're going to explain all things that we need to know about Windows updates and all the things that we can pretty much find out when it comes to Windows updates. All right, guys, if you get one second please click the like button it really means a lot to me that way i know you guys like my stuff and i'll keep making more videos because of that thank you so much and let's get into it all right guys let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video windows updates what do we need to know about windows updates let's have a look on windows updates how they look like on your computer i'm sure you already know this but this is how you get to them if you click on the start button and then click settings and then if you click update and security and that's just one way of getting to windows updates so this is what you see nowadays this is, has changed a lot from windows 7 and it kind of looks like this now where it gives you a little bit more options right now i have paused windows updates and for the right reasons because i wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating in case you're not aware most of you, I'm sure, have seen this happen on your computer, but a lot of times it just happens in the background and it just kind of does its thing. So here's an example of security intelligence update here for Microsoft Defender Antivirus. So what that was actually was an update for your built-in Windows antivirus software. And we, could, we saw the, what they called a KB, which is a knowledge base article about that. Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell how, kind of here what it might be kind of in just general so it's kind of vague right now all it tells us it's update from windows 10 version 1909 and down here you can see that it's a fairly large 
uh, or an important update that it requires a restart. So there's a pop-up here that says restart. And of course we have a you know big old restart button here. So let's kind of dig into this. Version 1909, why does it say version 1909? Well, let's see what our Windows version is. So if you go to search button and just type in W-I-N-V-R, V-E-R, I'm sorry. So if you hit enter, it gives you the Windows version. So here it is, it's our version 1909, Microsoft version 1909. And again, it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific OS build. So it's uh, Windows uh, version 1909. All right, so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer, and I'm really curious to which version you guys are using, you'd be surprised. I bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else. Let me know in the comments. I'm really curious about that. All right, so we have copied our KB. Now we're going to open up, let me see here, you know what, let's just open Edge, see if it works. I've actually seen Edge work sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just crashes out of the blue, but that's okay. We're going to just open it up and we're going to go to Googleage and search for our knowledge article is what I call them. Um, don't know exactly what they would call it. Hey, there is no connectivity, which is really, really surprising because I know I do have connectivity. Huh, cannot connect securely to this page. Oh, well, there it is. That was really bizarre, guys. I'm not sure. It could be my internet that is causing this issue. Although I did get a new modem just literally last week. Maybe it's my router. Maybe I need to change some uh, router setting. So here, here's our... Uh, KB here, and it's 4497165. Let's see if it refers to that. 4497165. We have double checked that. And here is a knowledge article from Microsoft. Here it is. It's an Intel microcode updates. And now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about. Again, this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment. So let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom. So you can see that it's an article and that there is the title of it. And it says here applies to Windows Server applies to Windows Server version 1903, all editions Windows 10 uh, version 1903, all editions Windows Server and Windows version 1909, and then all editions, and then there is more. So basically it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909, okay? And in the summary it says, it, you know, basically it's a description of it and it's upgrade. It's an update to Intel microcode for the following products of, of CPUs basically is what they're talking about. So here are different types of CPUs. These are all different types of Intel CPUs and that's what the updates is for. So it's, we got Demerton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U, and then there's these other ones. We got Haswell's, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just a basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. Uh, basically you want to test it on a computer that you have like in a lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay. You know, these are all just, you know, just a microcode update for, you know, CPUs. And they've obviously they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update. But this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well. So that's a, a one important thing. This example just happened to be this microcode update and it's a good example because you don't want to like, you know, you don't want to break all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. 
All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to apps and features. So I'm going to right click our little start button here. We're going to click apps and features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, ad remove software or program that you have probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here, we're going to actually click on programs and features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed. And I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font. It's more compact and you can see a lot more. So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributable packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We are looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above turn on Windows features on and off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out. Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom. And on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column. And there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have an actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's um, sorted out by default. So once you open this, the bottom one is always going to be the most current, most current uh, Windows update. So we're going to start looking from the top, and that's the first thing that in, was installed, and it was uh, on June 18, 2018, and the first thing that got installed was KB2565063, which is just basically a Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 redistributable. So what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. I'm going to type in 2565063. Is that what it was? That's right. 2565063. 2565063 and here it is the first update for Microsoft Windows and it's very vague we don't know what this is so this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is so it's KB4556799 all right let's see 455 see my short term memory it's really early in the morning so I can't Exactly, sometimes 6799, 6799. I had my coffee, but my short memory is not that great. So let's see here again. Uh, March March 12th, that's when it was created. And if it's 4556799, we're going to click on that. I'm going to move it up here and see what that is. All right, so here's a, here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again. And uh, you can certainly read that as well. And you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry. It was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, 
this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article and all it is, it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge, updates to improve security when using input devices and updates to verify user password. So these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system. And you can see how it goes on, improve security when using Microsoft Xbox, Windows, uh, improve security and Windows perform basic operations. So these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer. And that's what this update is about. It's very vague. It's not a like critical update or anything like that. It's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system. So here's a security update that I wanted to show you and it's KB4552152152. Uh, Let me see if I can remember that. 21552. Nope. I need more coffee, guys. 45521. 2152. Okay, there it is. All right, so we're going to click on this one. There it is, 4552152. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the impermanence to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And it's labeled a security update. All right. I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point. But the point is of this whole video is that you want to look up as much information and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. <laughs> There's not much we can do when it comes to kind of digging really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that and when it comes down to it it's up to it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information and it again this is kind of disappointing but it is very very vague very vague um, when you do desktop support you will have control of which updates are installed at which times and you know this and that which is a great thing otherwise I'm not sure how how else you could deal with this now when it comes to these type of updates Microsoft is 100% in control and and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing and you as somebody who does desktop support would just have to make sure that they're safe and you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them and they can take sometimes up to a month or even more depending what the update is but you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff and yes i know most of these things you can just literally you know just install and test it if it's a minor update or it's just update you know this and that you still don't want to like install it and say hey it works fine on this computer now you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week I want to say with some computers being used actively used to see if everything is okay just to make sure that that is cool all right guys I want to wrap this video up especially because I hear uh, construction work right now I don't know if you guys can hear that there's a jackhammer outside right now and uh, they're working on the road here in front of my house so I'm gonna wrap this up and I hope you like this type of content I will definitely have more and I'll have more packages, kind of more crash courses. I see that more more, and a lot of people like this type of stuff. And I thank you so much for watching. Tell your friends about me if they like IT stuff and I'll talk to you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I will show you how to recover a Wi-Fi password. 
This is not one of those videos where I show you how to hack your neighbor's Wi-Fi or how to hack a public Wi-Fi or anything like that. This is specifically to show you how to recover or show your own password for your Wi-Fi. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, why would I need to know what my own Wi-Fi password is if I'm already connected? Well, the thing is, though, if you want to share that password and let somebody else connect to your network, and if you've forgotten it, this is how you will find out what what your Wi-Fi password is. Also, if somebody else set up your internet connection, your Wi-Fi, and they didn't show you what the password is or you didn't write it down, this is how you will find out what that is. Again, this video is not to show you how to hack somebody's or a public Wi-Fi at all. This is just an educational purposes thing that you can do by yourself. All right. The first thing we need to do is open up a command line, and this is going to be very simple. We just have to make sure that our command line, also known as DOS, is run as administrator. We're going to type in a simple command that will allow us to see which profiles we have used at some point to connect to specific Wi-Fi networks. So for that to happen, we have to type in N-E-T-S-H space W-L-A-N space S-H. O space and then type in profile as the string of words here indicates this means we're going to show all the LAN profile or I should say wireless LAN profiles that you have used at some point so we're going to hit enter here and now we can see all the profiles that I have connected to at some point so what can we do here well we know that we have connected to them at some point meaning that at some point we also had type had to type in a password for each one of those if it was secure of course and then we know that every time we connect to that wi-fi uh, later we don't have to constantly type in the password and that's the, exactly the point of these profiles meaning that these profiles here will have those passwords stored inside. So now we got to do is open up these profiles so that we can see what the password is. So that way we can take that password and connect other computers to that same network. So in order to do this, we have to type in a similar command. And what that's going to do is uh, dump the entire profiles onto something that we can read. So what we're going to do is type in N-E-T-S-H-W-L-A-N, and then we're going to type in export and then profile. You get it? We're going to export the profiles that are already there inside the computers. However, we do have to specify where we want to dump them. So we're going to specify, we're going, we want you to type it into a folder. So we're going to type in folder and then we're going to say equals and then specify which folder that is. So we're just going to dump it into root of C because that's the simplest thing we can do. So we're going to type in C colon. Let me make it a cap so you don't have to. This is just me showing it for the video. So C colon and then we're going to do backslash and then we're going to space and then we're going to type in key and then we're going to type in equals clear meaning this is going to show us a key or as in password for this when it's dumped so we're going to hit enter and this is going to dump all of three all three of these profiles here it's going to dump it into the root of c that we have specified so when we hit enter and there it is it went ahead and dumped them all into the root of c you can see what the path is just in case so we know that it's an XML type of file. So let's go ahead and minimize this. Go to our root of C. We're going to go to the C drive. And now we can see here, here, here are the profiles that are dumped with every information about that network. We can see there's FZ80, uh, 3135, uh, BD2, and there's one without the two. And there's one called police scan. So these are all the network I have, all the Wi-Fi networks that I have connected in the past. So let me show you first one here, just so you can tell the difference. This, if you double click it, it's going to open up automatically in your internet browser because it's an XML file. Of course, you can open it up in Notepad if you'd like. But we can see here what type of a network this was. The main thing we need to 
uh, kind of concentrate here is on authentication. And we can see here when I connected to this that it was open network. That means there was no password required. And you can see the there's no encryption because there's no uh, it's it just wasn't secured at all. And there's just no key to be fine. However, if we go to the one that's labeled two and double click that, and these are just example I'm, I'm showing you. Chances are yours will be straight up like the second one. We can see now that this network actually had authentication. And it says here that it's this is WPA2 PSK authentication. And it's the AES encryption type. And we can also see that the key type was a passphrase. And then we can see what the key material is. And it's exactly that. That would be our Wi-Fi password for this specific network. So it's ABD AD7 AF 3135BD. So make sure that you look under key material here and we'll tell you the password for your Wi-Fi. This is one of those quick tips that I wanted to make a video about because yes, sometimes we do forget our own Wi-Fi password and chances are that maybe somebody else set up our Wi-Fi for us and now we have somebody else who wants to connect to a, a, your Wi-Fi at home, for example, or you want to take your second computer connected to the Wi-Fi, but you may not know what the Wi-Fi password is. And of course, this is very educational for those people who might be starting into, you know, starting to learn about networking and this and that. If you want to check out, I have a lots of videos on networking that is some really good educational um, stuff that you, you know, you can learn from possibly. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please take a moment to leave a like if you have any questions or comments. I always like to see those. Thank you. Please share this video with your friends that may have also forgotten their passwords. All right. Thank you so much for watching and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. So there will be a time when you come into work and suddenly there's a lot of work that needs to be done. How would you deal with that? Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a situation in which you would have to think fast, think fast, think fast to resolve computer issues. So this video is good for help desk tier one, tier two, or desktop support or tech support, or if you're the guy that just simply works at a location as tech support for a company. So in this case, we have four different uh, trouble tickets that came through the system, but they are something that was left over from the previous shift or from the previous group that was in charge of that. So I'm gonna show you how I would quickly resolve these issue so this kind of uh give you will give you an idea of how i'm thinking and i will actually give you a kind of uh, uh an idea of my level of knowledge or level of expertise a level of experience but before we do that please take one second to like this video i really appreciate it, it makes a big difference for me and without any further delay let's get into it okay so here we go guys uh, we've got some tickets we're gonna work on what is this Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys watched my previous video um, on Active Directory. Uh, I do uh, suggest you check it out. Uh, we worked on some of these people. We created some user accounts, put them in their different groups, and we got, you know, the different people that we created on there, like Mary Pipkins, Mike Bobson, and Larry Buffett. And we put them all in there if you want to check that out. I do have a video on that. It's, uh, uh, I think it's Active Directory for beginners or something like that. Yeah, check that out. It's a good video. All right. So I made some of these tickets during uh, testing of the live stream that I made, I want to say a couple of weeks ago. So they are uh, quite expired. So as you can see here, time to do is negative 85 hours. So that's many, many days past due and you, you don't want to see this in a ticketing system at all. Uh, you want them to be fresh. You don't want them to have that. Well, you know, okay, let, let me just create that, uh, just a fake ticket. Just so you guys can see, fake ticket, how it uh, looks like whenever uh, you have a freshly ticket that comes through. Of course, this is going to be a different uh, looking for different uh, ticketing systems, but for this one, we're just going to, it's going to, yeah, there it is, pops up. And it, it, when it just creates it for Jira ticketing system, it's eight hours.
um, to do it, to fix it. That's the deadline, eight hours. All right, so let's see. We have my desktop icons are missing. And uh, it says here, I am missing desktop icons. Please help me. So what can cause this? Now, there are many things that can actually cause this from user deleting the files from uh, some kind of a change on domain. So let's say somebody uh, gets transferred to a different department, they get moved into a different group within a domain or within Active Directory, if you will, and um, suddenly now they are missing different icons because uh, this can be due to the like different redirects that different groups may have. And again, if you don't know what I'm talking about at this point, you might want to check out my Active Directory video that I mentioned previously. And uh, when it comes to this uh, video, I'm just going to kind of give you quick answers and show you quick answers on some of these tickets that how I would go about resolving them. If you want to know exactly how to do these tickets, you know, in, in the sense on how to contact the customer, how to add internal notes like this, how to reply to the customer, how to talk to them in general, and customer service just in general, and how to work actual system. I have many, many examples of videos on that, and do check that out. There are literally, so if you go to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Coleman, and go to the search box within my channel, and just type in ticket, and you'll see all of those individual examples that literally go into super detail on how to do all of this stuff. And it's very, very good, especially for somebody who has never done it. Anyways, I'm sorry, I had to get that out of the way so you guys... Uh, you know, have more resources to actually check out in case you haven't watched my previous videos. So again, I'm going to go through all these tickets that are in the system and I'm going to give you quick answers of what I would do in order to resolve them. So this one is I'm missing desktop icons. Please help me. So it could be just something that, you know, user went through like this and just like deleted or went through like this and just kind of drag things into the recycle bin or anywhere else. And, and then again, it could be somebody who moved to a different department. You kind of have to ask them all this stuff. Did you move to a different department? Uh, why are you, you know, it's kind of unusual to have missing desktop icons. So when somebody moves to a different department, they're moved to a different group within Active Directory, which can have different desktop redirects. Uh, these desktop redirects is something that is set up for individual departments that allow for certain desktop icons, uh, files, even files like this, or anything else within that you can put literally in a folder. And um, those people within that group will get desktop redirect, meaning that they will get all of those uh, redirected files pushed to them. So let's say somebody logged into this computer and they belong to a certain group. And let's say that certain group is going to always have, for example, these files in it, and their desktop will always have these files. They will get automatically redirected. Uh, they will they will automatically get these files redirected to their desktop like this. You know, so if they've been moved to a different group, chances are they may no longer have these. You know, so that's another thing you can do. Obviously, you can look through a recycle bin to see if there's something in the recycle bin if they've deleted it, and uh, it depends what it is. They may be asking about. Uh, specific software that it's missing you know software could have multiple icons because you know there are some software that has more than one function and they have more than uh, one app within that one software so they could be missing those uh, is it all icons if it's just some you know all these things we have to um, kind of ask them first in order to kind of help them and kind of trace back the steps and help them figure out where what happened to them so that's how I would approach this ticket here. Here's another one here where it says, I can't hear people through Zoom meeting. So if we look at this and it says today I had a meeting, but I can no longer hear people. So what is this? I mean, Zoom meeting, we all know what Zoom meeting is. And that is just a software or an application that's used for communication, right? So, you know, if they can't hear people through Zoom meeting, that means there is some kind of an audio issue going on. And of course, for that, I would go through the uh, sound control panel. What I usually like to do is I would right click this uh, volume icon and of course make sure that it's, you know, normal stuff that it's not muted and this and that. So what I like to do is go open, you know, open sound settings and go to, uh, well, first, like right, right away, you can, you know, make sure that their output is set to whatever it is. So in this case, we got Realtek set to Realtek high definition audio. We know Realtek high definition audio is just a built in audio for the computer. That's not their headphones that they might be using. So you might want to drop down and select the headphones that they're using. You know, so that's just one 
place where you can look at it. I mean, they haven't mentioned anything about people not being able to hear them, but if that's the case, obviously you want to go to input and make sure that the microphone is selected. Or if you see an issue like this where it says no input device found, then we have another issue. Then for that, I would go to sound control panel, which is over here. And then uh, for, you know, but since the issue is they can't, he, I can't hear people through Zoom meeting, um, chances are that the, their headset is not selected. In this case, we, there is no headset. The only thing that's selected is just the real tech, which is the onboard sound. So we want to make sure that their headset, whatever it is, um, might be selected. As a matter of fact, I'm going to plug in a headset over there so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so there it is. I plugged it in over there and automatically selected it, which is good. Uh, so yeah, of course, uh, the issue might be simply that their headset is not plugged in, but chances are pretty low, you know. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that it has that uh, green circle with the white check mark that it's selected. So if you have it uh, set like this, so you can, you know, this automatically actually selected it to be a default the communication device, which is fine. That could work too. Uh, but let's say it's set up like this and you, you know, it's not set up as default. You might want to do this and set it up as a default and you can do this, make sure it's set as, uh, you know, uh, automatically communication device. But, uh, and here's the part of it now where the microphone comes up. Now we can see that it's selected and you can see that there's nothing plugged in. It's a recording part of uh, just the real tech part of it. Uh, that being said, uh, make sure that you go inside of the application, whether it's Zoom, uh, WebEx or whatever it is that they're using for meeting, make sure that you go inside and make sure that this their headset is selected just like so. I have many videos on this, so I'm just going to move on from this. But this is typically what the issue is when it comes to audio issues. We want to make sure that everything is selected, volume raised, tested, whether it's uh, them not being able to hear somebody or whether they're, they're, people are not able to hear them. So just go through those settings and uh, yeah, it should be able to get you on the in the in the right direction. Here's another one that says, I am missing a program on my desktop. So they usually, uh, users usually realize this when there's an icon missing, when there's an icon missing on their desktop. So you can start from there. Let's say they're, say, they're saying, I don't have my Google Chrome. You know, chances are maybe it's just a shortcut that's been deleted. So you want to go to the programs and actually look for it to see if it's installed there. That's your first step. If indeed is a missing, and you know how they they say in this example, they're saying my program on my desktop, chances are it's just the icon. So if it's just the icon, go to recycle bin, see if it's been accidentally deleted and bring it back. But if, if the software is indeed missing, uh, you would have to basically go inside, uh, usually within the start menu somewhere here or within uh, the programs themselves, you would know, you know, the company that you're working for, you would know what kind of uh, distribution software that they're using to push different programs. So for example, you see all of these things that are installed on here, chances are, aside from Microsoft stuff, but like, let's say there's other stuff installed in here. For example, uh, we got OpenOffice, we got Oracle, and uh, you know, stuff like that. Chances are that this type of software will be controlled by another software that does the distribution, meaning installation of these software for all the computers within a company. So it's a program that controls installation of all of these things. So you would go in here and search for that program and look it up either here or the root of C, it depends how it's all set up. But you would make sure that indeed that program that they're missing is listed in there. So all you have to do is just make sure that it, it, see if it's in, see if it allows you to reinstall it. And there should be a way to do it. A lot of times you would select it and just select install, you know, and they have different options like uninstall. This is the repair, maybe this and that. That's how I'll go about it. But if they are uh, no longer have the, the software that they need, this might be some kind of a licensing issue. You have to kind of figure out what happened to their program. So, Sometimes, sometimes people that control what they call subscriptions, uh, software subscriptions for the company, for each computer, for each individual within the company, sometimes um, they will remove uh, licenses, licenses, uh, program licenses from the computers, and they would sometimes automatically remove them or meaning that they would remove the program automatically. So the way you can check this is basically by finding out what the uh, host name is for the computer typically. So you would find out what, so the name of the computer host name or 
computer name is the same thing. Host name is generally used in a uh, business type of environment. So host name, computer name is the same thing. So you would take this name, tech support, uh, as the computer name, as the host name, and look it up in the system that uh, allows you to look up different subscriptions that are uh, added to this computer named tech support. So, and then you will look for that specific subscription for that program that they're missing. And if they're missing that subscription, they may have to, or you may have to assist them in order to get that software again, you know? So, all right, that's how I would go about approaching this one. So let's move on. And for that, we have a ticket here. It says, I think I may have a virus on my computer from Mike Moser. It says here, this morning I received a weird message that said my computer is infected. I can't click away or use a computer at all. So this is a really good uh, example of something that you may encounter um, in a help desk, but also desktop support. If you're in a help desk, you may have limited tools, but if you're doing desktop support and you happen to be a guy that's like on site, then there is something you can do about it. Depending on the help desk, you may be able to do something about it as well. But generally speaking, if, if it's a message like this, you definitely want to take care of it right away. So if you are just a text, if, okay, well, let me, let me start from the beginning. I apologize. If you're help desk, all you can do here is kind of uh, go with your feeling on this. You know, the, the, the ticket literally says, this morning I received a weird message that my computer is infected. That, you might as well assume that there is a virus on there right off the bat. So the best thing you can do to them or, or to them, not to them, but with the user is ask them to disconnect the computer from the network and turn it off. So that way, or, or just, you know, unplug it from the power. You know, that's what I would do. Just let them, tell them to shut down, turn it off, especially if they can't click on anything, you want them to turn it off. And when you're tier desk, when you're tier one help desk, that's pretty much all you can do. And then from there, you may have to refer them to their local uh, tech support people. You know, they could, they may have somebody at the office in their building. So let's say they're it's some kind of a large building. There's, you know, I don't know, 500 employees. They got to have somebody there who is the, their tech guy who deals with this type of stuff. Now, if you are that guy that deals with this type of stuff, uh, there are steps that you have to take in order to remove this virus. Generally speaking, in a business environment, the best thing to do is just, you know, re-image the computer, meaning that you would delete everything from the computer. But sometimes you have to recover data that's on there. Let's say user saved a bunch of important stuff on the computer. Then you got to take certain steps in order to uh, retrieve this because you can't just pull them off. So typically you would, what you would do is take a hard drive uh, from this infected computer. You would physically take it, put it into another computer and set it as a slave drive. But make sure that other computer is updated, meaning Windows updated, make sure that their virus definition is updated and make sure it's completely updated uh, to make sure so it doesn't get infected as well. Make sure that the computer is off the network, meaning that it's not connected to the, the company's network or anything like that, because if you don't know what kind of virus this is, this could be something that could spread, you know what I mean? So this is all in case you have to recover data from it. All right, from there, um, you, you know, the, the, the this drive is slaved. Whenever you slave a drive into a computer, meaning you add a second hard drive to the computer, in this case, this infected drive, you take it, you put it inside the computer, and you just plug it into the power and the SATA connection, chances are. And then what it's going to look like is just going to show up as a second drive like this, you know. So as long as it's like that and it's not the system drive and you don't execute anything, meaning you go inside of this drive and you don't click on any executables or anything. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even go in, into it right away at all. I wouldn't even open it up. Um, you know, the chances are that as, as long as you don't run anything, your computer is compu completely safe because you are running things off your C drive and the, everything that's running in the background like this. See, these are all background processes. They're all running from your local C drive and not from the slave drive, uh, like in this example. So as long as you don't execute anything, you, there's no way for a virus to actually execute itself. You know, uh, that would be have to, that would have to be some highly sophisticated virus. It's 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 I want to say 99.9 percent 
impossible for that to happen. So the reason you want to have it slaved like this is so that way you can actually scan it. So if you right click it and then you can just scan it, for example, with you know Windows Defender or whatever the installed antivirus software is it or and is is on on your computer. That way you will find the uh, the in infection, you would remove it, and at that point you can go inside and recover anything that might be on there that they need. You know, so that way it's perfectly safe to go in and ask them or just kind of look around to see where they might have data that you want to recover. Of course, the drive itself, when you slave it, might have a BitLocker encryption on it. For that, it's going to ask you for a key. You see how this one has a little locket on it. That means it's unlocked. But, you know, if you uh, if you do get a prompt, like you would double click it and it would ask you, I made a video on this, on how to actually unlock it. So I do have a video on how to deal with a BitLocker encryption. You double click it and it would say, nope, you need a password or you need the BitLocker uh, key. And then you would get that and then, you know, go from there. That's another layer of security, which is good. So that's how you would go about it. And of course, after you're done with it, remove the drive. And I would just, you know, uh, wipe it. I would wipe it clean. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast because this is a video and which I'm trying to make uh, just in my spare time. I really don't have that much spare time, so I apologize if I'm going too fast for people that are used to me going slower. And I think that's it. This is the last thing. One, the last one here is the fake ticket one. And again, I have a lot of examples of this type of stuff. How to do everything from from the beginning to an end. All right, guys, I'm gonna go to my uh, face cam outro, I guess. Well, there you go. I hope you find this video insightful. Sometimes you got to think fast in order to resolve all these issues quickly. In this case, we had few tickets that were left over and we took care of them. Uh, there are many, many things you can do with that. But with experience, you will become faster and more knowledgeable and will be able to resolve these issues quickly. It's not a big deal once you know how to do all of this stuff. So never shy away from trying to learn things on your own. It's incredibly important because that's how you learn new things and that's how you become smart. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. Today's video we're talking about Pin Command and its use. So if you're doing tech support, help desk, network administration of some sort, or just tech support in general for a company, chances are you will be using Pin Command to troubleshoot different issues, uh, different connection issues over that network. So let me see, well, let me show you how I got this idea. So I went to CosmicNova.com which is my website. And then I picked um, one of my popular uh, articles that is called Top 20 Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. There's a link right here if you want to check it out. And I picked just a random thing that I saw and that is a question number 14, what is a ping command and its use? So just so you know, the way I explain things is in a slower manner where uh, I try to explain things in, in a, such a way that anybody can understand computers you know what I mean so my videos are specifically designed for people who might be new to help desk or tech support but if you also have experience this might be a good refresher for you so I will be going at a bit of a slower pace and explain as best as I can so it's easy to understand so if you're doing tech support or desktop desktop support or what have you chances are you'll be using pin command so what is pin command and its use I'm going to talk about the first part of it and explain the whole thing, but my written answer here is generally the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. So anything that is considered external resources is anything that's outside of the connection of your computer. So let's say you're using a desktop PC at work or a laptop, and then you're trying to access an external resource like a shared drive or a server or a website, whether it's internal or external, and you are you can't connect to it, or there's a you know issue with latency or lag of some sort, it's running slow. 
that's how ping command would be used and all these things are considered as external resources so something that your computer connects to over the network okay now through command prompt cmd you can type in for example ping www.microsoft.com and this is an example of a ping command so let's go ahead and open up cmd i'm going to top, open up command line command prompt or whatever you call it i keep saying command prompt command line i use linux too so sometimes i forget which one is which anyways we're going to use this example that we have here and it's ping www.microsoft.com so let's see what happens when a normal working website is up and running and see the result from it did i misspell that of course i did microsoft.com I'm trying to multitask here, so <laughs> you will forgive me. <laughs> okay, so one of the first things that comes up that you will notice here is a number, which is an IP address, which is uh, controlled by the DNS. And the DNS, basically what it does is takes a domain name, in this case, Microsoft.com, and translates it into a an IP address, which is the location of this website on a server. So the server for Microsoft.com is located at 23.45.133.21. So that's the IP address for the server, uh, of the server for the for Microsoft.com. Okay. So now these are real results of the ping command for a normal running website that is up and running, and there are no problems. So what happens is. Ping command sends four packets of data. So you can see here that it sent four packets. They are size of 32 bytes. And then it waits for a response and how long it takes to respond, which is shown here in milliseconds. So this is the first attempt from uh, of the ping to this IP address. And we can see that the response time here, that it took 14 milliseconds to respond. And then the ping command does it again, which is the second time. And this time it replied in 15 milliseconds. And then the third time, also 15 milliseconds. And then fourth time, also 15 milliseconds. Hence, four packets sent. Right? Very, very easy to understand. But of course, for it to actually respond, for actually to have a response of any sort, it has to send back four packets as well. So you can see here that the server at 23.45.133.21 also sent back four packets which were received at the same size. And then we can see that lost zero, that means it was successful. That means none of the packets failed, that all the four pings were successful. That's a, an example of successful ping command. We know everything is okay with this website. So let's go find a website that doesn't work. So I went to this website and this website kind of tells you of some of the, you know, big websites that are down. So let's kind of pick a random one here. Let's pick Trivago.com here. That's a safe website. We're going to type in ping Trivago. Well, let's do www.trivago.com. Www dot com now if this website is down like it says it is we're going to get some negative results which would be a good example of use of, of how you use a ping command and how to help you troubleshoot the issues so so far we can see that it's timing out what does that mean that the first packet was sent and it didn't connect it waited a certain amount of time didn't connect to the server or the server didn't reply, I should say, and then it timed out. And then the second time as well, I'm sorry, first time, second time, and we're waiting for the third one. Third one timed out. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go all full screen here. Let me kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so it's easier to see. And we can see that all four packets sent timed out. That means that the server just, we, you know, the, the ping, you know, waited, waited. You know, we waited and the server didn't respond timeout. There's only a certain amount of time ping command will wait for a response. And that's what happened. And we can again see here that four packets are sent. So, and then zero received. And in this example, Trivago.com is located at this IP address. 
that's the server that's the web server for the travago.com and now we can see that we sent four we waited we waited nothing happened we received zero because it's down and then we lost four that means we sent four and they never came back which gives us 100 percent loss of packets so how does this help us well for for one thing we know the website is down or you know a server that you're trying to access at your job is down right we can you know web server or some some other network component some other network resources you know if you have the name for it or the ip address you can just ping the ip address if you wanted to you can just type in ping you know ip address 35179.002.200 and here we go again we're pinging Trivago's server again except we're just directly bypassing the domain name and we're bypassing the dn well we're not necessarily bypassing the, but we're bypassing the uh domain name we're going directly to pinging the server itself and again it's timing out which is another indicator that the website is down so going back to the uh my question of how does this help us aside from knowing that the website is down so if it's an external website what we would have to do is find the web uh, webmaster for it or a person who has access to the server same thing goes for if it's ex internal website. So let's say your business, the, or the business that you work for, has some kind of internal website that everybody goes to, everybody uses it, you know, this and that, and you know you don't have necessarily access to it. You would find that webmaster and contact them. So how would you go about that? Well, if you know who the owner of Travago.com is, you would contact them directly, obviously. But if you don't know who the owner is based off the, the name of the Travago.com, based off the domain name, you can see who the owner is of this IP address. And this is something that uh, this is something that your company would provide this to you if you're doing tech support. So you would basically have a tool that lets you tool or you know some kind of notes or something. I don't know. It, this is all depends on. This varies from place to place you know but for example at my main job i know i will know who owns this ip address so not only can i look up to see who owns trivago.com for example i can also look up who owns this ip address and then i would contact that guy who is the owner of this ip address or a guy or a gal or whatever um i, I would contact them and say hey this website is down but the only time I would do that is if I don't have direct access to this. So let's say it, this is a server that I have, you know, that I'm running and everybody in the business here is using it as just a storage location. You know, let's say this is just a web server that hosts files for everybody in my building that I support. Well, I would simply just try this, you know, if I don't have physical access to it. I would open up remote desktop connection, type in 8.35.179.200. See if I can connect to it, you know, and it's going to fail because obviously I don't have access to it. And, you know, that's okay. But if I have physical access to it and I know where it's located in the data center or in the server room or whatever it is, chances are this you know, this server might be just turned off or, you know, there might be something else bad with it. But at least I will know that there is something wrong going on by using the ping command. And that will get me to either me fixing it or finding who can fix it. And that's how you would use ping command in a business environment. You know, if you're doing more network, network administration support you can use traceroute and find out more uh, about this but i will save that for a, another video so be sure to subscribe all right guys i hope you like this easy to follow video please share this video with your friends i really appreciate it it really helps me uh helps helps support my channel basically so thank you so much
please leave a like, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. Today's video is on trace route command. This idea comes from my article that is called Top 20 Network Administrator Interview Questions and Answers, which is located on my website that is called CosmicNovo.com. There's a link that will pop up right here on the top right hand side if you want to read that. In addition, I'm kind of expanding on my previous video that was about ping command. So if you want to check that out, there will be another pop up here separate for that video if you want to watch that as well. It's another good video to watch. So let's get into it. And the way I explain things is in a easy to understand manner without throwing a lot of terminology out there or anything like that. So yes, you know, knowing basic knowledge about computers is helpful here, but I will explain it in such a way where anybody can understand what I'm talking about because how many people actually use Traceroute or how many people even understand it? And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying sometimes it's hard to learn something if it's explained in the wrong way. Either way, uh, for this, we're going to need a command line, which we're going to open up right now. So in order to use traceroute, we're basically going to use the example from the article. It's simply typed in trace RT, <clears throat> pardon me, trace RT, followed by the name of the website you're trying to reach. This doesn't have to be a website. It could be a server of some sort or a switch, or I should say just an IP address of uh, a network uh, component or a location. So, and that gets me into why would you want to use trace RT before I even hit enter here and then a bunch of stuff comes up. I want you to understand why you would want to use it. So let's say at your work, at your office, for some reason, you cannot reach cosmicnovo.com. However, from your phone, which is by the way, on a network, on a different network entirely, you can reach Cosmic Novo just fine. Also, another example is an application that uses um, network connection to work. For example, an application that has to reach to a database that could be located in totally different state, country, this and that. It could be at the end of the world. It could be that it's not working. That's another reason you would want to use Traceroute. Or simply there is a server somewhere we can't reach whether it's used for storage or this and that, we would want to use Traceroute to figure out why you can't reach it from your office network, but you can reach it from any other network. So what it does in the nutshell, Traceroute, it traces all the routes taken on the network to reach CosmicNovo.com in this example. So it's going to map it out for me. <clears throat> So think about it this way. Let's say you have a date or you are going somewhere that you've never been before. You open up your phone, you go to Google or Apple or whatever it is that you're using. You type in in your navigation the address that you want to visit. And it gives you all these routes that it takes. You know, it says go straight, go left, go right, this and that. The trace route kind of does the same thing in a sense. However, trace route it will tell you whether there are certain roads or routes that you cannot take or that they're broken or non-existent. So that's a very simple explanation of what trace route does. It tells you whether a certain turn is broken or non-existent. Hence the name trace route. I hope that's an easy one to understand there. So we're going to see an example of this. As soon as I hit enter here, we're going to see what happens and I'm going to explain uh, all the steps that it's going through. All right, hitting enter. We trace out executed. This is typically what happens. It takes maximum of 30 hops as in 30 roads or 30 paths, if you will, in order to reach the final destination, which is this IP address for this website. And this may take a while. This is why I have a finished trace route of all the routes taken for that website. And I will show you what that is right now. So let's have a look at some of the things that kind of stand out. The first thing 
the first hop that shows up is basically pinging my IP address of the local computer. So the computer I'm using right now, local um, IP address for that is 192.168.1.1. So that's a typical local IP address. Second hop is basically trying to ping my IP address, external IP address for the internet. So my internet provider, which is Charter, is actually blocking that information for security reasons. It automatically blocks it. There's nothing I can do about it, but it's perfectly normal to see a second hop fail timeout like this. And then you can see that hops three through eight are all from my internet provider, charter.com. Is Charter is my internet provider. And you can see all these, if you will, switches that it takes in order to access the internet that goes the outside of the charters network so it goes through all of these and it seems everything seems fine so that's perfectly fine and then finally reaches the internet and then it has to go through this switch here and again it looks normal this route is normal and then it goes to the number 10 again it's normal then we look at 11 and we can see that there's increased millisecond response not necessarily too bad because we're not talking like 80 milliseconds 100 plus or something like that however something does stand out here and that there is a third on on the third response or third attempt ping of it is there is no response whatsoever a timed out so if we are having issues connecting to the final destination potentially we could look at the switches or servers that are located at these two IP addresses. So the first one is 7214.23.232, I'm sorry, dot seven zero, and this other one that starts with 172. So because we see uh, no response here at all for the third uh, ping there, we can kind of possibly assume that there might be some kind of a latency issue with these two switches or nodes, if you will, or they could be server or whatever it is that they are. We can look at that because it could be a server somewhere. And the reason I say server is in a sense, depending on which type of thing are we troubleshooting? Are we troubleshooting a website? Are we troubleshooting application connection, this and that? So it could be a you know part of the final destination of like, for example, application that maybe uses some kind of database that is located at the server or whatnot or server itself could be the firewall we don't know but we need to know kind of why what's causing this you know delay or lack of response whatsoever if there is a problem right but typically that's associated with higher millisecond response time so in our case this is probably just normal and chances are that these servers here just have a limit of how many times you can ping it so we're going to move on from that and then it goes through a bunch of different nodes here which could mean that it's just blocking this is very typical that these nodes are literally just blocking these type of um, connection requests which is fine we can this is pretty normal but every time you see a gap in between where it fails somewhere, this is something we would have to be concerned about. And we'll potentially look at that here in a moment. But this is an example of a good trace route response. And then it finally reaches uh, the uh, destination of 130.211.160.1. Uh, which is where CosmicNovo.com is located as you can see here. So it took all the routes and it took it 23 routes to get to the final destination and we know that everything is okay here. All right, so I found a website that's supposed to be down, a safe website. And let's see, do I have that going here? Yep, I had it uh, tested, it's anthem.com, which is basically insurance provider, health insurance provider. And I saw that it's down. Let me just double check here one more time going to ping it one more time to double sh to, to make sure that it's down and then we're going to do a trace route on it to see if we can figure out what's uh, causing the problem chances are it's the web server itself but it could be something in between too so i'm going to do a trace route on that as well and then i'm going to 
and you can see that it failed. You know, sent for, received zero, it's timing out, definitely down. So we're going to do a trace route. RT anthem.com and see what kind of response we can get. Again, this may take a while, which I will just fast forward to the results so we can see what's going on with that. So as we are looking at the results of anthem.com, you can see that they are similar to what we had earlier in the sense that it's taking same routes initially. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. See, this is the first one, and we can tell that it takes, you know, hits my LAN, and then it goes through all of these charter uh, switches, if you will. And if we go back here, we can see that they are the same switches, and it takes that same route. However, after it hits those, it decides to go another way, which was indicated, which was dictated by a this switch. This switch says, okay, well, now, you know, you're done with the charter network. Now you have to go through this something else. So let's look at the previous one. I'm sorry. Let's look at the previous one here. And did we take the same 15166? So in our case, after the 166, Charter sent us to this other one, which ends with 1, 2, which, by the way, is probably next to it. So there is a switch probably next to it in the same data center. You can see how it's only off by three IP addresses. Anyways, it decided, in this case, for the Anthem.com, which is this top one, it decided to bypass the next switch, which typically would have been this one, to route to CosmicNova.com. Um, well, it, well, it had to take another one here. So instead of going to any of these other ones, you can see that this one just said, okay, well, this is going somewhere else. And it takes a different route, and it goes to this other, probably, internet provider of some sort, which I'm assuming is related to AT&T. And it doesn't say that here, but the reason I know is if you look at these seven through... 10. You can see that the switches names are STL, which is, stands for St. Louis, ORD probably stands for Orlando, Florida. And uh, you can see that they're called atlas.cogento.com. And you can see the IP address that are connected to there. However, if you look at number 10, you can see that it says ATT here. So which is AT&T, probably Orlando. So it goes through Florida somewhere. And then it continues with switches that are located or that are that belong to AT&T and then routes it further. And you can see that it hits another three gateways, uh, most likely um, in uh, on, on an AT&T server before it reaches its final destination. This is still taking forever. So once it's finished, I'll, I'll show you uh, what the end result is for Anthem.com. However, I want to talk about a point of failure that may occur that may show up in trace route command. And here's a really good example. We can look at these AT&T switches here. So 11 through 13. Trace route is can tell you immediately whether something failed and in, in the path that it's taking. So it's we can imagine that in this example that number 12 here timed out. So let's pretend this one timed out, literally timed out, and we need to figure out where is it at, Who, wh what's wrong with this. Chances are if it timed out that either it's blocking the uh, this type of uh, information from being sent back, which happens with my IP address here, uh, but however, if it's just kind of in the middle here, and we know kind of just kind of by intuition that it's supposed to take another route because it goes to the third one here but for some reason just one this one in the middle times out that's a clear indicator of a switch that is or the switch that is just bad so how do we find out you know if it's bad or not well we would have to reach out to this guy or this company and ask them okay well we need to get somebody from AT&T 
on the call or call them or contact them and say, hey, there's a problem here. And they'll be like, okay, well, let's send me the results of Traceroute from your location. And they send it, you send it to them, and then suddenly they're like, oh, the number 12 failed, but we still know it's kind of on their network because it keeps going to their network. You see what I'm saying? It goes to AT&T. We know all three of these hops are going to be AT&T, but the middle one fails. That means it's still on their network, and the problem is on their network, and they need to look at this. And they would know. It would. I know it would say timed out here, but they would know what the next one would be or should be, or whether there is a break of some sort that prevents everybody, and that one switch is causing the problem. So they would look at this and they say, okay, well, we know it's on this network. Let's scour our network and look for this broken switch. And that's the point of Traceroute. Of course, there could be other examples of that. And that is, let's say this one doesn't time out, but there is a huge, huge latency issue here. That would also indicate, that would also be indicated by Traceroute that there is a problem. So let's say their response time is like 100 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds. This caused connection timeouts on the application and or a user end as well. So let's say there's a huge latency here. There's another reason why they would want to look at that switch or server and kind of see what's going on. The reason I say server is because it could be the final destination. We don't know. But in our case, we know it's not. It's just the switch that it's taking. And then with the trace route information, we can send forward this information to them and say, okay, well, you know, this is probably what's going on. Now, this thing is going to time out, and I'm going to kind of tell it to skip by hitting enter the attempt. For some reason, it gets stuck like this, waiting to get a re uh, response from the switch. And then I'm going to fast forward this to the end result. So as the final result of the trace route is coming up, we can see that the... Uh, Anthem.com is just simply down. This is what it tells us. The normal response from the trace route when everything's okay is indicated in my other window here. And you can see that the final hop gives us the final destination address. In our case of Anthem.com, it doesn't. It never reaches it. And this is clear indication that there's something wrong at the web server level so the webmaster for anthem.com needs to look at it and resolve the issue at the server level so but you know when we know that the website is down for everybody this is not necessarily the reason we would use traceroute.com or traceroute command for we would simply just use ping command to see if it's up or down but if there is an issue of latency if there is an issue of website or an application working for some people, but not others that are on a different network, that's when we would use the trace route. So it's for troubleshooting connection issues that are specific to a network. You know, meaning that just because I can reach it doesn't mean that some other people can as well. So this is how you would use trace route to figure out where is the breaking point on their end and why can't they reach or why can't I reach a certain web server, application server, or what not. Please share this video with friends, leave a like or any comment, and I will answer them. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. Thank you so much for joining today's video will be about whatever the title says. Um, the reason for that being is because I need to actually figure out what we're going to talk about. And for that to happen, I will have to go to my website, which is CosmicNovo.com. And I'm just going to pick a random article that's on my website, probably one of the more popular ones over here on the left-hand side, and just kind of talk about a random thing that comes up for example here's a top 20 network administrator interview questions and answers article and i'm going to pick that and kind of scroll down and pick a random interview question 
that we can kind of expand on. You know what I mean? So let's see here. By the way, I have a video on this particular article as well. If you want to check it out, it's definitely on my channel. Let's see here. Can you name different types of network cables? What is a subnet mask? I think I have a video on that. Can you tell me the difference between a work group and a domain? I'm not sure if I have a video on this, but you know what? Let's go for it. Now, I'm going to just go to read this answer here um, to this question, and I'm going to expand on it, meaning I'm going to explain it in a way where it's pretty easy to understand to anybody, even if you're like brand new to computers. I really like helping people who are just starting to learn about computers. So this video will be for you. <laughs> so I, uh, all right, let's get to it. So the question is, can you tell me the difference between a work group and a domain? My answer here is with a work group, you have a collection of systems that are connected to the same network, but have their own set of rules and permissions set at local level. So let's go on and, and expand on that right away, and then we'll come back to the domain part here because it ties into it a little bit later and at the grander or a bigger scale, if you will. So, all right, let's have a look. If you have more than one computer at home, chances are that in order to share any you know, data, any files between them, or you know, to be able to remote desktop into any of them, chances are you would have to be connected to the same work group. Otherwise, you won't be able to see the other computer on the network. Um, and, and, and I mean that in a uh, easy manner. You know, you can always see which computers are connected to the network by, you know, pinging the, you know, certain, you know, uh, names and this and that. But that's not what this is about. This is about having an easy access to other computers on the same network, which in a basic home environment would be considered as a work group. So what happens is when you have, let's say, four computers at home and, you know, one is yours, maybe you, your other one is your wife's, your kids or your brother, your sister, and uh, you guys want to kind of share information, share files across, you know, between each other computer, then you have to join each computer to the exact same work group, which basically creates a mini network at a software level. So this is different from a physical network where it's just, you know, you plug in all the computers to the same router and it's different from all the computers connect to the same Wi-Fi. That's a physical layer of the network. This is a software layer which are we which are which are some something we are dealing with right now. So in order to access the software, meaning the operating system of each computer, then we have to make sure they're joined in the same group. So if you look at the properties of this computer, by the way, these are just system properties that, that I went to uh, so we can get some basic information. You can see that the name of this computer is tech support, and it just says full computer name is tech support. This is related to the networking part of it, but it's the same, so that's good. And the work group here is called new server zero. So each computer that is connected to the same router at home to the same physical network will have to be joined to the same work group if you want to share all the you know all the media across that same network including printers and all of that stuff so let's look at some advanced settings which will kind of tie into on how to join the computer to the same work group here are system properties and another way to get to the system properties, aside from going, you know, of right clicking to this PC and then properties and then having to click, click on change settings, you can get to it through control panel as well. This is one of the things I don't really like about the Windows 10 operating system. You can see that a system option also came up here, but let's see how we can get to it to control panel and we are getting to the same thing. So if we select system in the control panel, we'll get to the same area. But then from here, we can either click on advanced system settings 
or change settings here and we will pretty much get to the same place. The only difference is if we click on advanced sense system settings here, it will pull up in just a different tab. You see that? Which is, I really don't like this about Windows 10, but I digress because they don't make it simple just to get to this main advanced setting. I guess this is designed to protect users who may make changes that may break their computer. Anyway, let's get to the first tab of the system properties. I'm going to close this out. And this is how you would change the name of this computer or add it to a domain or a workgroup. So while we're in the computer name tab, we can just look down here and it's the last button that we have that's called change. We can select that and here we can change the name of it. We can have it join to a specific work group. So here, this would be empty, chances are, and then you would just type in new server zero. And then click OK, and then you would have to restart the computer, and then your computer would be joined to that same work group. So after you do that for all the computers, and reboot all the computers, you can now access resources for those other computers over the network. So if you go here and then you can see that if I expand network, that different computers will show up accordingly. As soon as it loads a little bit, some of the computers are asleep, which may take a little bit for it to pull up. But generally speaking, once you are connected to the network, you can see the other computers that are on that same network and everything else that is connected to the same network. Here you can see there is a web OS TV connected to it and there is TS um, client as well connected to it. OK, so that's the uh, that's the network. Uh, that's the network work groups. Very simple. It's kind of something you would do in a small business environment or just at home, just so you have basic access to the same resources. Another thing you can do once you, you know, connect to the same network, or I should say same uh, work group, you can use remote desktop. So you can use remote desktop connection like this and just type in the name of the computer you wish to connect to. And I'm going to connect to one of my computers that is called Koboman 1. Let's see if it'll actually let me do it since I'm already using remote desktop. You can see that I'm already connected to remote desktop. I wonder if I can double remote desktop. Let's see here. The computer is asleep over there. I'm looking at it right now. A lot of times it actually pings the computer and it just wakes up, which is also called wake up on LAN. But for some reason, my computer is fast asleep over there. Just a sec, I'm going to turn it on so we can try this again. Okay, so I uh, went ahead and touched the keyboard to wake it up. All right, let's see now. Configuring remote session, which means that it's aware that the computer is awake. Let's see. There it is. Now I can connect to Koboman1 using the username, login, and password that is on that computer over there. Okie dokie. So now we have that done. Now let's go back to the domain. So with a domain, you have a group of systems that are bound by the rules of centralized authentication server. In a domain system, each, um, in a domain, each system has to connect through the domain server using provided credentials, also known as a domain controller. So somewhat similar to a work group, domain is a controller or a computer. Just imagine a server somewhere that controls the data that is shared between all those computers that are connected to that physical network. So instead of joining a work group, your computer would be joined to a domain. 
and that domain also controls your login information so instead of using a login that's on your computer which is in my case yt login you can see it here i'll show you what i mean here these are local here we go geez this windows 10 really is so much different and so roundabout not very user friendly when it comes to i digress here are the local accounts that are on my computer so these are local accounts that lets me log in locally to this computer so buco and Kobuman test account they're all local accounts as you can see they're literally um, labeled local accounts there's another way to c connect to a computer uh, without having the, a local account and that is a domain login account but for that to work you have to join your computer to that same domain and if we go back to these properties and click change settings here and then click change once more here so instead of joining workgroup we can join our computer to a domain so we just have to select domain here and then we can type in domain domain name just for example and then we can you know call it i don't know cobbleman.com whatever the name of the domain is so once we do that we would click ok and then this computer that is named tech support will join that domain however you also have to go to the domain controller the server and tell it that you are allowing a computer name called tech support to join the domain so once you click ok it's going to ask you to restart the computer and then the computer will restart or reboot if you will and then you get a login information from the domain controller that says okay now you use this login so now that you are joined to that same domain now you can start to share data between all of those computers that are connected to the same domain and you also have access to other resources that are available for that domain so let's say there's a there's a shared drive somewhere or some kind of a database or something like that that is only available for the computers that are connected to that specific domain now you will have access to that so if you're at work and you know somebody says okay i want to connect to this server or i want to access this shared drive or something like that and they can't if you look at their login information on the domain controller you can see which resources they have access to and once you go there you can see all that information so chances are you may have to adjust their access to the specific resources i hope that was pretty easy to understand i uh this was one of those slower pace videos because you know these things can be confusing to people and finding a good way to explain this in a you know slower pace is um, pretty rare to find on the internet so and i know that a lot of my viewers appreciate this type of explanation so i hope you like this uh, please leave a like on this video i'd appreciate it a lot and if you have any questions or any video suggestions related to you know just pc support in general feel free to leave it in the comments box below and don't forget to subscribe all right thank you so much for watching and you have a wonderful day bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kuboman today's video is about linux introduction to linux navigation specifically and the comparison to windows and how similar they are the purpose of this is to help you transition from windows to linux not in a permanent sense, but to help you actually decide to learn a little bit of Linux because Linux is just awesome and you won't believe oh, how similar 
it is to Windows, with the exception of some commands, but when it comes to its structure, it's incredibly similar. So starting off, I just want to show you that this is a virtual machine of Debian uh, distro that I'm using, and uh, we are at what, what they also call what's called console or a command line for Linux. In comparison, we have a command prompt, also known as DOS for Windows. So the default starting position for Linux is exactly the same as for Windows. So in order to prove it to you that I am in the exact same location as Windows is uh, very simple. I have to list all of the directories that are within this current directory. In order to do that, we're going to type in ls, which basically lists all of the content that are within a directory, whether it's a current one or the one you specify. In our case, we're just going to list the content of the current one. So if I type in ls, we see some familiar stuff. What does that look like? That looks just like our local profile that are that's in with window, within Windows. So we have desktop, we have documents, downloads, music, pictures, public, and videos and such, right? And by default, command prompt also starts within your local profile. So let me just type in dir, look familiar, desktop documents, downloads, videos, and such. So the starting position is exactly the same. And let me prove it to you visually. I know here you can see that it says C users BUCO, which is the name of the local profile that I'm using right now within Windows. The only difference is the name of the local profile that I'm using in Linux, which is Koboman. So let me show you exactly the same navigation. In order to do that, we're going to have to use a couple of different commands just to kind of demonstrate my point. So if I type in ls at this point, it's going to select everything that's there. If I type in cd, change directory, and go to home, type in home, it's going to take us to our home directory. And guess what's inside of that? This is the exact same thing as users that's in within Windows. So if I type in ls, we can see there's one local profile in there, like I said, which is Kobuman. So if I type in change directory, C-O-B-U-M-A-N, and then hit enter, guess what's going to happen? It's going to take us back to our exact same starting point that we are that we were at, and it'll be identical to the Windows version, which is users and then name of my local profile. The only difference is in Linux it's called home instead of users. So we are within home which is identical to users, and now we're going to navigate to its local profile, which is Kobuman. On this other side, it's B-U-C-O, which is the current local profile. And if I hit enter, there we are. And I type in ls, we're back inside of our local profile, just like the exact same starting point that's in within Windows. All right, let's move on from there and start to look at some other basic stuff that we can find. In order to show hidden files within Linux, just like they are hidden in Windows, we have to type in ls, list the current content of the directory or the one you specify, and then type in dash a. This will tell it to show all the hidden files. So if I hit enter, it won't just list the contents there. Anything that's hidden will also be shown. You see that? Now it shows quite a bit more as opposed to just regular ls, which is here. This is regular ls. And here is ls dash a. There's quite a bit of stuff that's hidden there by default, just like in Windows. If you go into Windows and enable show hidden files, I guarantee you there'll be some stuff that comes up on desktop or anywhere else that there are hidden files, obviously.
Now, before we proceed, I just want to point this out. I uh, made this, uh, okay, so I made this mug. I was thinking about a design, and like it's my first time actually making a mug. So I decided to base it off uh, my work motto. Sometimes I get, you know, well, you know, who doesn't? But, you know, sometimes you do get stressed out at work, or, or there's just so much work. And then my motto is, this is what I tell people, I click, I get paid, I don't know. You know, what can you do? It's just another day, and... There's no point of getting stressed out, so I came up with this funny motto, and I decided to make a mug out of it. And I only uh, I put it up for sale for five days. There's a link in the description if you're interested, and it's only $9.99 plus shipping. All right, let's get back to the video. So now that we know how similar it is to Windows, now we can proceed into navigating and trying to open up some files that we can potentially edit. So let's go ahead and clear our content that are within our command line. And that's very simple, actually. You just type in clear. This is pretty cool, actually. And now we are back at our starting point. So let's start to moving up in our directory, kind of navigate through. Now we already know that if we type in CD, it's going to change our directory. And I'm going to move one level up. I'm going to type in LS again to see what's inside of it. And then I'm going to look for a random folder that I'm going to pick. And I think I'm going to go to var. I'm going to go to var and see what's inside of that, right? So I'm just going to type in cd var. And uh, now that we are inside of var, I'm going to type in ls again to see what's inside of that. And then, you know what? I think I'm going to go to www folder, right? So I'm just going to type in again change directory, www, right? I'm gonna hit enter. And same thing, I'm just gonna hit ls and see what's inside of that. So we can see there's HTML folder inside of that. Now that we've listed it, let's, so let's navigate into that. Change directory, HTML, that's the name of our folder. And let's see what's inside of that, ls. We can see there's a file in there, an HTML file called index.html. And that's awesome, right? So the way we got to this was actually going one level at a time, one folder at a time. And that's fine if you feel comfortable with that. However, if you know the exact location of index.html, you can simply navigate to it directly without having to go from one directory to another. So let me go back to where we started. I'm just going to type in CD. Here's our starting point. And from here, I'm just going to type in CD, and I'm literally going to spell out what it says here, just like so, including the forward slash here. So I'm going to type in forward slash VAR www.html. Enter, and here we are inside of HTML folder. And if we type in LS, we can see that there's index HTML inside of it. So let's see if there are any hidden folders, you know, in case we're, you know, you, you know, you're looking for something there and you can't see it. We're going to do our dash a command and see if there's anything else in there. We can see there are some other folders inside of this. And if you really wanted to, you can navigate to that, change the directory, dot, dot, that's the name of the folder we have here. Let's see if we can get into that. And all that does is actually just takes us back down a level. So every time you see two dots like that, that's all it does. So I'm gonna leave it at that because I'm trying to make this video very basic and simple. So let's go back to our HTML. HTML folder, LS again. And now let's try to open up our index.html as part of our navigation tutorial. There are a couple of ways of doing, of doing this. And it's kind of similar to what happens when you open things in a notepad. And the reason I say that is because Linux uses a couple of different text editors. And one is called VI. So simply in order to, you know, to open index.html, you can simply just type in vi index.html. So if I hit enter here, it's going to open it up in this editor. 
in order to navigate through it you just use your arrow keys just like so let me uh just like so you can use your arrow keys you can navigate through it right however i don't like to use this editor so i'm going to move on to another one that which i think is much cooler if you happen to be inside of this one to exit it you have to do colon command so if you hold shift and press colon and then type in x it's just going to exit it without making any changes and here we are back at our main screen the one i like to use and i'll show you why is called nano nano editor so if i type in nano nano and type in index.html and i hit enter it actually looks quite a bit different. Let me just move this here for a second. You can see that some things are color coded and you know, looks much nicer. Not only that, we have a list of commands down here handy. I mean, sure, you can always, you know, try to look up commands for VI and you know, this and that. I mean, yeah, of course you can, you know, remember them. But I like Nano because, you know, it gives you a little bit more to work with. At least I don't have to remember everything, you know, especially if you're new. If you don't to even if you don't want to go back and, and look up everything, all the commands for this and that, you can simply just use nano and it'll give you some instructions right down here. So in order to use nano, we have to use our control function. So what we do is basically hit control and hold it. And for example, we can see here that says if you want to go to next page, you do control V. So if we just, if we're already holding control and we're just going to press V, it's going to go to the next page. And if we control V again, it's going to go next page again. And then if we want to go back, we can do control. And then it says here Y. So we're going to press Y. And that, you know, basically will do it. And you can do the same thing when it comes to these, all of these instructions here. Right. And one thing I like also about Nano is you can simply start typing things. So let's go ahead and navigate just a random place. Right, and I'm just going to type in test of the word editor. Right, you can just start typing. Um, in VI, you actually have to execute another command in order to start typing anything. In Nano, you don't have to, you can just start typing. And if you want to save something, and uh, of course I'm you know making it again I'm trying to make this really simple because for this video and if you want to save something we can see there is an exit command right here and it's control X and this is a really cool part about it so if I'm holding control and I hit X you get this window and it's asking you hey do you want to save this or do you want to cancel and it tells you what to press exactly and you don't have to hold anything at this point you just press Y, N, or C if you want to cancel. And in my case, I'm not going to save anything, so I'm just hit no. I'm not going to save anything. And there they are. And there, and there it is, I should say. It's, it's, you know, it just exits and goes back to the main command line where you start and drop that off, right? Well, there you have it, guys. That is the video on simple navigation within Linux. I hope this video convinces you to start using Linux, start learning a little bit of Linux, because it's pretty cool, especially if you want to set up a server that you want to test, like, for example, your website, you know. Matter of fact, it just so happened that we were looking at our index.html, which is your starting page for a website, right? All right, guys, if you like this video, please share it with friends. Also, check out all of my other videos if you're into that type of stuff oh yeah i already showed you this and i have a website a forum website in case you have any questions and of course i'll answer any questions you may have at the bottom of this video if you want to leave them there but i also have a forum if you'd like to go there and uh, participate and lastly i have massive amounts of videos i think i have almost 400 different videos on all kinds of different it stuff so if you want to check that out it's all available at my channel youtube.com forward slash kobu man 
All right, guys, I wish you best of luck with all the things that you're doing in life. And you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kaboomman. In this video I am talking about Microsoft's remote desktop feature um, that is within all versions of Windows except 3.1 and earlier as far as I know. But XP, Windows 7 and Windows 10 will have a remote desktop. So the way you find it is just simply by searching for remote desktop you can just type that in in your search box. So either way, once you find it, you can look it up and see that, you know, this is remote desktop. And if you work in tech support, you already are familiar with it. But then again, you're also familiar with some issues that are related to a remote desktop. And one of them is configuration and the other one is usability. So if you have a remote desktop like this, this is the default. And if you you know, if you want to access another computer, you would simply type in the name of the computer or the IP address and you can remote desktop into it. And for the most part, that is fine, given that the remote computer is allowing remote desktop sessions. So how do we look at that? How do we find whether a computer is even enabled or allowing remote desktop session? Because here's what happens. If I just type in the name of a computer that's on the same network so let's say computer one and we know that's the host name for that computer we're trying to connect to it and we simply select connect and it will try to do it it would try to do it and it would give me this you know error says you cannot do it well that doesn't mean that the computer is not on the network or even part of the same domain which it should be in order for the remote desktop to work properly um, I should say on the same network it doesn't have to be on the same domain but another reason could be is the fact that the remote desktop is disabled so in order to check that we would have to go to that computer and then go then go to computer properties like so so and then from here we would select remote settings on the left hand side once this comes up we can see whether it's enabled or not. And the remote desktop is right down here. Not to be confused with remote assistance, that's something else. So if this is disabled like so, then your computer is not reachable via, via remote desktop, right? So we have to make sure that this is enabled and uh, that would do it. Um, I do like that a pop-up just came up that kind of reminded me that Another reason you wouldn't be able to reach a computer one in our case, or its IP address via, via remote desktop, is that it might be asleep. So what I found is that as long as wake up uh, function is enabled on the computer at the BIOS settings, wake up on LAN, it will allow for that computer to wake up and then you'll be able to remote desktop into it because otherwise it would be just like this you're trying to remote to it everything's set up correctly and you still get this and it wouldn't happen as fast usually because it would try to wake it up and then if you just give it a few seconds actually if you give it a few seconds and try again it's going to actually connect because you woken up the computer by simply pinging it with the remote desktop connection so that's something to keep in mind it's kind of uh, uh, kind of useful it'll save you time instead of trying to figure out what is wrong with it and uh, or just assuming that you can't reach it or you know this and that um, you just kind of keep in mind that you can wake it up with the remote desktop it just happens automatically you just kind of have to give it a few seconds for it to happen so aside from going to bios one way to tell whether a computer is enabled for wake up on lan is to go to computer properties and we're going to go to our device manager and then we're going to go to network adapters and then we're going to find our network adapter in my case it's intel ethernet connection we're going to go to properties 
and then we're going to look for an option that says power management inside of that we can see whether it's enabled or not you can see it says here allow this device to wake the computer so that's how you tell whether it's enabled or not and again this can be checked in bios as well another reason is that if the computer is shut down you cannot turn it on um, that's another reason why you wouldn't be able to reach a remote computer it's not turned on so it's not you cannot turn it on because the remote desktop f from microsoft does not have that function one thing to keep in mind is that through command line you can actually do some functions that could help you when it comes to remote desktop sessions and there are only a couple of things that i'm aware of that you can do and that is to either shut down or restart to computer so in our case shutting down the computer is not useful because we won't be able to wake it up unless we have some other means but we can restart a computer so let's say a user has remained logged on to the computer to the remote computer what will happen is that whenever you initiate you know connection remote desktop connection it would say you know somebody else is logged on and you may not be able to log them off you know but you can tell there you know that they're not here you know it's three in the morning they're not here i need to have access to that computer so what you can do is restart the computer so if you go to command line and just type in shut down this will actually bring a bunch of options that gives you ability to initiate remote desktop uh, restart and that will kick off this remote desktop user it would, it would force him you can do uh, uh, command line as part of the setup that you have to force the remote desktop to restart so if you go to this section of the CMD, you can see some commands. And of course, if you do some basic research on the internet, you can come up with your own version of remote desktop restart where you can force it and it would kick off the person that is using the remote computer. And that way, once it restarts, you can log on to that computer and make changes. Of course, use this at your own discretion because if they remain logged in and they have some unsaved work on that computer, then you may not want to restart it or force it to restart because they will lose that data. So use that at your own discretion. But if your computer systems or computers at your work are scheduled to restart at night and users are aware of that, then there might not be any repercussions of you actually restarting the computer at 3M because that's what happens anyways. Another issue with remote desktop is that, yes, you can save your own credentials. If you, if you expand the options, you can save credentials here so you don't have to type them in each time. But this is only good for you and for your domain login. This is not going to be useful other than that because you cannot use remote desktop while somebody else is logged on to that computer you either are using the remote desktop or using that remote computer yourself or the user is using whoever is sitting at that computer or using that computer so that's a huge huge problem with that so you can't just you know remote desktop initiate remote desktop connection and just take over the existing session that is already in progress with the user so user will not you know be able to show you remotely what is going on while other remote desktop software will allow you to do so so that's a one huge problem when it comes to remote desktop connection of course I am definitely grateful that it does exist because I still use it at work and um, especially if I'm trying to configure multiple computers or uh, access multiple computers at once without uh, you know letting anybody else know what I'm doing on that computer and the computers are available and not being used by the group that is sitting there so for example let's say you work uh, you know after hours if you work after hours, remote desktop connection would be just fine for you because chances are nobody else works 
at that company at you know 2 a.m 3 a.m or whatnot because typical hours are you know eight to five depending on the type of business so if yeah if nobody's using the computer yeah you can certainly do so log in remotely connect to that computer and configure things programs and etc and etc the last thing i wanted to talk about when it comes to remote desktop is related to audio in order to troubleshoot audio on the remote computer so let's say there is a headset or speakers connected to the remote computer you won't be able to troubleshoot it unless you make some changes to the remote desktop session uh, configuration before you actually connect to that remote computer so what you have to do is go to show options go to local resources and then select settings under remote audio select settings and then make sure that you have play on remote computer selected and then select OK. Otherwise, you won't be able to actually see components within Windows that are related directly to the sound controller. Otherwise, you would just say remote audio. So let's let's close this out here. Open our sound settings. By the way, this is a remote desktop that I'm connected to right now. If you look at the playback settings here, it normally shows, you know, real tech. This is the typical what you will see on when it comes to audio controller on a computer. And if you go here, you can see that I don't have, uh, I don't have a microphone connected to that remote computer. So this is everything remote. But if you haven't done uh, or changed those settings that I just showed you, which again, let me show you here real quick. Options, local resources, settings, if you do not select that play on remote computer and save that it would just say remote audio here and if you go to recordings it would be blank so what you're doing is actually just making changes or have the ability to make changes to your own computer and not the remote computer however if you change it to play on remote computer you'll be able to actually see the sound card on the remote computer as well so when it comes to remote desktop it's very limited i again i am glad that it does exist it is useful i'm not going to say it's not useful because it is but it is very limited and compared to a lot of other software remote desktop software available out there it is very lacking very lacking so i would recommend using it if you have nothing else but once you start using some other remote desktop software, you will realize how awesome it is when you can actually take control over user sessions in real time and they can show you what their problem is in real time as if you were there and many, many other things that are done a lot better compared to Microsoft's remote desktop. I hope you guys like this video. Please do share it with friends or family. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I am here for that purpose to help you out no matter where you are in the world. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobulman. This is a continuation of Microsoft Azure platform. We're going to be learning new things today. In the previous video, I've talked about on how to create different virtual machines on the Microsoft Azure platform, how to create them, how to configure them, and how to monitor them for different issues. Amongst other things that I've talked about in the video, it's really good idea to actually look at that and watch that first video in order to get a really good introduction of what Microsoft Azure is. As promised in that video, I'm going to continue with the second video that will be about storage accounts and we're going to create file shares inside of that storage accounts and then we're going to add those file shares into our virtual machines which are going to appear as shared drives. So if you do tech support, you're familiar with shared drives which is something that you would add to the users a computer in order for them to access it for storage. So again, I highly recommend that you watch the previous video as an introduction so that way you can follow along. Of course, I will have a pop-up link right here on the right hand side that you can simply follow and at the end of this video. 
All right, guys, that being said, please take one second to like my video. That really makes a huge difference for me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support on this. All right, guys, let's get into it. And here we are in our home uh, page of Microsoft Azure. From here, we can click storage accounts, but another way to find storage account is to click on the little hamburger icon and just go down and select storage accounts. So let's go ahead and click storage accounts and we're going to create one. You already can see that I already have one and that's related to the fact that you got to have one in order to store your virtual machines or anything else that you create that requires taking up space or storage, right? So of course, we're going to have to have, um, you know, a storage account already. But for this, we're going to create a special one just for file storage. So from here, we're going to click add, and then we're going to create one. And the reason we're creating one is related to billing mostly. So Microsoft wants to know you know, what are you using things for? Just like we created different resource groups for our virtual machines, Microsoft wants us to create a separate group for the storage accounts. So it's kind of related to billing, so that way they know what that is used for, so that way they can bill you for it. Kind of similar to what we had in our virtual machines, the first thing that comes up is to select our subscription. And again, subscription is basically the subscription that we're using for the Microsoft Azure platform, a way to bill you basically, just like you have, for example, Netflix subscription or anything else. So you tell it, okay, I want to use this one. In our case, it's already selected. And then here we're going to select resource group. As I mentioned in the previous video, every time you create a resource group, which is what we've done in the previous video, you want to make sure that everything else that you want it to be connected to that, you want to make sure you select the same one. And in the previous video, we created a group called Azure Tutorial. So we're going to select that. And just to kind of quickly overview why we're doing this, when you make sure that you are selecting the same resource group, you also make sure at the same time that you're putting everything on the same network. So with this way, it's going to make sure that the, you know, the, uh, that the network connections between all those virtual machines and the storage is also working in the sense that they are on the same network. It's going to reduce the fact that you may need to configure different security settings, this and that. It kind of puts it in the same network. You will have connections to it, and that way you are good to go, especially when you create later on a sync uh, storage, which basically what it does, it creates a backup of the storage that you're uh, creating. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you got to make sure that it is in the same resource group. And in our sense, we're kind of concerned about the same network so that there is connectivity. All right, we're good there. And now below, we can select a storage account name. We can type it in. We're just going to call, call it um, new storage. And it doesn't like the caps, so we're just going to use lower letters. New storage is already taken. We're going to call it new storage one. All right, we're going to we're going to name it something specific. I'm going to call it Azure Storage. Let's see if it likes that tutorial. Is already taken. All right. Well, let's just leave it that Azure Storage Tut. We're going to leave it at that. So, uh, yeah, it's very picky, and uh, which is pretty common. So that's good. So the next thing we're looking at is performance. It kind of depends on what you're looking at. If you want the standard performance, you can leave it at that. If you want the premium, you can certainly select that as well, depending on your business needs. But we're just going to keep it standard for the purpose of the tutorial. And that's going to be fine. And then we can click next here so you can see the networking. But if you just leave it at default, it should work fine. It says here, public endpoint, all networks. All networks, meaning that all the network that you've created, um, you can leave it at that. And then if we click next advanced, you got different things that you can adjust. But as I've mentioned in my previous videos, I like to keep things simple so that way it's easier to follow. So we're just going to cl simply click review and create. 
All right, now it just says it that deployment is complete. We can certainly click on go to resources and go to it right away. But what I want to do actually real quick is make sure that at least one of my one of my virtual machines is turned on so that we after we configure our file share, we can go inside of it and use PowerShell to add that um, add access to the share that we create. So I'm going to click on the you know the little hamburger icon. I'm going to go down to my virtual machines and I'm going to make sure that at least one of them is running and looks like my Windows Server 2009 is uh, 2019 is running which is good we're going to access that in a little bit here all right I'm gonna go home here and as you noticed in our home page it gives you access to the most recent things that you've worked on and here is our Azure storage uh, tutorial account we're going to click on that so from here, we're going to click on file shares. I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about anything else that, that it isn't a topic of this video. If you have special requests, please let me know. So we're going to simply click on file shares because that's what we're creating. I'm going to click a little file share button here. And on the right hand side, we're going to, it's going to ask us for a name. So we're going to type in file share drive. And then right below it, it's super simple. I really like this. It gives you the ability to add the quota. So the size of the file share. So we're just going to make it 10 gigabytes. All right. We're going to go down here. I'm going to click create. And something very cool happens once you create it. Uh, it it's very simple. It just kind of allocates you know, shared space. It's going to be super fast and it's already done. So we're going to click on that and see what's inside of that. So all right, so with our file share drive selected, what we're going to do here is add a directory. So that way there's something in there. We're going to call it uh, user storage storage. I'm going to click OK. So it's going to create just a folder called user storage. So that way, once we go in there, we're going to be able to see it once we connect to it. And we're going to click connect. We're going to pick our J drive here so that we know it comes up. Then we're going to click copy the clipboard. We're going to back to our Windows server. We have PowerShell open and we have File Explorer open. You can see that there is no shared drive named J inside of it. So we're going to paste our script in there and this is going to add, once it connects to it, it's going to add our J drive into it. So just kind of bear with me here in a moment uh, the virtual machine is kind of running slow i'm not sure what's going on but it will add it there eventually so once it's done i will show you that it did it all right so you saw that it was uh, waiting for response waiting for connection and then verified the credentials and then you can see that it added that uh, j file share drive into here and then it came up in our file explorer right here and it says see, you can see that it says here 10 gigabytes and if we go inside of it, we should be able to see that directory that we created. And from here, we can literally just put anything we want that we can create. I don't know. Let's create a document. Test. Doc. All right. And then once we get out of it, in order to do this administration of it, if we go inside of user directory, we can see that test document that it came up. So as one of the last things I kind of wanted to show you that is really cool about these storage accounts is that you can actually monitor them just like those virtual machines that I showed you before. So let's go on back to it. And then if you scroll down, we selected that our Azure storage toot here. If you scroll down, you can, you know, monitor the uh, its usage. So you can, just like with the virtual machines, you can monitor different usage and access at specific times and periods. All right. So, why am I teaching you this? Uh, well, obviously, so you can learn how to use it and how to administer Azure storage accounts. But there is another reason for implementing this type of shared drive is that, you know, you can simply take that script if you want people to connect to it. And um, you can create that script. You can pass it on to people manually or... You can create the script and set it up in Active Directory for a pers for a certain group of people um, that work. For example, let's say you're in a business environment. There are five different groups. So let's say there is collections department. Let's say there is accounting department. Let's say there is a 
uh, I don't know, some kind of a tech department, and they all are going to be in different groups in Active Directory. Well, you can set up a script, what they call a post logon script, that will add these type of shared drives to them automatically upon login. So you can use this script, you can implement it within Active Directory to run it for that specific group or even specific user if you want. But let's stick to the group. So let's say you want all you know, collections departments to have access to the specific storage that you've just created. So the way you would add it into Active Directory, you would set up the script. It's very simple. And um, every time they log in, it's going to run that script and make sure that they have that drive added. I mean, you can certainly you can specify it in different ways. You don't have to use this specific script, but this is an option, and um, it would just happen. They would get this storage attached. They don't have to worry about trying to add it, the network drive or the share drive themselves. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Uh, again, if you want to check out my intro, I highly recommend that. Thank you so much for watching. Please take a moment to like, share, and leave any comments that you may have. Thank you for watching, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends, to another video. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's topic is about email formatting, and it's incredibly important to learn this when you're communicating issues to a third party that has access to a certain system that you do not. The reason that is important is because if you don't provide the correct information right away, the issue is just going to take longer to resolve. And this is production impacting and this looks bad. So what are some of the things that we need to include in our communication with other parties? We will go over here in a, in a second. But let me just tell you that I kind of got this idea from a previous video when I talked about ping command and a situation in which you may have to contact somebody else that's outside of your company or somebody that's within your company, but you don't have direct access to that system and now you have to reach out to somebody else that you do not know. So if you want to check out that video, there will be a link right here. And also this idea for these videos uh, came from my website, which is CosmicNovo.com. And the article name is Top 20 Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. All right, guys, that is that that is all for the introduction of this video. Now let's get to the important part of this video, and that is communication. This is incredibly important to pull off perfectly the first time that you are communicating something to somebody. So that way the issue can get resolved really fast and then you look good not just you, but you, your group also, and your manager, and then, you know, this could potentially get you a raise. Anytime you do a good job and make sure that you're professional about it, it always gives you a chance to get a raise. All right, so let's have it in a situation where the website is down. So let's pretend that my website is down, CosmicNova.com, and now people can't access it, but they need to use it for everyday use. Let's just pretend that. So what do you do? You don't have access to CosmicNovo.com. So now you have to contact the tech support or the webmaster at CosmicNovo.com. So the first thing we need to find is obviously their email. We need to have their contact. And once we find that, we come into a situation where we have to contact them. So if you can't reach them by the phone or that you do reach them by the phone and suddenly they're like, okay, well, we need more information. Well, the best way to communicate that is via email in this format. So let's pretend that their email address is third party support contact at cosmicnovo.com, which is by the way fictional email address. It doesn't exist. So don't don't send the emails to that. <laughs> Anyways, let's pretend that this is the contact email. So the next thing we need to uh, add on there is the subject line, of course. However, make sure you CC your manager or any other team members that you work with, so that way know that they know that you are communicating this information through this company, through this support, and of course that they know that you are working. This kind of tells them, okay, I'm going to add my manager at Kobuman. 
ah, koboman.com. So that way he knows that I'm also working on this. You know what I mean? You want to tell him that you're working. This is job security for you. You know what I mean? This is one of those things that people never really talk about. You know, if we want job security. It's incredibly important too. It's just as it's important to resolve this issue in a timely manner. So there's no production impact. I want to also make sure that my job is secure as well. Why not take credit for something that I'm doing? You know, very simple to understand. And the next thing is subject line. Also incredibly important. The uh, reason you want a good subject line is so that it gets attention to the of the person or the team that you're contacting right away. So can you imagine people getting hundreds of emails a day and they see so many emails a day that all of them just kind of look the same. So they are like, oh, okay, this is another FYI email. This is another email that's just like everybody gets this and that. Well, we want a good subject line that catches their eyes. So we're going to say cosmic novo.com is down so now whenever this email pops up in their inbox they're like oh that looks important so they're gonna grab that and they're gonna be like okay this is something important i need to fix this right away which is great simple enough we want the subject line to be incredibly important and eye-catching eye-catching because this is a big issue anyways if you've never contacted these people before, you want to have a good professional introduction. And regardless to whether I've contacted this person before or this group before, I always do, I always do this. I always uh, have a professional introduction regardless. Because I don't know, just because I talked to Bob at third-party support contact, just because I talked to Bob last time, doesn't mean that Bob is going to work on this email. Maybe Joe is going to work on this email next time. So I'm always going to have the same introduction. And it's very simple. I'm just going to say, hello. And I'm going to say, my name is Irvin with PC support at, and then you specify this location. You know, city, state, uh, country. If you do tech support outside of country for somebody else, you know, that's fine too. You just want to kind of specify who you are, where you at, and why you would want to contact them, you know? And then you can, you know, fill this in, fill in the blank basically in this part of it. So the next line we want is an important line as well. We want to say, we have received a report that cosmicnovo.com is either not working down or whatever the issue is for all users so if this is extreme case scenario where the whole website is down it's not just like part of the website this the whole website is down so we want to specify all users now let's go back to the we part the reason you want to say we is because this implies that you work as part of a team and then more than one person as in you is aware of this issue so yes i said my name is Irvin with pc support at this location so that's just me i am working on this that's all that means however we as in team that i work for have received a report that means it makes it more urgent so the reason i'm the way i'm looking at it right now is from a psychological point of view to um, encourage urgency and as you see here, this kind of a theme started from the top here from the subject line. This is incredibly important. You're a professional. However, there's a sense of urgency in a very professional manner. And you're right to the point. There is no, you know, there's no beating around the bush, as they say. So this is incredibly important to have. And this is how I format my emails every time I contact somebody that is, uh, that is a third party and they I, and I need their assistance. So let's go further down. What are some of the things we need before uh, we send this email? Well, we need a lot of information. This is what they typically ask. How many users? So now you don't type this in in the email, but this is what they would ask. So you you wouldn't type this in, but you would say as an answer to this question, you would say 
all users. So you can kind of use this as a template. Again, make sure you don't have the actual question there. So now the question that they would ask is how many users? And you say all users. Boom. All users are affected by this issue. Okay. And I do know that I've stated this earlier as well, but we're just going down the line in case it just kind of going down the line of the things that they would normally ask about. And they would say, what is the link used? So, you know, this is definitely important. Um, in this case is a website. So we would just type in cosmicnovo.com. Now you want, you can be specific. You can type in HTTP forward slash forward slash cosmic nova.com however it's https so this is another thing we need to provide as well now we're going to remove the question itself now we have is the link they use as in users they now, of course, if this is like some kind of a application or a software issue, you know, they may not la they may not ask for the link, you know, obviously, because it's not a website. If it's something else that they might ask, which, for example, which version of the software are you using, right? They can ask that. And then you can simply reply we use version for example 7.5.9 of this software right so that's in case it's some kind of a software issue but we're going to go back to our situational uh, thing where the website is down so i'm going to remove this so it doesn't confuse you so now we are back at this situation where just the website is down but the other thing was just in case it was an app issue, application issue, if you will. So the next thing they might ask is, when did this issue start? This is what they would ask. And the reason they would ask this is so they can look at the log files on their end. They can look at the log files and kind of help them narrow down what the issue is much quicker so think about this the website goes down let's say at 8 a.m so this is what i'm going to type in the issue was reported at 8 a.m and then you might want to specify time zone so i'm just going to put down eastern time for an example and then since we have that information i'm going to remove the question of it as part of our template and then we're going to just say it happened at 8 a.m eastern time so now they can go in and look at the logs from 8 a.m eastern time and then see what happened and it will help them resolve this issue much quicker when they have more information think about it it's kind of similar to whenever you do you know just regular pc support a you know you know, user reports that there's something wrong with their computer and they're very vague about it. Well, you need more information to resolve it. Just the same as the webmaster or the third party contact for this cosmicnovo.com will also need that information as well. So these are some of the very basic things that are a must when it comes to reporting an issue like this. We have three different things that they can look at. We can say that everybody's affected. We can see that this is the link. We can tell them this is the link that they use and they can see, oh, okay, well, that's a correct link, right? So it's not a, a, an issue where it's a, just a wrong link because that happens sometimes. They have to ask this type of stuff. And then we know that the issue was reported at 8 a.m. That's when the issue started. Now they can look at the log files. So what else can they ask? Well, they can ask a bunch of different things, but this might be something that in, comes up in a follow-up email 
For example, can you provide example IP addresses where, I'm sorry, of the PCs that use this website? So this is what they might say in a reply, you know, but we want to wait for them to actually ask this because if, if it's an issue where they can't, when it becomes more complicated, they can't figure out why it doesn't work because they, they might, might say simply, well, it works from our end, but it doesn't work from your end. So this could imply that there is some kind of a firewall issue that something happened on the firewall or a proxy for your business. And so for some reason, you can't reach CosmicNova.com. They may reply with this and say, can you provide the example IP addresses of the PCs that use this website? So that way, from their end, they can see if they can reach these, these computers and then see if it's a firewall issue or not. They may also reply and say, can you provide user or users to test with via remote desktop. So the reason they would want this is obviously so they can test the changes that they have or kind of have a look at this issue from a user point of view. Now you might want to be careful with this if it's a you know outside of company, but if it's within the company, this is perfectly fine. But if it's outside of company, then this would be a security breach. So you don't want to, you know, let you know third party support contact named Bob from CosmicNova.com access your company system. I mean, you know, it's up to you, but technically it's a security breach. So but if it's a, if it's a, somebody that works within your company that supports this website, then yeah, that's perfectly fine. They work for your company. It should be perfectly fine, you know. But they might ask for that. But typically in this situation, they would resolve the issue on their end unless it's a firewall type of uh, situation, in which case they may start to reach out to, you know, whoever the, uh, you know, whoever controls that network whoever has access to the domain controller, whoever has access to the proxy, because it could be just a proxy issue too. We don't know. It could be that one of the load balancers on the proxy is down and they need to fix it so that it can provide proper routing and proper access to the external websites for, in this example, cosmicnovo.com. And then of course, let me, finish up our initial email you can just say thank you and then you can just sign off you know type in your name and then i don't know your signature might have more contact like you know your email at you know whatever it is and you know phone number for example i don't know you know zero 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 <laughs> and your title, of course, you know, you guys know how to set, you know, set up your uh, signature. And here I'm going to type in my signature, business systems analyst. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's an example of, of, of uh, my signature uh, that I use in my email, of course, with the real information, this is all fake information. But that's how you guys do it. You know, at this point, you just kind of wait for them to reply, to contact you, they might call you, they might reply, they might send you a message over the instant messenger. Who knows, but this is an example of how you would format the email and the information that you might want to provide to the support for this type of business. I hope you find this video educational and helpful. I uh, will be making more videos like this. I do, you know, YouTube as like a more of a hobby than anything else. So I don't release videos too often. But when I do, um, you know, if you want to see the notification, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. But 
I do try to release at least four videos a month, at least one one a week, um, whenever uh, I have free time. As as you know here, I work as business systems analyst on my main job, but I do enjoy a lot to make these type of videos for you guys. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Please share with friends. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a practical way of troubleshooting somebody's computer remotely without using remote desktop software. So there is not going to be any RDP action. There's not going to be any third party software that we're going to use to resolve this issue at all. We're going to use things that are at our disposal that we can do to potentially fix the problem. So this will be really good for somebody who does help desk or desktop support or even tech support at, for example, a local office or a branch. And if you got one second, please click on the like button. I really appreciate it. I promise you this is going to be a great video and I always appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Daimware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description, it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name so that way we can try to help you out but of course be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working I can help you but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is so we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it However, first thing first thing first, we got to assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me? what your PC name is. So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So we can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here is just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Kobuman 1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is Kobuman 1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. So the way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace or backslash backslash type in Kobuman one. 
and then another backslash and then we're going to access his C share drive which is should be enabled by default for your business it may not be but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment it should let you in you may get a pop-up asking you to log in and that's fine to just use your credentials and if you have access that's great so once we're inside of C right now we're connected to his PC over there you can see that it's on the network connection right here and then the name of his computer is Kobuman one and we're inside of his C drive we're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer so he's using a program right he's using a program and we know it's not working and then we're gonna ask him which program is it right and then of course since we don't have remote desktop we can't initiate the repair normally you can just repair the program and a lot of times that would fix it you know uninstall it reinstall it and whatnot but if you don't have that option or user doesn't you know have the admin privileges to do it either and again you don't have a remote desktop of any type of software we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile because in this case if we go back here it says nothing happens when he runs the program so what do you suspect suspect I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a catch uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides so we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile we're going to ask him what is your local profile name and then he's going to tell you what his local profile name which is going to be the same thing as his login so we're going to pretend that his login is buco we're going to go inside of that and typically typically configuration data for any type of program that's run there on that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder so we're going to click on app data and then a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming so let's have let's go into local folder and see what happens so let's say he has problems with adobe we can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch we can simply rename this folder into adobe old for example and as long as his program is not open it's going to let us rename it like that and this is okay and uh, because once he launches adobe it's going to create a new version of the same folder and just to kind of show you what's inside we're going to go inside of this and you can see that if you kind of browse through you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times uh, you know I, I pick this randomly but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that but since it's at the local profile level it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh, as, as in program that it needs to function it's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile and the same thing happens with anything else for example there's Google here you know if you go inside a Google here folder uh, and if you go you can see that it's a Chrome and if you go inside of that you can see there's user data again this is what I talked about and if you for example go to default you can see that there is a cache data inside of it and of course you can find things like uh, I don't know their uh, favorites and stuff like that which is by the way missing on this one uh, but that's okay so let's stay on track here since we messed with Adobe I'm going to tell him go ahead and Ado uh, try to open Adobe again so let's go back to the user's computer all right so we're back at the user's computer we don't need this window anymore actually I'm just going to yeah let's close it we're going to close it and then we're going to you know I'm, I'm, so in this at this point I'm telling him okay go ahead and open Adobe so he's going to type in Adobe and then we're going to click Adobe Reader we can see that Adobe Reader works fine and let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view we are now back at you know our point of view as a technician and we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe and like I stated so that created new and you can see that here that the date is 6 10 2020 at 1 p.m and if you look at the time here it's 101 p.m so that means it created just like I said it would and what that does it basically resets that program and a lot of times it actually resolves the issue all right now 
just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings that's a not, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop as long as you have the proper credentials to do so so on your computer on your own computer that you're using your work computer you're going to open up a registry editor and you have to run it as administrator so remember how computer name for this gentleman was Cobbleman one here and let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function some kind of key to make it work we can do that remotely as well so we're going to take Cobbleman one which is the name of his computer and we're going to connect to it over the network registry so we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network we're going to click network we're going to put in Cobbleman one we're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network and it usually takes a little bit it depends you know on, on the setup but you can see that it found it and it's located on this work group but a lot of times it would just be a domain name it says new server zero that's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home but it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain it will be the main name first followed by the computer name so that means it found it when it's underlined like that it means it found it we can click OK and we are now directly connected into his registry so let's go ahead and kind of navigate see if we can find that Adobe we're going to expand H key local machine you know it's a local machine on his computer we, we are now connected to it we're going to expand H key local machine and guess the next thing we're going to do we're going to use some logic here guys and we're going to just go to software we're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software now there are a couple of different places that it might be depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software but you can see right away that Adobe shows up here so if you expand that you can see that this is actually for Premiere Pro and After Effects so that's not what we're actually worked on we actually worked on Adobe uh, DC or Adobe Reader DC so if we scroll down and expand wow 6432 node which indicates that it's a 32-bit software uh, we can now look for Adobe here and expand that and we can now see that there is Adobe Reader there right there and then if we expand that there's DC and inside of that we can you know whatever we need to make changes to we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did. In which case we did, uh, um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it. And then we're going to mark it resolved, completed. And that's that. That ticket, oops. I think it should be now gone out of our system and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket all right let's click on this ticket this ticket is called I am missing internet shortcuts folder and then if you look in the descriptions we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop so in this case there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know it was with deleted or just simply gone who knows maybe it was moved somewhere that happens sometimes too user would just accidentally you know for example they would like if you look at over here they would drag it somewhere and it would go god knows where you know so typically you would say hey can you check your recycle bin go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there you know this and that and yeah definitely do all of that stuff but if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of you know let's say you can't find it and then but you can find a copy of you can ask them hey does anybody else have a copy of it maybe I can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts we can certainly do that again we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further but we're going to role play and then first thing of course we're going to do assign our ticket assign a ticket to ourselves and then we're going to reply to customer hello 
this is Irvin with US, or you can say tech support, doesn't matter. You know, let's, let's do tech support with tech support, or you know, you can say help desk, you know, whatever your situation might be. Can you please provide your PC name so that I can restore your folder? Thank you. Thanks, you. <laughs> Thanks, Erwin. Okay. So now user has been asked, or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user, and we, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kabuman. So we're going to keep doing that. The PC, let's do this, users. PC name is Kobolman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that, uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is but what if for some reason just using a pc name doesn't work some, there might be an issue with dns so just type in in kobolman1 and you know go inside of that you know shared drive or shared network connection i should say what if that doesn't work then we're going to have to get an ip address and see how that goes so you can ask them too hey what is your ip address and if they're like uh i don't know uh, you can just ask them okay well can you go command line this and that but that's too complicated so let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the ip address without any confusion but but let's see what else we can do you know before we do that let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user because we don't we don't want to do that we just want to find that out on our own all right let's go back to our own computer all right so let's say this this wasn't successful and this didn't work and for some reason we can't access it using you know Kobolman one like so Let's say that doesn't work. Let's say we're not able, we get an error, or it just doesn't, you know, it just says not found. Then we're going to find the, in, uh, their IP address and see if that works. So, of course, the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping. We're going to do a quick pingage. You're going to type in ping kobolman1. And here's our result. And guess what it is? It's an IP version 6. <laughs> it's an IP version 6. I, uh, if we do this, it's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen because this uh, systems are not set up to, you know, what I call backdooring into a computer. Some people may disagree, but this is what I call backdooring into a computer. You can just type in and usually instead of just a, you know, PC name, you just type in the IP address and same deal. Let's see if we can get that C share. Yeah, it's not going to work. So now we need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way, but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version four of this IP version six uh, IP address. So this is IP version six that we're looking at here, but we wanna know what the standard is, what the standard IP version four is. So let's go back to the user's computer. You can say, hello, sir, can you please tell me what your IP address is? And you can just tell them, uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in, I don't know, there are a couple of ways of getting to it. I'm just going to tell them to type in network. And then first thing that comes up is network status. And I'm just going to tell them, uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties. And then if we scroll down, it gives you a bunch of different information. Now here's our IP version 6. Remember, this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier. And 
it didn't work. But luckily, we do have equivalent IP version 4, which is right here, and that is 192.168.1.102. All right, let's go back to our computer. All right, now let's try that. So we're going to backslash backslash 192, and you can see that I accessed it before. So 192.168.1.102, and then C dollar sign. Enter, and there it is. Same thing uh, that we can do with, uh, what you call it, same thing we can do with the registry. We can connect to using the IP address. But let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick. We're going to go and copy the Internet Shortcuts folder back into their desktop. And now that we are back at user's computer, now we can see that Internet Shortcut has appeared. Now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing, regedit. And then we're going to use that connect network registry. Let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way. 192.168.1.102. Okay. And again, it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on. And now it's actually asking me for login ID. So I'm going to use, typically you can use your domain login but since I'm not on a domain, I'm just going to use a local admin, uh, a local admin ID and password. And there it is. We're back at the same thing, except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it, guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home, so they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish our my ticket here, you know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right that's that guys i hope you like this video please share it with friends let me know if you have any questions just want to say hi i like the, making these videos and again i appreciate you guys liking the videos they are um, th that what you do really, really motivates me so much, so much. All right. You guys stay safe, take care, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. Today's video is all about the virtual machines. I'm going to explain what the virtual machines are, how they function, how they're set up, and how you can install them to play around with different operating systems for yourself. In this case, we're going to use Microsoft's Hyper-V software that comes with Windows Operating System. It doesn't come installed by default, but you can install it as part of Microsoft Operating System. And I will show you how to do that. It's pretty simple. However, I believe it only comes with Microsoft Windows 10 Professional and or Enterprise. I don't think it comes with Home, but it will show you how to install it nonetheless. It's pretty simple, but it's also really fun, especially if you want to experiment with different operating system and like to learn about them. Really cool stuff. All right, guys, if you got one second, please click the like button. It only takes one second, and it really makes a big difference for me, especially if you appreciate this type of content. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, first thing first, here is our computer that we're remoted in that we're going to use for our virtual machines. And uh, we got to install Hyper-V because in this video, we're going to talk about Hyper-V. We're going to uh, install this program, which will allow us to run these virtual machines. So that way we can play around with them. The way you install Hyper-V in Windows operating system is if you go to your apps and features, and then you go here into programs and features. This is the old school of add, remove, or uninstall programs that you will uh, normally see in like older operating systems like Windows 7. And what we are looking for is actually turn Windows features on 
are off. Remember how I said it's actually part of Windows operating system? This is exactly what I meant. So it's very simple. From here on, you have to make sure that Hyper-V right here is selected like so. And then once you click OK, it's going to download it, install it, and it's going to reboot your computer. The reason it's going to reboot your computer anytime you install a virtual uh, virtual machine software is because it has to use your hardware as an extension in order to work. So, for example, things like network adapters, uh, you know, CPU, RAM, a video card memory, and all that type of stuff. So it has to do a quick reboot so that way it knows how to create an extension of those into those virtual machines. Because we're making a virtual PC and it has to have some kind of hardware associated with that to work. Okay, once you do that, we're going to open up Hyper-V. This is how it looks like for me right now, but this is how it's going to look like for you the first time you open. This is exactly how it's going to look like. There's not going to be anything installed on it or anything like that. Okay, so what you see here under the Hyper-V manager is name Koboman1. So what is this Koboman1? Well, that's my computer. That's my physical computer, and that's the name of my computer that I'm using right now. So you can tell also by where it says here that I am remotely desktop into a Kobuman 1 computer. And just to kind of show you one, one example, one other example here is that in Windows properties and computer properties, you can see that the computer name here is Kobuman 1. So what that is, if I click on it, it's my computer. This software is literally using my physical computer, my actual hardware as an extension to create these virtual machines. So again, once you install Hyper-V or even, for example, Oracle VirtualBox, which is also pretty good software, it's going to, again, reboot your computer because it's going to use your computer as an extension to run these virtual machines. So all these virtual machines are part of your physical machine. It's just they're creating these extensions to use in order to function as if it's its own thing, you know? And it is. Virtually speaking, it's its own thing. This is why you can have a server somewhere in a data center. For Imagine a rack server. I'm going to put a picture of it right now. This is kind of looks like these these servers are just on racks in big data centers somewhere in some building where AC is running really cold to keep him cool. And these servers can have many, many different virtual machines on them. And that's the whole point of creating a virtual machine is that, for example, you can have 10 different websites. You can have 10 different web servers, for example, running on a single server. And that's the great thing about virtual machines. If you have enough RAM, if you have enough processing power, you can run as many virtual machines as possible. So instead of just having one computer that's not using all of its resources, now you can have multiple virtual computers on that one computer or a server. So let me just kind of show you here just a brief example of what, kind of, what I kind of mean here. You can see that, that I have a CPU here and this CPU has eight processing threads, it says eight logical processors right here. And it's an i7, and this is why it has this. This is an older i7, but it's still a pretty good processor. But it has eight logical processors. On these eight logical, you can potentially run four different instances of virtual machines because you can literally split those into two for each. So two times four is eight. You can have four different virtual machines running off of this one single CPU as long as they're not super intensive. And of course, you got to have enough RAM. And you can see here that I have um, a total of 16 gigabytes of RAM. And then you can split that RAM amongst those servers, you know. In a real realistic scenario, since this is not a server computer, in this case, if I wanted to have really good, two really good virtual machines, I would just run two to three maybe, because you can see that the system itself is using up quite a bit of RAM just to kind of function, you know what I mean? And that's, you know, but if I added more RAM, I can, of course, even make that even greater. So that explains the hardware part of it, of how virtual machines are created on actual hardware. So it creates those mini copies of themselves, if you will. They are not as good, but they're good enough to do certain things. Again, it, you know, I used an example of a web servers, which is very typical to see if you if you uh, if you're familiar with the cloud 
cloud storage and cloud computing. This is that's all they are. They're all virtual machines running off of different servers and different hardware platforms. But when it comes to setup, is something we're going to talk about right now. All right, so when you initially start this, it's gonna be blank here. There'll be no virtual machines, but you can click Create New. So we're going to click Quick Create New. Once this loads up, you can see that it actually offers you some you know, typical stuff you can install on a virtual machine. This is just the kind of a thing that you can just literally click Create Virtual Machine. It's going to create it, and it's going to be these specific ones. It's What it's gonna do is basically download these um, ISO images, uh, you know, operating system images, and they're going to install them for you. And that's fine. If you want to try these and you don't want to really install anything else, you can certainly do that. But I want to show you that you can actually do it also by using your own image. So we're going to click local install source, and then we're going to specify different things. The first two we're going to install is Windows 10 and then Windows the server 2019 so we're going to just kind of make sure that this is still checked here that what it says this virtual machine will run windows enable windows secure boot that's fine you can leave that like that and then we're going to click change installation source and now we're going to tell it to go to our desktop which is where our virtual machines are you can see right here we're going to select this one here so we're going to select that one so we're going to do windows 10 real quick and we're going to click create virtual machine so what this is doing is just kind of give you an option that says hey virtual machine already created you know it's already done and but that was really like quick it yeah sure enough it created a virtual machine virtual computer but we haven't installed anything yet it just created some basic settings and we can click connect and it's going to keep those basic settings for the hard drive for you know how much ram is being used you know everything else but we kind of want to learn more about this. So we're going to click edit settings instead of connect. We're going to click edit settings so we can see what's all in there. What kind of, can we make any changes? Well, we certainly can. Here it is. This is our hardware which says hardware. So if we click here on the firmware, it kind of gives you an idea of what is selected for our drive and for our network adapter. And that's kind of a kind of main things right now that we're looking at here. We can tell that we already selected the Windows ISO image and that's fine. It's inserted in virtual DVD drive and we can see that it created a new virtual machine hard drive. And we'll look at that as well. And it created also a network adapter, which is using a default switch, basically an extension of our network adapter that we're already using. Moving down, if we click on security, we can see that the secure boot is enabled. And then we can just kind of leave it here if you're using Microsoft Windows. That's fine. Uh, these are just some of the basics we're going to talk about. I don't want to talk about super in detail because this is just video on virtual machines. If we click on memory here, we can see that it specified two gigabytes of RAM, which is fine. That's that's what I would do with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Maybe add a little bit more depending on what I'm doing with the virtual machine. But for now, two gigabytes is fine. And then we're going to go click on the processors here. And we can see that we have number of virtual processors selected as four. We can adjust this to whatever we want. We can even do one if we really wanted to. But so so it installs faster on a computer. We're just going to leave it at three i'm going to leave it at three so that way i have at least uh you know uh, after i do two uh, virtual machines i'll have two processors running just for the base of my machine so that way i don't use all eight uh, processing threads so i'm going to change it to three and then let's see here i'm going to click apply here just in case you can you can change the resource percentages this and that and that's something advanced you can kind of fiddle with but i wanted to show you some main stuff if we click on the hard drive you can see that it's using a virtual scuzzy controller it really doesn't matter um, the virtual hard disk that it's using here there are different options of virtual hard disk you can create uh, if we click on edit we can create our own virtual disk and you know, it really doesn't matter. I really haven't found that there makes any difference when it comes to performance or not because it's all virtual anyways. So there might be certain situations where you might want to look into this, but this is not the video about that. And then the other thing we can look at, I mean, we can look at the DVD drive. I already said it's it's the DVD drive, virtual DVD drive that has Windows operating system inserted in it. And then we can look at the network adapter and it's using a default a switch, which, you know, you can disable it if you want but that's pretty much what it is to it. I don't want to talk about anything else because it's going to kind of take away from the point of this video. 
All right, so this is how your hardware looks like. We're set to install our virtual machine, and that's what we're going to do for our other machines that we, we create. All right, I'm going to click Connect. Where it says here the virtual machine is turned off, we can just click Start. So what it's now doing is basically post. You know, it's going to say, hey, do you want to <laughs> boot? Uh, see, I missed it. See, now it's trying to boot over PXE, over the network. But right, what it was doing here, actually, was trying to boot from the CD that we've inserted. So where is that? Where can we actually remove that? Because you don't want to keep this in there all the time once you install the computer. Otherwise, it's going to come up all the time. It's actually right here. So what I'm going to do is pause the machine. I clicked pause there. And I'm going to look at the DVD drive here. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn it on. And we have to look at the DVD drive here. And then we can see here that we can eject that Windows ISO. So you want to do that after you install the operating system, just like normally you would do. You don't want to boot from it all the time and try to install it. So uh, this is how we did it earlier. We can just simply click Insert Disk. Now we're going to go back to our desktop. We're going to specify our Windows again. And once we finish installing it, we're going to remove it. We're going to eject it, just like you would in a regular PC. So what I'm going to do here is actually reset the machine. So that way we get a chance to actually hit any key here. I'm going to click Reset, and I'm going to hit any key. And here it is. It's going to start our Hyper-V virtual PC and the virtual machine. And here it is. Here's our Windows operating Windows operating system install. And from here, you know, you can just install operating system, click install. It's just like you would normally do with any time you install Windows 10. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, turn this off and uh, or switch our ISO. We're going to switch to a different ISO, we're going to eject this one, and then we're going to install, insert different disk, and we're going to select this one, which is the uh, Windows Server 2019. I'm going to reset it, and I'm going to hit any key, and see how this one looks a little bit different. It's going to start our Server 2019 operating system install. And then again, you just got to go through the motion, install Windows Server 2019, and then you'll have a virtual PC running. And I already have that installed, and I'll show you how that's running. So this is why I'm going to cancel this. I'm going to select, I'm going to eject this one. I'm going to insert our Linux one. And here's a Linux Mint. I just picked a random one. So I got to be honest, I tried to install Linux Mint on there. And it didn't work because it's corrupted. My ISO is corrupted. You can see here that it's only 354 megabytes. I don't know why it showed up as completed or downloaded like that, but it's supposed to be around 2 gigabytes. I'm almost done um, downloading a slightly different version of, of uh, Mint, so we're going to try that in, um, in this situation here. I'm going to move it to desktop. Not that it really matters, but anyways, let's try this again. We're going to create a we'll do a quick create. And, uh, and this time we're going to click local installation source as well. And I'm going to uncheck this because it's not Windows. So I'm going to uncheck secure boot. I'm going to change installation source. I'm going to go back to our desktop and we're going to select Linux Mint, which is Mate version rather than Cinnamon. Either way, I just wanted to see, uh, I wanted to show you how, you how you can install this. How you can, you know, install, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Linux distribution on this and just you know, it's really good for learning. All right, let's go quick overview. My main thing to kind of check is to make sure I have at least two gigs of RAM and then processors, I'm going to back change down back to three uh, just to kind of, you know, keep it like that. And yeah, everything looks fine. So I'm going to click connect. And just to kind of show you here, this is what, what I would have done earlier. I'm going to eject this, go back here, just like I did with the previous one, insert disk, and then again, you know, check or select the Linux version. So now it's going to run just fine. We're going to launch this bad boy and I'm going to start installing Linux. I'm going to hit enter here. You can see that it's just going to install it as we are just kind of looking at it. And um, I wanted to show you the running virtual machines. I'm thinking, should I just kind of minimize this, let it, let it do its thing? Okay, let's try this one here. I'm going to run it just to show you a running virtual machine. This is either Windows 10 or Windows Server 2019. Either should work, connect. And it kind of asks, and 
Let me log into this. If I can remember my password. But you can see it's just Windows operating system. And this is Windows Server 2019. Well, see, you can see this one is actually really responsive, which is good. And that uh, goes to show that you can run these type of machines and be pretty useful, pretty, pretty fast. You see, whatever I'm clicking on, it's no problem whatsoever. I went full screen on this. Everything is responsive. Everything's fine. I don't know, control panel, file explorer. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It works pretty good. And let me see if I can just do... Uh, open just actor directory users and computers there you go it's snappy it's working and you can play around with it when it comes to linux stuff you can just try a different version and see which one you can get going um, they're all going to be different you know obviously some of them don't even have gui at all there's no desktop per se or ver you know like a visual desktop and you know there'll be a lot of command line action going on but this is virtual machines in the nutshell for people to kind of get introduced to virtual machines and install their own and play around with and there you go i hope you like this video please share it with friends thank you so much for watching take care bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. This is a getting started with Azure video, which is a combination of two videos that I previously made on Microsoft Azure as part of introduction to this Microsoft system. First part of this video talks about basic navigation on the Azure platform. Introduction talks about what Azure is, what it's used for, and then getting started with virtual machines as a starting point. Towards the end and second part of this video it talks about storage containers and creating shared drives which are then applied to the machines. Microsoft Azure is a web-based or a cloud-based platform, if you will, that allows you to deploy different type of applications using Microsoft's service or Microsoft's processing power. So just imagine a bunch of different locations all around the world that have server rooms inside of them. All of those servers you are able to access through the Microsoft Azure and set up or deploy any application that you may even think of. And I'll show you, there are so many options that you can use. There are so many different things that you can go through and I will show you step by step on how to do this, whether it's deploying certain applications or running different services. I will show you from the beginning to the end for each video so that way there is no confusion. Friends, if you like this type of content, please take one second to click the like button. I really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference for me. All right. So before you can get started, uh, you have to create an Azure account and have a Microsoft account. But before you can activate your Azure account or have full access to it, you need to provide identity, verif identity verification and they want or require a credit card for you to use to verify your identity. Identity. All right, so let's go ahead and have a quick look at how it looks like. This is me logged in into Microsoft Azure, and there are a couple of things that you notice first. This is the home page, and typically in the home page, what you see is different uh, applications or things you've installed recently, and that would be under recent uh, resources. Above here, you have Azure services, and from here, you simply select a service that you want to deploy. And don't worry, I'm not going to confuse you with any of this, but I just kind of want to show you what's there available. And I'm going to click on more services as I did over there, just to show you that there is a massive amount of different things you can learn. Here are some examples. Here are the categories. Uh, there are general, there are networking, storage, web, uh, you know, there's uh, analytics, there is even AI machine learning, there is uh, mixed reality security monitoring all kinds of different things you can learn so if i expand this even further to see all services you can see that there is just a massive amount of different things you can learn however that being said in the first two videos we're going to concentrate on creating some virtual machines that i will show you how to access how to monitor and how to configure and after that the second video will be about uh, file storage and storage containers and how you can install them and run them using scripts through the PowerShell. All right. I hope I hope you're still with me because I promise it's not going to be uh, confusing or uh, super complex or anything like that. This is just a brief introduction to Microsoft Azure of the things that I will be uh, looking to show you. 
All right, so now that we're done with the brief introduction, we're going to start from scratch. So in order to start from scratch, we have to start with a resource group. So what the resource group is, and here you can see it right here, resource group is, you can think of it as a container that will have all the services, all the applications that you run in that one spot. So it's a form of, um, it's a way to organize everything in one place in order for things to function and of course things to be built properly because these are web services that you pay for typically and if you want to especially keep them running you're going to want to, you're going to have to pay to Microsoft to run all these services. For example, let's say you want to install a web server and you want to deploy virtual machines and run Apache on it, you're going to have to, you know, they want to know uh, they, they, they need to have a way to kind of keep track all of that. So that's what the resource group is. So I'm going to click on that and we're going to create a new one. You can see there are three different ones that I've created here. But let's go ahead and create one from a scratch. Again, this is just uh, basically, is, think of like creating a package of some sort. And the, for the package you need that outside shell or outside box. So right now we're creating the box for our uh, services that we're going to run. So this is going to be outside of it. No labels on it yet or anything like that, but we're going to uh, start creating that right now. The first thing that asks here is a subscription. And again, that kind of ties in into what thing I was saying about them, you know, charging you. In my case, um, I'm using the Azure subscription one. So this is just a way of you know, a subscription, you know, if you will, just like a Netflix subscription, you would just kind of pick the subscription that you have currently right now. And this is the free one that I'm using right now. There are $200 in credits available for it. So I'm going to click that so that way, um, you know, th th that's simply it is. You just kind of tell it, I want to use this subscription. And anything that's inside of this resource group is going to be charged under that subscription. This is incredibly important to know. So that way you know what you're uh, getting into and where the charges are coming from as well. All right, and then we're going to name this new resource group. So we're going to name it something that is appropriate for this tutorial, and we're going to just name it um, Azure Tutorial. We're going to name it that. Resource, next thing is resource details. This is also incredibly important. You want to make sure that everything that you deploy is in the same region. And you can see if you expand this that there are so many different regions. You got East, uh, US, um, US East I should say, and then Europe North, uh, US Central, Africa, Asia, Canada, and you know a bunch of different ones. I'm going to stick to US Central. So Everything that I create in this has to be in the same region. Think about networking in a sense, especially if you, when you're trying to sync different services with one another, you want them to be in the same region, otherwise they may not work properly. Okay, now just keep that in mind. I'm going to click Review and Create, and after that I'm just going to click Create. So here is our box, guys. This is the box that we've created, and now we're going to... Um, add more things to that box and the first thing we're going to do is create a virtual machine the reason I wanted to start with virtual machines is because most people are familiar with that especially if you're a system administrator of sort and uh, you know it's kind of simple to um, configure and install and most people understand what that is because it's you know most of the time it's just a you know operating system that you are familiar with all right now the, the way I'm going to add a virtual machine. I'm going to click on this little hamburger uh, icon here so I can have expanded menu and from here we can also select different services not just from home this is where we were at initially but you can also select some of the server you know from the left hand side this is what I like to use for quick access so I'm going to go down and simply just select a virtual machine I'm going to click on that and then I'm going to click on here to create a virtual machine and then we're going to create, I'd say about three different ones, just to show you. So we're going to, here we are in a, in a familiar window that we've seen earlier. Again, we have to, you know, make sure that we have the uh, proper subscription selected. This is, you know, again, we're, this is how they're going to charge us for the service. And again, we have resource group. And remember the one we created here? we can just simply select that we're going to select our Azure tutorial this is our group 
and then we're going to name our virtual machine. So let's see, what's the most common operating system that people are using right now? And that would be Windows, right? So let's go ahead and type in Windows 10 VM. We're going to create one of those. And luckily our region is automatically populated. So we, you know, we just have to make sure it is that and it is indeed central US. So it does memorize that, which is really good. And then uh, I'm not going to talk about infrastructure redundancy. I'm, I'm just going to leave it like that. It's just a you know virtual machine. And then here for the image, by the way, you can use your own image if you'd like. It says here browse all public and private images. That's just a you know a bunch of different things that they have available. But from my understand, you can use your own image as well. But we're just going to use what they have here pre-built for now. And then we're going to select Windows 10 and we're going to go with Windows 10 Pro version 1809, which is a little bit behind. Uh, the current version is 1909, I believe. But that doesn't matter. Now uh, we can certainly update that later if, if needed. But for now, you know, we want to, uh, we're just going to select that. And here it is our size. Size, but that means what it is, is just the type of uh, CPU and RAM and system resources we want to use for this virtual machine. And here it gives you an idea of what two virtual CPUs uh, cost with seven gigabytes of memory. And it's $183 a month. So we're going to click change and we're going to select a different option that's going to be more affordable. In, this, in the change window, we have all kinds of different uh, options, and as soon as the loss loads here, here it is in costs a month, we can select something that's a bit more affordable. And uh, for that, I'm going to just click this first one, which is just two gigs of RAM, one virtual CPU, and that's going to be good enough for our testing purposes, of course, testing purposes only. And I do, again, I have that $200 credit, but, you know, I'm just going to show this in case, uh, uh, in case there's some confusion about billing or whatnot. Anyways, so I'm going to choose one, and here see how it says $47 a month. This is estimated usage. A lot of times, and I'm not 100% sure if it the case is with Azure, but I use a Google services for a Google Cloud services for my website. They will a lot of times give you different discounts. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's 100% the case with Azure, but I, I suspect it is. It is just depending on what kind of a you know thing you're using uh, their services for. And of course, you can use you know the cheap one, which is here eight dollars a month. But this is incredibly slow, so I wouldn't even. Um, I worry about that too much. Um, if you look at it closely, it gives you kind of a, a, a limits and how much storage you have. You can certainly look at those things uh, on your own, and it's going to be uh, dependent on your personal preferences or what what kind of a you know system that you need. Uh, but I'm just going to use it, you know, this general purpose one. I'm going to leave it at that, and then I'm going to click select. All right. Now we have our virtual machine set up. This is our this is going to be our settings for it. So the next thing we have is creating an administrator account so that we can log into it. And we're going to log into it using remote desktop. This is pretty cool that they have it set up. So I'm going to type in Kobuman and I'm going to type in my password. They really want a super long password, which is perfectly Okay, so I'm going to type it in, type it in twice. All right, and here, uh, here are the inbound rules. Select which virtual machine networks, uh, network ports are accessible from the public internet. You can specify more limit or gradual network access to the network tab. So I'm going to leave it uh, at RDP, so that way we can use RDP. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And then here it says save money, already have Windows Enterprise. So they're asking you about the license, whether you have a license or not. Now uh, this is something, you know, if, if you're seriously going to run this, you can look into later. But for now, it's just going to let us install it. So I'm just going to click review and create. And um, as soon as it approves the deployment, we're going to click create deployment. And after that, we're going to... Um, create a couple of more virtual machines. So here's our overview of the things we've selected. By clicking create, you basically, you know, agree to the terms of service, this and that, blah, 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 blah. If you're interested in more details for that, you can certainly, um, you can certainly uh, 
take a look for yourself. Again, we're just kind of trying to keep this as simple as possible, and then depending on what we want to do with this, we can kind of look at the more details later. Okay, now once we create this, as you can see, it's initializing deployment, it's going to start to deploying it. What happens, it actually creates a virtual network automatically for you, and it places this machine into a virtual network for you, for, for your uh, container that we kind of talked about. So now like kind of going back, that uh, resource um, that, um, container that we created is that box that we have. Now we're starting to put things inside of this box. So everything that's inside of this box is the network that everything's going to be um, on. And you know, again, we kind of made sure that we picked US Central in our case. So everything that we put in there is going to be inside of that one box and everything's going to be connected and attached to itself. All right, so the deployment is underway. So we can actually get out of this window and proceed to create a couple of more virtual machines. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to create a virtual machine uh, server. So I'm going to create a new one, I'm going to click on there, and you can see it's processing over here and that's perfectly fine. We already told it, go ahead and do this and it already has its settings and it's just doing its thing in the background. We're going to do the same thing for uh, let's see here we're going to just pick a server we're going to uh, i think i want to do 2019. Uh, so again if we go to do resource group we're going to select azure tutorial and i'm going to name it windows serve 2019 vm make sure it's us central and i'm going to select windows server 2019 data center I'm going to go back here and change to our standard if available. We're going to standard uh, type of CPU processing. It's this one, that's the first one. I'm going to select that. And again, if you're creating a server and you needed to do a certain uh, um, amount of processing, you can certainly change this at any time, even after you deploy it. So you can stop the service and later on change these settings on any of these virtual machines. I'm going to create our you know, administrator password and login. Just a moment here. I'm trying to remember there are thousands of passwords that I have for a bunch of different things. I'm trying to get a unique password for everything is a bit difficult. So again, we're going to leave the RDP open so that way we can access it. And I'm going to click review and create. And uh, yes, you can go. Um, you can go into more detail and specify the type of uh, things you want on it. What does it say? It errored out. Required information is missing. What did we miss? Uh, basics. Oh, <laughs> I made it too long. The name of the virtual machine. All right. Anyways, we're going to click review and create. So yeah, you can go in there and specify the disk sizes and which network you want to use. But again, this is going to automatically put it into uh, the same the network that you need to. But if you want to go in and specify disks, you can go in there and specify type of disk you want. If you want the premium, you can certainly do so. You can add, uh, attach a disk on it. This is all virtually, uh, you know, you, you can virtually do this in any, any, any type of uh, um, virtual machine that you set up and then if you go to networking you can specify the network but again it's automatically going to put you into the correct network so I'm not too worried about that and there are some other things you can you know check and, and adjust but again I want to keep this very simple so that anybody can get this going on their own all right so review and create now it should let us uh, it should approve the deployment of it once uh, it thinks about it a little bit here and then we're going to click click create excuse me and then we're going to deploy this machine as well it may take a little time you know these are not the fastest when it comes to uh, when it comes to creating virtual machine but it is pretty I should say it's pretty common to have this type of a thing happening whenever you're using Google no oh, I say Google because I use Google uh, quite often but um, when you use uh, cloud services of this sort but you know you know I digress uh, it is pretty fast 
uh, considering that it installs an operating system on a virtual machine. Okay, let's see what our process or what our status is. It's still deploying the first one. Let's see here. Now you can see right here that uh, once I clicked on the little bell that I have $197 in credit remaining. And I'm just going to leave it here for in this window for a minute. And you can see here what it's kind of doing when it's deploying. It's creating that, you know, the virtual machines. And then it's reserving an IP address for it as well. And it's kind of uh, telling you that it is putting it in the correct network. All right. Let me see here. You know what? Let's go ahead and, and do another virtual machine. But this time we're going to do a Linux machine. And... Uh, yeah, this the first one is still creating. While we do that, I'm going to execute the other one. I execute the uh, deployment of our third virtual machine, which is going to be Linux. So here we are again, resource group. We're going to make sure we check check uh, Azure tutorials, and I'm going to type in Linux for the name of this virtual machine, and I'm going to actually label it Ubuntu because I'm going to select Ubuntu. Region is U.S. Central again. And then we're going, just going to leave it here on Ubuntu server 18.04. And again, you have you know different options for different types of Linuxes. And I'm going to go back here and select our standard type of machine for Linux. And I certainly don't want to use the slowest one. And, yep, that's the one. I'm going to select that. And um, when it comes to Ubuntu or Linux. There are a couple of different ways you can access it. You can use SSH public key. So this is kind of confusing and this is another topic that you we would have to talk about and explain. But it's just a different way of encrypt, uh, encryption access that you can use and then use that a, a key to access it. But that's confusing. I don't want to um, talk about that. I'm just going to keep it to simple username and password just like we have on the other one just to keep it simple and the reason I'm doing this guys is because I have people who are new to computers that watch my content uh, you know it's I can talk about SSH public keys and and this and that but let's let's keep it simple guys I'm just gonna keep it simple so here we can change it uh, different sendings for the inbound ports uh, by the way if you are going to run a web server here, you can select to have it open for those as well here. This will allow all IP addresses to access your virtual machine. Now, if you're going to use this type of uh, uh, setup, you don't have to if you don't want to. Typically, you would just leave the SSH because you don't want to keep yourself, you know, get you know, open yourself up for the intrusion. Once you set up a web server, you'll have a way to access it um, through the web server interface. So you don't necessarily have to have these HTTPS open at this time at all. So you can leave just SSH because that's typically how you would access a Linux server because it's a command line anyways. So I uh, would just kind of leave it at SSH and, and for that. Um, once you deploy a web server, for example, you can block access to SSH externally. There are different ways of doing it. You can use it um, to uh, you can use uh, configuration on the server itself to block access to SSH ports. But again, we're going to uh, just kind of leave it at that for now. I'm going to click review and create, and then once it approves our deployment, we're going to click create. So keep it moving. Otherwise, this video would have been God knows how long if I kept talking about every detail of things, and it would be confusing as well. Okay, let's see. I'm just waiting for this window to go to the next window to kind of uh, confirm to me that it's submitted for deployment. And hopefully, hopefully our Windows 10, the first virtual machine, is deployed already. Now, I'm just kind of checking to see if everything is going right okay good good your deployment is underway all right so I'm gonna go back home I'm going to click on home you can go go back to home and see the things that we've touched on recently and uh, 
it takes a while to update actually right here it takes a bit to update but this is what would have show up typically of the new things that we've touched on or created or adjusted and it also does that in the dashboard if we go to the dashboard okay good we got a message here that deployment succeeded for one of our virtual machines we're going to check that here in a minute but you know what let's let's pin it to dashboard because I wanted to go to dashboard anyways that was my next I'm going to pin it to dashboard so let's see what that is so next thing under home here is dashboard so we're going to click on dashboard to see what's there all right looks like our Windows server is deployed oh, where's our Windows 10 that's kind of weird didn't we have Windows 10 machine deployed as well did that succeed or not uh, all right well let's go to resources I'm going to click on go to resources Windows Server 2019. Huh. This already deployed, but not the Windows 10 that I asked for. Okay. Well, let's go to our virtual machines again and see if it's there. Oh, it's still creating it. That's interesting. So, Windows Server 2019 actually deployed faster than Windows 10. It's still creating it. Huh. That's very interesting. Anyways, let's go ahead and see the overview of Windows Server 2019. So again, we are on virtual machines, and this will show you all the other ones that we created as well. So we're missing a Linux here, which is still being created, and it takes a while to refresh to see. So we're going to click on Windows Server because supposedly that one is already deployed. We can see our public IP address of it, and we can here connect to it. But I kind of wanted to show you overview of it in the sense to see what is there for you to actually look at besides just regular information that is there I mean yeah sure you can see the IP address on it you can see the subscription subscription ID you know computer name if available uh, but you know in and then type of the uh, type of um, CPU that you're running and this and that and you should be able to change this once you click stop and th that's a topic for another video but right now I wanted to show you what is kind of important as an Azure administrator and that is monitoring now you can see that there are four different uh, four different graphs here and that are kind of the reason there are four and these specific ones because there is are kind of the most important ones that you would want to look at first one is being CPU average this is the usage of your CPU and the next one is network usage disk bytes which involves read and write bytes at any given time you can see it's it gives you how much on the left column here and on the bottom it tells you the time of it and also it gives you this disk, disk read and disk write in bytes and uh, then on the other one on the other one here over here next to it it says disk operations per second on average and it gives you different times the reason this is important to have is that if you suspect something suspicious going on for example let's say you're running a website or a web server or you suspect attack on your server you can look at the different times and this different CPU usage different um, different uh, operations on it that are happening at certain times and uh, this doesn't give us a good example here because it's a brand new one but let's go ahead and connect to it and we're going to do some stuff on it so that way it's going to give us some data here which we can get back to and I can kind of talk about it a little bit more because right now it doesn't really give us enough for me to talk about so let's go ahead and click connect here and we're going to select RDP all right so what this does it's going to download an RDP uh, file for us that we can just simply click and use it just a regular you know Windows remote desktop uh, remote desktop protocol so we're going to click on that and it's going to save it I'm just trying to check in okay you don't see the pop-up but there's actually a pop-up that says uh, do you want to save this file or just open it I'm going to click open it I'm going to click connect I apologize you guys don't see the login on this recording but it is there so what I'm doing is just typing in the password and the login that I showed you before that I've set up upon the creation of this and I'm going to click OK I will show you the the uh, whatchamacallit the remote desktop as well as soon as I get it going here okay just a moment please bear with me I just need to add a different source 
window capture. Need to capture that window just a moment. Please bear with me. Here we go, remote desktop. Here we are. All right. There you guys, there you go. I hope you can see it. It's loading right now. So I'm going to, let's see here. Hope it doesn't break the, the stupid recording window software is not, is not being good to me. All right. Looks like it's showing the RDP there and it's creating it. You know, the typical thing, the first time you log in, it's going to create your local profile and it's going to take a bit to load. It's, you know, th this is very typical. Uh, you just kind of have to wait for it to start and get going. And here it is finally coming up. So this is our Windows Server machine. Pretty soon we're going to see that Windows Server setup configuration there and then it's just like using a you know regular windows server machine you is if you were there you guys know what remote desktop is but then again you have this goes to show you that you have full access to it okay now i'm going to go back to that overview and kind of look at those graphs with you and tell you kind of for the things to to kind of look for when it comes to monitoring this type of a system and then i'm going to show you the other machines as well depending how long this takes and see here it is here's that typical thing where it asks you to do you want to allow this PC to be discoverable and we're going to click yes for that so there you go this is typically what happens or what you see when you install Windows Server and uh, I'm just going to minimize this and go back to our Azure window. Okay, there we are. Okay, so we're going to click on overview again, just so you can see all the things that are be that are happening on the window, uh, on the um, Windows uh, 2019 server. So since we've logged into it, we saw more activity. Now we can see that at this time, which is at 12.13 p.m., we can see that there is more CPU activity. As a matter of fact, they spiked to almost 100%. And at the same time, you can see that it kind of moves the other uh, diagrams or uh, graphs at the same time, so that way you can see what is going on at the same time. So it kind of aligns it for you. And now, now you can see there is more read and write which is pretty normal. It gives you the disk reads down here where it says 137 megabytes and then disk writes are 483 megabytes. So this is happening as we are creating our local profile. And at the same time, we see some network activity and that is, you know, it says Windows Server is network in total is 147 megabytes and network out total is, uh, let's see, it's still happening. It's at 1.27 megabytes. So it downloaded 147 megabytes of data and it uploaded 100, uh, 1 megabyte, uh, 1.27 megabytes. And then it, we get the more disk operations. So why is this important? Why am I telling you about this? If you suspect somebody hacking into your system, you might want to kind of look at the spikes in the graph. Otherwise, you'll be just normal or just a little jagged like this. Normally, this is pretty normal operation, just kind of idling. But when it comes to huge spikes like this, you want to kind of look at this and see what is happening. Now, if it's just a web server and you see increase in traffic, you know, people using your website and you see a spike like this, but then you look at your other monitoring tools for the live traffic of people coming through and you see a spike on your server, that's not normal, right? But if you suddenly see a spike at a certain time, then you might want to see if there is some kind of a, you know, attack on your server or whatnot, or if there's some kind of a, you know, who knows, maybe even a virus happening on your computer if you have abnormal disk reads, a bytes, or CPU usage. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is look at other things that are here under the overview. There are a bunch of different things here that we can look at that help you deal with this type of stuff and things that you can change. So if you click, for example, on networking here under settings, you can look at the network settings of it and gives you more information on it. You can add inbound port rules if you want to open up 
Well, you know, uh, the different uh, ports are not, you can at the same time, you can disable one. So here's our RDP here, and we can disable it if we want. So if you're occasionally accessing this Windows Server and using the RDP, you might want to delete it. So that way you're, you know, you're more protected. Nobody can really, you know, try to access it afterwards. And then same thing uh, when it comes to disks. If you click on disks here, um, you can, you know, make changes to it if you'd like. Uh, a lot of times we have to stop the um, the service from running. I'm not exactly sure if that's the case here with the Azure systems. Uh, we can certainly try that. And then we got a bunch of different monitoring uh, things that we can look at. So one of the things that I showed you there are those graphs, and there is a different way to look at that as well if you want a more customized and cleaner way of doing it. If you click on the little hamburger thing, uh, sign, you can go down here and select monitor and you can look at uh, monitoring uh, metrics of it. So if you click here, explore metrics, you can add different graphs that you can look at. Again, I don't want to confuse you too much with this. Again, this is just another way of looking at the same thing, except in a more detailed manner where you can make adjustments and change the different metrics that you want to look at. And here's a, just a real quick, if we click here on the scope, this allows you to select our resource. So if we select our Azure subscription one, we know this is where our resource group is at. And then we can click Azure tutorial. And then we're going to look down here for our server. And for some reason it's not scrolling down, but that's okay, no problem. We know that we have that service and to click on resource type. I'm going to uncheck select all. I'm going to just click virtual machines because that's the only thing I want to look at for now. And I'm going to close that and now it's going to come up and say, well, you have three virtual machines. Which ones do you want to monitor? I'm going to click, I'm going to click Windows Server 2019. I'm going to select that. And now it's asking me to select a metric. So we can kind of replicate to you know what we've seen previously. We can kind of select, I don't know, let's see, disk read operations per second. Uh, we had that over there and then the graph is going to come up and show us. You can see here and uh, there's that then we can you know add more to it or we can add another metric and uh, in a way where we can just select what was the other one network out total let's see where's our network network in total I should say and there was an out as well and it gives you that and it those they give you kind of side by side but if you want them to you know uh, kind of stack on top of each other you can certainly do that as well I'm just gonna move it to the right here to move the timeline but again there's not much going on right now so there really isn't much to look at and let me just try one more here CPU there's I want to look for the uh, CPU one percentage CPU here we go average okay and it gives you see it's it's just not enough for us to kind of visualize anyways the machine is just too new for us to actually for this to work properly because it hasn't even replicated completely we know there's a lot more going on it's just that it takes time and these things kind of take time to replicate for you to use this properly but anyways it's all here it's just a different way of looking at it and if you want to get a more de you know in-depth analysis of what's going on with the usage of that machine you can certainly do that all right let's go to other virtual machines uh, we can look at Windows 10, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I went ahead and stopped it early. I don't know if you guys seen that, but I went ahead and stopped it from working. But it's because the way I access it is the same as Windows Server 2019. I just wanted to show you that you can deploy that. Let's go ahead and click our Linux Ubuntu machine. The way you can connect to this is if you click on the connect, you can use SSH, you can use RDP. But if we click on RDP, you can see that we have to install certain things on our computer in order to access this. This is not going to actually work. So if I click download RDP, it's not going to actually let me work to it. Typically you would, um, and it's closed. We know that the port is closed anyways. So um, we can choose to connect with SSH with the key thing, this and that, but you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. There is an easiest way to connect to this. And if you scroll down under this, all the way down, there is 
a thing called serial console. So if we click on that, it will give us the same access as if it was SSH, I believe. Now, uh, it's going to ask us for our password so we can actually have access to our console. But once we go in there, uh, it's just an easier way to accessing it. As soon as it comes up here, it's going to ask us for our password and we're going to be able to, you know, browse it. Uh, it's just that, you know, once you, the way, the only difference is that it's it's not a pop out the window, you know, and for me it actually works out for me to show you like this, and uh, okay. Log in. I'm going to type in my login name, and I'm going to type in my password. I'm going to hit enter, and as soon as it thinks about it, we will have access, and there it is. We have full access to this server. So if we do, for example, ls-a, it's going to show us what's inside of these different uh, folders and we can make adjustments, you know, update it, do all kinds of different things. We can create more monitoring. We can install different uh, Git app um, system analysis, monitoring things that we can do. Okay. Anyways, this is how you can access the Linux server and just kind of, you know, go through it and, and, and look at different things. This is a continuation of Microsoft Azure platform. We're going to be learning new things today. In the previous video, I've talked about on how to create different virtual machines on the Microsoft Azure platform, how to create them, how to configure them, and how to monitor them for different issues. Amongst other things that I've talked about in the video, it's really good idea to actually look at that and watch that first video in order to get a really good introduction of what Microsoft Azure is. As promised in that video, I'm going to continue with the second video that will be about storage accounts and we're going to create file shares inside of that storage accounts and then we're going to add those file shares into our virtual machines which are going to appear as shared drives. So if you do tech support, you're familiar with shared drives which is something that you would add to the users a computer in order for them to access it for storage. So again, I highly recommend that you watch the previous video as the introduction so that way you can follow along. Of course, I will have a pop-up link right here on the right hand side that you can simply follow and at the end of this video. All right, guys, that being said, please take one second to like my video. That really makes a huge difference for me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support on this. All right, guys, let's get into it. And here we are in our home uh, page of Microsoft Azure. From here, we can click storage accounts, but another way to find storage account is to click on the little hamburger icon and just go down and select storage accounts. So let's go ahead and click storage accounts and we're going to create one. You already can see that I already have one and that's related to the fact that you got to have one in order to store your virtual machines or anything else that you create that requires taking up space or storage, right? So of course, we're going to have to have, um, you know, a storage account already. But for this, we're going to create a special one just for file storage. So from here, we're going to click add, and then we're going to create one. And the reason we're creating one is related to billing mostly. So Microsoft wants to know you know, what are you using things for? Just like we created different resource groups for our virtual machines, Microsoft wants us to create a separate group for the storage accounts. So it's kind of related to billing, so that way they know what that is used for, so that way they can bill you for it. Kind of similar to what we had in our virtual machines, the first thing that comes up is to select our subscription. And again, subscription is basically the subscription that we're using for the Microsoft Azure platform, a way to bill you basically, just like you have, for example, Netflix subscription or anything else. So you tell it, okay, I want to use this one. In our case, it's already selected. And then here we're going to select resource group. As I mentioned in the previous video, every time you create a resource group, which is what we've done in the previous video, you want to make sure that everything else that you want it to be connected to that, you want to make sure you select the same one. And in the previous video, we created a group called Azure Tutorial. So we're going to select that. And just to kind of quickly overview why we're doing this, when you make sure that you are selecting the same resource group, you also make sure at the same time that you're putting everything on the same network. So with this way, it's going to make sure that the, you know, the uh, 
that the network connections between all those virtual machines and the storage is also working in the sense that they are on the same network. It's going to reduce the fact that you may need to configure different security settings, this and that. It kind of puts it in the same network. You will have connections to it, and that way you are good to go, especially when you create later on a sync uh, storage, which basically what it does, it creates a backup of the storage that you're uh, creating. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you got to make sure that it is in the same resource group. And in our sense, we're kind of concerned about the same network so that there is connectivity. All right, we're good there. And now below, we can select a storage account name. We can type it in. We're just going to call, call it um, new storage. And it doesn't like the caps, so we're just going to use lower letters. New storage is already taken. We're going to call it new storage one. All right, we're going to we're going to name it something specific. I'm going to call it Azure Storage. Let's see if it likes that tutorial. Is already taken. All right. Well, let's just leave it that as your storage toot. We're going to leave it at that. So, uh, yeah, it's very picky, and uh, which is pretty common. So that's good. So the next thing we're looking at is performance. It kind of depends on what you're looking at. If you want the standard performance, you can leave it at that. If you want the premium, you can certainly select that as well, depending on your business needs. But we're just going to keep it standard for the purpose of the tutorial, and that's going to be fine. And then we can click next here so you can see the networking. But if you just leave it at default, it should work fine. It says here, public endpoint, all networks. All networks, meaning that all the network that you've created, um, you can leave it at that. And then if we click next advanced, you got different things that you can adjust. But as I've mentioned in my previous videos, I like to keep things simple so that way it's easier to follow. So we're just going to cl simply click review and create. All right, now it just says it that deployment is complete. We can certainly click on go to resources and go to it right away. But what I want to do actually real quick is make sure that at least one of my one of my virtual machines is turned on so that we after we configure our file share, we can go inside of it and use PowerShell to add that um, add access to the share that we create. So I'm going to click on the you know the little hamburger icon. I'm going to go down to my virtual machines and I'm going to make sure that at least one of them is running and looks like my Windows Server 2009 is uh, 2019 is running, which is good. We're going to access that in a little bit here. All right, I'm going to go home here. And as you noticed in our home page, it gives you access to the most recent things that you've worked on. And here is our Azure storage uh, tutorial account. We're going to click on that. So from here, we're going to click on file shares. I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about anything else that that it isn't a topic of this video. If you have special requests, please let me know. So we're going to simply click on file shares because that's what we're creating. I'm going to click a little file share button here. And on the right hand side, we're going to, it's going to ask us for a name. So we're going to type in file share drive. And then right below it, it's super simple. I really like this. It gives you the ability to add the quota. So the size of the file share. So we're just going to make it 10 gigabytes. All right, we're going to go down here. I'm going to click Create. And something very cool happens once you create it. Uh, it it's very simple. It just kind of allocates you know, shared space. It's going to be super fast, and it's already done. So we're going to click on that and see what's inside of that. So all right, so with our file share drive selected, what we're going to do here is add a directory. So that way there's something in there. We're going to call it uh, user storage storage. I'm going to click OK. So it's going to create just a folder called user storage. So that way, once we go in there, we're going to be able to see it once we connect to it. And we're going to click connect. We're going to pick our J drive here so that we know it comes up. Then we're going to click copy the clipboard. We're going to back to our Windows server. We have PowerShell open and we have File Explorer open. You can see that there is no shared drive named J inside of it. So we're going to paste our 
script in there and this is going to add once it connects to it it's going to add our J drive into it so just kind of bear with me here in a moment uh, the virtual machine is kind of running slow I'm not sure what's going on but it will add it there eventually so once it's done I will show you that it did it all right so you saw that it was uh, waiting for response waiting for connection and then verified the credentials and then you can see that it added that uh, J file share drive into here and then it came up in our file explorer right here and it says see, you can see that it says here 10 gigabytes and if we go inside of it, we should be able to see that directory that we created and from here we can literally just put anything we want that we can create I don't know let's create a document test doc all right and then once we get out of it in order to do this administration of it if we go inside of user directory we can see that test document that it came up so as one of the last things I kind of wanted to show you that is really cool about these storage accounts is that you can actually monitor them just like those virtual machines that I showed you before so let's go on back to it and then if you scroll down we selected that our Azure storage toot here if you scroll down you can you know monitor the uh, its usage so you can, just like with the virtual machines you can monitor different usage and access at specific times and periods all right so why am i teaching you this uh well obviously so you can learn how to use it and how to administer azure storage accounts but there is another reason for implementing this type of shared drive is that you know you can simply take that script if you want people to connect to it and um, you can create that script you can pass it on to people manually or you can create the script and set it up in active directory for a pers for a certain group of people um, that work for example let's say you're in a business environment there are five different groups so let's say there is collections department let's say there is accounting department let's say there is a uh, I don't know some kind of a tech department and they all are going to be in different groups in Active Directory well you can set up a script what they call a post logon script that will add these type of shared drives to them automatically upon login so you can use this script you can implement it within Active Directory to run it for that specific group or even specific user if you want but let's stick to the group so let's say you want all you know collections department to have access to the specific storage that you've just created so the way you would add it into active directory you would set up the script it's very simple and um, every time they log in it's going to run that script and make sure that they have that drive added i mean you can certainly you can specify it in different ways you don't have to use this specific script but this is an option and um, it would just happen they would get this storage attached they don't have to worry about trying to add it the network drive or the share drive themselves all right guys i hope you like this video uh, again if you want to check out my intro i highly recommend that thank you so much for watching please take a moment to like share and leave any comments that you may have thank you for watching and you have a wonderful day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we're learning some of the basics of PowerShell, specifically on how to install or execute application installation. So what, we'll, uh, what I will teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts that would allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here media creation tool 1809 you would simply double click it then you get the prompts and you go through the prompts and then you install everything like that well you can also execute this through the powershell so there are a couple of ways of doing this which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run powershell remote installs or even local installs if you will and that is to get to the same directory so if we type in cd downloads it's going to take us to that directory the reason they got this to the directory because we're already partially there but if we really wanted to navigate to this it would be simple as this we're going to type in users name of the local profile that i'm using which is yt login and then i'm going to type in 
downloads, it's going to get us to the same place. So if we type in the IR, we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well. So this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts. <clears throat> By the way, this is going to be a little bit more advanced, so it's a little bit more advanced for uh, you know people who are more familiar with computer software. But if you're new to computers, I will try to go as slow as possible. Comparatively speaking, here's the same directory in a GUI form. So this is inside of our Windows, and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here. So let's go ahead and execute it from the PowerShell. And the way to do that is to type in start process. And then type in media creation tool.exe. See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash s. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package typically. It won't work here because this is executable and it's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example this one. This is an MSI installer for that and that is dot MSI. Now here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location. In our case, we might have something on a network level, which is for me located here. I went ahead and created a folder for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash Kobuman one, and that is the PC name or the server name that you might be using. And then I'm going to type in folder name repo one. So if we look inside of this one, the IR, we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that. So the same way we can execute it from here as well. So we can start type in the same way, start process media creation tool 1809.exe. Since we're in the disk directory already, I can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing. So I went ahead and canceled that. This is where you're getting all these errors. Now, we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobbleman one for uh, folder name repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe. Then we're going to hit enter. And now we have that pop up again. And again, if you want to make this silent, you're going to have to create your own MSI package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent. So meaning that nothing happens that you see visually, it just kind of installs it. So that's how you would do it. Uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using PowerShell. Now, you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so, but you would have to have some kind of a uh, package manager that would allow you to do so. So let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that. So there's one that was set up for testing by Microsoft, which we will navigate here in a moment. Let me just do a, a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here. And in order to find these packages, we can type in find dash package. And then we need to specify a provider, which that means is you know dash provider this is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name in our case the provider or our server name if you will is chocolatey i think that's how it's pronounced so we're going to hit enter here and see what happens so here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server if you will so 
how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say Notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for Notepad. Because you can see there are so many different things here. And if there's something specific that, you can, that you're can you looking for, you're gonna have to you know kind of remember that or specifically search for. So let's stop this process here. And I'm gonna leave it up just for the sake of reference. I'm gonna open up a new PowerShell and we're going to access the same repository, but I'm going to tell it to look for a specific name. And in our case, we're going to use an example of namepad so we're going to type in again find dash package and then we're going to type in provider and then server chocolatey and i'm going to specify a command which is name that tells it i'm okay i want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that i'm going to type in notepad and i'm going to use asterisk so i'm going to type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in, inside of this uh, repository it's going to show up as so so now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository so yes we can now download these packages and uh, we're going we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software so what can we do with this point well we can install one of these packages so let's go ahead and pick a, a random one let's Let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're going to do Control C on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to uh, we use some commands. And this this case, instead of typing in Find Package, we're going to type in Install Package. Install Package. We're going to uh, type in Provider once more, and then we're going to type in Chocolaty. And then we're going to specify a name, and then we're going to say notepad++. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software from Chocolaty? And I can say yes, yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or or if you're unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just gonna type in Y for yes, and I'm gonna hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our Chocolady, uh, well, there's a core extension, there it is, Notepad++ is what we just got here. And there are a couple of different packages here that are installed. Ah, this one actually came with the installer. So that's cool. Now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to. And all right, I found that some of these uh, packages are not com incomplete, but I've downloaded, for example, Visual Studio here. This one doesn't seem to have the actual the actual uh, executable in there but this one actually installed what is this one this is part of the same one okay well we can execute this now and all we got to do is just copy this path here and then we can type in again start process and then we can specify that and then we we need to get the name of that installation. Let's do the uh, x64, the 64-bit version of that. And I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm going to hit enter. And here it is. Now, let's see if it works silently. It errored out because I clicked no, as you saw. I'm going to use the S switch. Let's see if this... Nope. So, yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently and this one is just a simple executable anyways guys i hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is you can um, do we can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers this and that there are many many ways of going about this is kind of just an introduction to powershell 
and uh, there are many many different tools that you can look at and uh, and not only can you install you can also uninstall and again there are different ways of doing this you can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command you can use the start process command many many different ways and this is the great thing about PowerShell you can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way you the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at and you know I'm not an expert on this uh, I know some of the basic stuffs and I really believe that everybody should know and familiarize themselves with some of the basic stuff just as much as you would familiarize yourself with just using command prompt and creating basic scripts so that being said thank you so much for watching this video please share it with your friends if you have any questions please let me know and you have a wonderful day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. As you can tell by the video title and the thumbnail, today I will be talking about how to install operating system on 100 computers. And this idea comes from my article that is titled Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. If you're interested in reading this, there is a link at the end of the video to this article. If you watched my previous videos, I went through the first three questions and kind of uh, went and explained what they are about and provided some examples, which I will certainly try to do as well in the number four, which is the question we are up to in my video series, if you will. So when it comes to the way I explain things, I usually do it in four part answer, which consists of first thing I would do, second thing I would do, third thing I would do, and then last thing that I would do. The reason for that is related to the fact that you might be receiving this type of question when you interview for a job. So you want your potential employer to know that you are able to properly perform this type of a process or being able to resolve this type of issue and it tells them also that you the way you think is the proper way to go about it and also tells them that you're very knowledgeable so uh, this is a good way to kind of practice that all right so let's get to it number four what is the best way to install operating system on 100 computers manually meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any ad automated system available. So typically in a large business, everything's automated. If you were to receive 100 computers, you can just connect them to the network. You would get host names for them and you would assign them, you know, which operating system to install, which programs need to be installed as well. And everything would just be done automatically. You just kind of sit back and relax and everything's done. This is why this is a hit difficult question. And this is how I would go about it. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. And that will tie in a little bit later here. I'll explain that. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. So since I don't have an option of automation, I would make sure that these computers are kind of gathered together in in uh, preferably in, in the same room. I would connect them together, power them on and everything like that. So that way they are uh, there for easy access for me to, you know, schedule a lot or, or start to re-image process on a lot of them. That's the point of that. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to the domain. This is why I was saying, first, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. So that afterwards, I would acquire host names for each machine so they could be added to the domain. And for this to happen properly, all the computers need to be connected to the network and turned on. So this can be assigned through Active Directory, also known as the main controller. So you would go inside of the Active Directory and you would create 100 computer names, also known as the host names and then you would assign them accordingly to all of these computers that are being re-imaged and uh, with, it, with them being connected to the network makes it an easy process. Okay, third, 
because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS installed medias to use, CD or USB. So this kind of goes back to my trying to keep them in the same area for easy access. And that's exactly why. So that I can use install media on them. Um, afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. You see how everything kind of ties, ties in. The way I would do things, it's kind of systematical and everything kind of goes back to itself. This is a great way to tell your potential employer that you have a really good way of thinking on how to resolve these big issues. Because, you know, trying to install operating system on 100 computers and doing it in a an acceptable time frame, you got to know what you're doing and have a good plan. You know what I mean? So lastly, upon image, and image completion, I would ensure that each computer has host names attached and is added to the domain or a work group. Work group um, usually is used, you know, in a small type of business. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that if you're interviewing at a big company. But, you know, you got to make sure that is added to the domain and host name attached, meaning that associated with each computer. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. And that kind of goes back to the part of automation that I mentioned earlier that normally happens is you select the type of software that you need and it would install it automatically. In this case, you would have to do it manually, install any software required per department templates or requests. So if somebody needs Microsoft Office professionally installed, this is what we would have to do manually for each computer. And, um, you know, you would have to kind of get that information to make sure you don't spend too much time installing stuff um, on, that's unnecessary stuff. You know what I mean? Because you don't necessarily have to install the same program on all of these computers. Because who knows? doesn't mean that all these computers are going to the same department. So they may have a different templates that you would use and go buy. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Uh, unfortunately, in number four question here, I, there was really nothing for me to show inside the computer. But if you take a look at my previous three videos that I made uh, in regards to in relation to this article that I wrote, you can see that I provided some uh, computer examples um, so you guys can also learn from that. There will be a link at the end of this video. Uh, there will be icons or uh, thumbnails at the end of this video as I am speaking right now. I hope you guys like this video. Please share it with your buddies. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them. And you have a wonderful day. Okay, make sure you have a wonderful day because I really want you to have a wonderful day. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we have introduction to Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure is a web-based or a cloud-based platform, if you will, that allows you to deploy different type of applications using Microsoft's service or Microsoft's processing power. So just imagine a bunch of different locations all around the world that have server rooms inside of them. All of those servers you are able to access through the Microsoft Azure and set up or deploy any application that you may even think of. And I'll show you there are so many options that you can use. So without getting into too much of a detail, I will go ahead and show you on how to do certain things when it comes to Microsoft Azure and the things that are kind of related mostly to administration of the Azure web uh, interfaces and whatnot. There are so many different things that you can go through and I will show you step by step on how to do this, whether it's deploying certain applications or running different services. I will show you from the beginning to the end for each video so that way there is no confusion. Friends, if you like this type of content, please take one second to like the but to click the like button. I really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference for me. All right. So before you can get started, uh, you have to create an Azure account and have a Microsoft account. But before you can activate your 
Azure account or have full access to it, you need to provide identity, verif identity verification and they want or require a credit card for you to use to verify your identity. And if they give you $200 uh, in, in credits in, uh, for first 30 days to use for all the testing that you want to do or deploy any type of services. And after that, I believe it's free for 12 months but it, um, I'm not sure what the limitations are after that, but if you want to, you know, go in there and set up an account for, you know, testing purposes, for learning purposes, you would need a credit card to get going. They don't charge you, as far as I know, maybe charge like a dollar just to, you know, kind of make sure that you are that, per, you know, the person that holds that credit card. Anyways, I don't want to get into that. That's not what this video is about. We are here to learn about Microsoft Azure. All right, so let's go ahead and have a quick look of how it looks like. This is me logged in into Microsoft Azure, and there are a couple of things that you notice first. This is the home page, and typically in the home page, what you see is different uh, applications or things you've installed recently, and that would be under recent uh, resources. Above here, you have Azure services, and from here, you simply select a service that you want to deploy. And don't worry, I'm not going to confuse you with any of this, but I just kind of want to show you what's there available. And I'm going to click on more services as I did over there, just to show you that there is a massive amount of different things you can learn. Here are some examples. Here are the categories. Uh, there are general, there are networking, storage, web, uh, you know, there's uh, analytics, there is even AI machine learning, there is uh, mixed reality security, monitoring, all kinds of different things you can learn. So if I expand this even further to see all services, you can see that there is just a massive amount of different things you can learn. So that being said, if you want me to talk about specific things that you want to learn when it comes to Microsoft Azure, please let me know in the comment box below because I really, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to come up with topics, especially when there are so many things to talk about. So, you know, there's no point of me doing a video on everything that you see here if, if there is not enough interest. So if there's enough, enough, if there's enough interest for a specific topic, please let me know in the comments below. However, that being said, in the first two videos, we're going to concentrate on creating some virtual machines that I will show you how to access, how to monitor, and how to configure. And after that, the second video will be about uh, file storage and storage containers and how you can install them and run them using script through the PowerShell. All right. I hope I hope you're still with me because I promise it's not going to be uh, confusing or uh, super complex or anything like that. This is just a brief introduction to Microsoft Azure of the things that I will be uh, looking to show you. All right. So now that we're done with the brief introduction, we're going to start from scratch. So in order to start from scratch, we have to start with a resource group. So what the resource group is, and here you can see it right here, resource group is, you can think of it as a container that will have all the services, all the applications that you run in that one spot. So it's a form of, um, it's a way to organize everything in one place in order for things to function and of course things to be built properly because these are web services that you pay for typically and if you want to especially keep them running you're going to want to, you're going to have to pay to Microsoft to run all these services. For example, let's say you want to install a web server and you want to deploy virtual machines and run Apache on it, you're going to have to, you know, they want to know uh, they, they, they need to have a way to kind of keep track of all of that. So that's what the resource group is. So I'm going to click on that and we're going to create a new one. You can see there are three different ones that I've created here. But let's go ahead and create one from a scratch. Again, this is just uh, basically, it, think of like creating a package of some sort. And the, for the package, you need that outside shell or outside box. So right now we're creating the box for our... Uh, services that we're going to run. So this is going to be outside of it. No labels on it yet or anything like that, but we're going to uh, start creating that right now. The first thing that asks here is a subscription. And again, that kind of ties in into what thing I was saying about them, you know, charging you. In my case, um, I'm using the Azure subscription one. So this is just a way of you know, a subscription, you know, if you will, just like a Netflix subscription, you would just kind of pick the subscription that you have currently right now. 
and this is the free one that I'm using right now there are $200 in credits available for it so I'm gonna click that so that way um, you know th th that's simply it is you just kind of tell it I want to use this subscription and anything that's inside of this resource group is going to be charged under that subscription this is incredibly important to know so that way you know what you're uh, getting into and where the charges are coming from as well all right, and then we're going to name this new resource group. So we're going to name it something that is appropriate for this tutorial, and we're going to just name it um, Azure Tutorial. We're going to name it that. Resource, next thing is resource details. This is also incredibly important. You want to make sure that everything that you deploy is in the same region. And you can see if you expand this that there are so many different regions. You got East, uh, US, um, US East I should say, and then Europe North, uh, US Central, Africa, Asia, Canada, and you know a bunch of different ones. I'm going to stick to US Central. So everything that I create in this has to be in the same region. Think about networking in a sense, especially if you, when you're trying to sync different services with one another, you want them to be in the same region, otherwise they may not work properly. Okay, now just keep that in mind. I'm going to click review and create, and after that I'm just going to click create. So here is our box, guys. This is the box that we've created, and now we're going to um, add more things to that box and the first thing we're going to do is create a virtual machine the reason I wanted to start with virtual machines is because most people are familiar with that especially if you're a system administrator of sort and uh, you know it's kind of simple to um, configure and install and most people understand what that is because it's you know most of the time it's just a you know operating system that you are familiar with all right now the, the way I'm going to add a virtual machine. I'm going to click on this little hamburger uh, icon here so I can have expanded menu and from here we can also select different services not just from home this is where we were at initially but you can also select some of the serv you know from the left hand side this is what I like to use for quick access so I'm going to go down and simply just select a virtual machine. I'm going to click on that and then I'm going to click on here to create a virtual machine and then we're going to create I'd say about three different ones just to show you so we're going to here we are in a, in a familiar window that we've seen earlier again we have to you know make sure that we have the uh, proper subscription selected this is you know again we're, this is how they're going to charge us for their service and again we have resource group and remember the one we created here we can just simply select that we're going to select our Azure tutorial this is our group and then we're going to name our virtual machine so let's see what's the most common operating system that people are using right now and that would be Windows right so let's go ahead and type in Windows 10 VM we're going to create one of those and luckily our region is automatically populated so we you know we just have to make sure it is that and it is indeed central US so it does memorize that which is really good and then uh, I'm not going to talk about infrastructure redundancy I'm just gonna leave it like that it's just a you know virtual machine and then here for the image by the way you can use your own image if you'd like it says here browse all public and private images that's just a you know a bunch of different things that they have available but from I understand you can use your own image as well but we're just going to use what they have here pre-built for now and then we're going to select Windows 10 and we're going to go with Windows 10 Pro version 1809 which is a little bit behind uh, the current version is 1909 I believe but that doesn't matter now uh, we can certainly update that later if, if needed but for now you know we want to uh, we're just going to select that and here it is our size size but that means what it is is just the type of uh, CPU and RAM and system resources we want to use for this virtual machine and here it gives you an idea of what two virtual CPUs uh, cost with seven gigabytes of memory and it's 183 dollars a month so we're going to click change 
and we're going to select a different option that's going to be more affordable. In, this, in the change window, we have all kinds of different uh, options, and as soon as the loss loads here, here it is in cost a month, we can select something that's a bit more affordable. And uh, for that, I'm going to just click this first one, which is just two gigs of RAM, one virtual CPU, and that's going to be good enough for our testing purposes, of course, testing purposes only. And I do, again, I have that $200 credit, but, you know, I'm just going to show this in case, uh, uh, in case there's some confusion about billing or whatnot. Anyways, so I'm going to choose one, and here you see how it says $47 a month. This is estimated usage. A lot of times, and I'm not 100% sure if it, the case is with Azure, but I use uh, Google services for a uh, Google Cloud service for my website. They will a lot of times give you different discounts. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's 100% the case with Azure, but I, I suspect it is. It is just depending on what kind of a you know thing you're using uh, their services for. And of course, you can use you know the cheap one, which is here eight dollars a month. But this is incredibly slow, so I wouldn't even. Um, I worry about that too much. Um, if you look at it closely, it gives you kind of a, a, a limits and how much storage you have. You can certainly look at those things uh, on your own, and it's going to be uh, dependent on your personal preferences or what what kind of a you know system that you need. Uh, but I'm just going to use it, you know, this general purpose one. I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to click select. All right. Now we have our virtual uh, machine set up. This is our this is going to be our settings for it. So the next thing we have is creating administrator account so that we can log into it. Uh, and we're going to log into it using remote desktop. This is pretty cool that they have it set up. So I'm going to type in Kobuman and I'm going to type in my password. They really want a super long password, which is perfectly Okay, so I'm going to type it in, type it in twice. All right, and here, uh, here are the inbound rules. Select which virtual machine networks, uh, network ports are accessible from the public internet. You can specify more limit or gradual network access to the network tab. So I'm going to leave it uh, at RDP, so that way we can use RDP. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And then here it says save money, already have Windows Enterprise. So they're asking you about the license, whether you have a license or not. Uh, this is something, you know, if, if you're seriously going to run this, you can look into later. But for now, it's just going to let us install it. So I'm just going to click review and create. And um, as soon as it approves the deployment, we're going to click create deployment. And after that, we're going to um, create a couple of more virtual machines. So here's our overview of the things we've selected. By click and create, you basically you know agree to the terms of service, this and that, blah 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 blah. If you're interested in more details for that, you can certainly um, you can certainly uh, take a look for yourself. Again, we're just kind of trying to keep this as simple as possible, and then depending on what we want to do with this, we can kind of look at the more details later. Okay. Now, once we create this, as you can see, it's initializing deployment. It's going to start deploying it. What happens, it actually creates a virtual network automatically for you, and it places this machine into a virtual network for you, for, for your uh, container that we kind of talked about. So now, like kind of going back, that uh, resource um, that, um, container that we created is that box that we have. Now we're starting to put things inside of this box. So everything that's inside of this box is the network that everything's going to be um, on. And, you know, again, we kind of made sure that we picked US Central in our case. So everything that we put in there is going to be inside of that one box and everything's going to be connected and attached to itself. All right. So the deployment is underway. So we can actually get out of this window and proceed to create a couple of more virtual machines. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to create a virtual machine uh, server. So I'm going to create a new one, I'm going to click on there. And you can see it's processing over here and that's perfectly fine. We already told it, go ahead and do this and it already has its settings and it's just doing its thing in the background. We're going to do the same thing for, uh, let's see here, we're going to just pick a server. We're going to, uh, I think I want to do 2019. Uh, so again, if we go to do a resource group, we're going to select Azure Tutorial, and I'm going to name it Windows Serve 
2019 VM. Make sure it's US Central. And I'm going to select Windows Server 2019 Data Center. I'm going to go back here and change to our standard if available. We're going to standard uh, type of CPU processing. And it's this one, that's the first one. I'm going to select that. And again, if you're creating a server and you needed to do a certain uh, um, amount of processing, you can certainly change this at any time, even after you deploy it. So you can stop the service and later on change these settings on any of these virtual machines. I'm going to create our you know, administrator password and login. Just a moment here. I'm trying to remember there are thousands of passwords that I have for a bunch of different things. Trying to get a unique password for everything is a bit difficult. So again, we're going to leave the RDP open so that way we can access it. And I'm going to click review and create. And uh, yes, you can go um, you can go into more detail and specify the type of uh, things you want on it. What does it say? It errored out? Required information is missing. What did we miss? basics oh <laughs> I made it too long the name of the virtual machine all right anyways we're going to click review and create so yeah you can go in there and specify the disk sizes and which network you want to use but again this is going to automatically put it into uh, the same the network that you need to but if you want to go in and specify disks you can go in there and specify type of disk you want if you want the premium you can certainly do so you can add uh, attach a disk on it this is all virtually uh, you know you, you can virtually do this in, in any type of uh, uh, virtual machine that you set up and then if you go to networking you can specify the network but Again, it's automatically going to put you into the correct network, so I'm not too worried about that. And there are some other things you can, you know, check and, and adjust. But again, I want to keep this very simple so that anybody can get this going on their own. All right. So review and create. Now it should let us, uh, it should approve the deployment of it once uh, it thinks about it a little bit here. And then we're going to click, click create, excuse me, and then we're going to deploy this machine as well it may take a little time you know these are not the fastest when it comes to uh, when it comes to creating virtual machine but it is pretty I should say it's pretty common to have this type of a uh, thing happening whenever you're using Google oh, I say Google because I use Google uh, quite often but um, when you use uh, cloud services of this sort but you know you know, I digress. Uh, it is pretty fast, uh, considering that it installs an operating system on a virtual machine. Okay, let's see what our process or what our status is. It's still deploying the first one. Let's see here. Now you can see right here that uh, once I clicked on the little bell that I have $197 in credit remaining. I'm just going to leave it here for in this window for a minute and you can see here what it's kind of doing when it's deploying it's creating that you know the virtual machines and then it's reserving an IP address for it as well and it's kind of uh, telling you that it is putting it in the correct network all right let me see here you know what let's go ahead and, and do another virtual machine but this time we're going to do a Linux machine and uh, yeah, this the first one is still creating. While we do that, I'm going to execute the other one. Uh, execute the uh, deployment of our third virtual machine, which is going to be Linux. So here we are again, resource group. We're going to make sure we check, check uh, Azure Tutorials. And I'm going to type in Linux for the name of this virtual machine. And I'm going to actually label it Ubuntu, because I'm going to select Ubuntu. Region is US Central again. And then we're going, just going to leave it here on Ubuntu server 18.04. And again, you have, you know, different options for different types of Linuxes. And I'm going to go, go back here and select our standard type of machine for Linux. And uh, I certainly don't want to use the slowest one. And, yep, that's the one. I'm going to select that. 
and um, when it comes to Ubuntu or Linux there are a couple of different ways you can access it you can use SSH public key so this is kind of confusing and this is another topic that you we would have to talk about and explain but it's just a different way of encrypt uh, encryption access that you can use and then use that a, a key to access it but that's confusing I don't want to um, talk about that I'm just gonna keep it to simple username and password just like we have on the other one just to keep it simple and the reason I'm doing this guys is because I have people who are new to computers that watch my content uh, you know it's I can talk about SSH public keys and and this and that but let's let's keep it simple guys I'm just gonna keep it simple so here we can change it uh, different sendings for the inbound ports uh, by the way if you are going to run a web server here you can select to have it open for those as well here this will allow all IP addresses to access your virtual machine now if you're going to use this type of uh, uh, setup you don't have to if you don't want to typically you would just leave the SSH because you don't want to keep yourself you know get you know open yourself up for the intrusion once you set up a web server you'll have a way to access it um, through the web server interface so you don't necessarily have to have these HTTPS open at this time at all so you can leave just SSH because that's typically how you would access a Linux server because it's a command line anyways so I uh, would just kind of leave it at SSH and, and for that um, once you deploy a web server for example you can block access to SSH externally there are different ways of doing it you can use it um, to uh, you can use uh, configuration on the server itself to block access to SSH ports but again we're going to uh, just kind of leave it at that for now I'm going to click review and create and then once it approves our deployment we're going to click create so keep it moving otherwise this video would have been God knows how long if I kept talking about every detail of things and it would be confusing as well okay let's see I'm just waiting for this window to go to the next window to kind of uh, confirm to me that it's submitted for deployment and hopefully hopefully our Windows 10 the first virtual machine is deployed already now I'm just kind of checking to see if everything is going right okay good good your deployment is underway all right so I'm gonna go back home I'm going to click on home you can go go back to home and see the things that we've touched on recently and uh, it takes a while to update actually right here it takes a bit to update but this is what would have show up typically of the new things that we've touched on or created or adjusted and it also does that in the dashboard if we go to the dashboard okay good we got a message here that deployment succeeded for one of our virtual machines we're going to check that here in a minute but you know what let's let's pin it to dashboard because I wanted to go to dashboard anyways that was my next I'm going to pin it to dashboard so let's see what that is so next thing under home here is dashboard so we're going to click on dashboard to see what's there all right looks like our Windows server is deployed oh where's our Windows 10 that's kind of weird didn't we have Windows 10 machine deployed as well did that succeed or not uh, all right well let's go to resources I'm going to click on go to resources Windows Server 2019 oh huh. this already deployed but not the Windows 10 that I asked for okay well let's go to our virtual machines again and see if it's there Oh, it's still creating it that's interesting so Windows Server 2019 actually deployed faster than Windows 10 it's still creating it huh that's very interesting anyways let's go ahead and see the overview of Windows Server 2019 so again we are on virtual machines 
and it, this will show you all the other ones that we created as well. So we're missing a Linux here, which is still being created, and it takes a while to refresh to see. So we're going to click on Windows Server because supposedly that one is already deployed. We can see our public IP address of it, and we can here connect to it. But I kind of wanted to show you overview of it in the sense to see what is there for you to actually look at besides just regular information that is there. I mean, yeah, sure, you can see the IP address on it, you can see the subscription, subscription ID, you know, computer name if available, uh, but, you know, and, and then type of, uh, type of um, CPU that you're running and this and that. And you should be able to change this once you click stop, and th that's a topic for another video. But right now I wanted to show you what is kind of important as an Azure administrator, and that is monitoring. Now, you can see that there are four different, uh, four different graphs here, and that are kind of, the reason there are four and these specific ones, because there is are kind of the most important ones that you would want to look at. First one is being CPU average. This is the usage of your CPU. And the next one is network usage, disk bytes, which involves read and write bytes at any given time. You can see it's, it gives you how much on the left column here and on the bottom it tells you the time of it and also it gives you this disk read and disk write in bytes and uh, then on the other one on the other one here over here next to it it says disk operations per second on average and it gives you different times the reason this is important to have is that if you suspect something suspicious going on, for example, let's say you're running a website or a web server or you suspect attack on your server, you can look at the different times and this different CPU usage, different um, different uh, operations on it that are happening at certain times. And uh, this doesn't give us a good example here because it's a brand new one, but let's go ahead and connect to it and we're going to do some stuff on it so that way it's going to give us some data here which we can get back to and I can kind of talk about it a little bit more because right now it doesn't really give us enough for me to talk about. So let's go ahead and click connect here and we're going to select RDP. All right, so what this does, it's going to download an RDP uh, file for us that we can just simply click and use it just a regular you know windows remote desktop uh, remote desktop protocol so we're going to click on that and it's going to save it i'm just trying to check in okay you don't see the pop-up but there's actually a pop-up that says uh, do you want to save this file or just open it i'm going to click open it i'm going to click connect i apologize you guys don't see the login on this recording but it is there so what I'm doing is just typing in the password and the login that I showed you before that I've set up upon the creation of this and I'm going to click OK I will show you the the uh, whatchamacallit the remote desktop as well as soon as I get it going here okay just a moment please bear with me I just need to add a different source, window capture. I need to capture that window just a moment. Please bear with me. Here we go, remote desktop. Here we are. All right, there you guys, there you go. I hope you can see it. It's loading right now. So I'm going to, let's see here. Hope it doesn't break the The stupid recording window software is not is not being good to me. All right, looks like it's showing the RDP there, and it's creating it. You know the typical thing: the first time you log in, it's going to create your local profile, and it's going to take a bit to load. It's you know th this is very typical. Uh, you just kind of have to wait for it to start and get going and here it is finally coming up so this is our windows server machine pretty soon we're going to see that windows server setup configuration there and then it's just like using a you know regular windows server machine you is if you were there you guys know what remote desktop is but then again you have this goes to show you that you have full access to it Okay, now I'm going to go back to that overview and kind of look at those graphs with you and tell you kind of for the things to, to kind of look for when it comes to monitoring this type of a system. And then 
I'm going to show you the other machines as well depending how long this takes and see here it is here's that typical thing where it asks you to do you want to allow this PC to be discoverable and we're going to click yes for that so there you go this is typically what happens or what you see when you install Windows Server and uh, I'm just going to minimize this and go back to our Azure window okay there we are okay so we're going to click on overview again just so you can see all the things that are be that are happening on the window uh, on the um, Windows uh, 2019 server so since we've logged into it we saw more activity now we can see that at this time which is at 12 13 p.m. we can see that there is more CPU activity As a matter of fact they spiked to almost 100 percent and at the same time you can see that it kind of moves the other uh, diagrams or uh, graphs at the same time so that way you can see what is going on at the same time so it kind of aligns it for you and now now you can see there is more read and write which is pretty normal it gives you the disk reads down here where it says 137 megabytes and then disk writes of 483 megabytes so this is happening as we are creating our local profile and at the same time we see some network activity and that is you know it says Windows Server is network in total is 147 megabytes and network out total is uh, let's see it's still happening it's at 1.27 megabytes so it downloaded 147 megabytes of data and it uploaded 100, uh, 1 megabyte uh, 1.27 megabytes and then we get more disk operations so why is this important why am I telling you about this if you suspect somebody hacking in to your system you might want to kind of look at the spikes in the graph otherwise you'll be just normal or just a little jagged like this normally this is pretty normal operation just kind of idling but when it comes to huge spikes like this you want to kind of look at this and see what is happening now if it's just a web server and you see increase in traffic you know people using your website and you see a spike like this but then you look at your other monitoring tools for the live traffic of people coming through and you see a spike on your server that's not normal right but if you suddenly see a spike at a certain time then you might want to see if there is some kind of a you know attack on your server or whatnot or if there's some kind of a you know who knows maybe even a virus happening on your computer if you have abnormal disk reads a bytes or CPU usage all right, so the next thing I'm going to do is look at other things that are here under the overview. There are a bunch of different things here that we can look at that help you deal with this type of stuff and things that you can change. So if you click, for example, on networking here under settings, you can look at the network settings of it and gives you more information on it. You can add inbound port rules if you want to open up. Uh, you know uh, the different uh, ports or not you can at the same time you can disable one so here's our RDP here and we can disable it if we want so if you're occasionally accessing this Windows Server using the RDP you might want to delete it so that way you're you know you're more protected nobody can really you know try to access it afterwards and then same thing uh, when it comes to disks if you click on disks here um, you can you know make changes to it if you'd like uh, a lot of times we have to stop the um, the service from running I'm not exactly sure if that's the case here with the Azure systems uh, we can certainly try that and then we got a bunch of different monitoring uh, things that we can look at so one of the things that I showed you there are those graphs and there is a different way to look at that as well if you want to more customize and cleaner way of doing it if you click on the little hamburger thing uh, sign you can go down here and select monitor and you can look at uh, monitoring uh, metrics of it so if you click here explore metrics you can add different graphs that you can look at again I don't want to confuse you too much with this again this is just another way of looking at the same thing except in a more detailed manner where you can make adjustments and change the different metrics that you want to look at and here's a, just a real quick if we click here on the scope this allows you to select our resource so if we select our Azure subscription one we know this is where our resource group is at and then we can click Azure tutorial and then we're going to look down here for our server 
and for some reason it's not scrolling down but that's okay no problem we know that we have that service and to click on resource type I'm going to uncheck select all I'm going to just click virtual machines because that's the only thing I want to look at for now and I'm going to close that and now it's going to come up and say well you have three virtual machines which ones do you want to monitor I'm going to click I'm going to click Windows Server 2019 I'm going to select that and now it's asking me to select a metric so we can kind of replicate to you know what we've seen previously we can kind of select I don't know let's see disk read operations per second uh, we had that over there and then the graph is going to come up and show us you can see here and uh, there's that then we can you know add more to it or we can add another metric and uh, in a way where you can just select what was the other one network out total let's see where's our network network in total I should say and there was an out as well and it gives you that and it those they give you kind of side by side but if you want them to you know uh, kind of stack on top of each other you can certainly do that as well I'm just gonna move it to the right here to move the timeline but again there's not much going on right now so there really isn't much to look at and let me just try one more here CPU there's I want to look for the uh, CPU one percentage CPU here we go average okay and it gives you see it's it's just not enough for us to kind of visualize anyways the machine is just too new for us to actually for this to work properly because it hasn't even replicated completely we know there's a lot more going on it's just that it takes time and these things kind of take time to replicate for you to use this properly but anyways it's all here it's just a different way of looking at it and if you want to get a more you know in-depth analysis of what's going on with the usage of that machine you can certainly do that all right let's go to other virtual machines uh, we can look at Windows 10 but it's kind of the same thing um, yeah I, I went ahead and stopped it early I don't know if you guys seen that but I went ahead and stopped it from working but it's because the way I access it is the same as Windows Server 2019 I just want to show you that you can deploy that let's go ahead and click our Linux Ubuntu machine the way you can connect to this is if you click on the connect you can use SSH you can use RDP but if we click on RDP you can see that we have to install certain things on our computer in order to access this this is not going to actually work so if I click download RDP it's not going to actually let me work to it typically you would um, and it's closed we know that the port is closed anyways so um, we can choose to connect with SSH with the key thing this and that but you know I don't I don't want to do that there's an easiest way to connect to this and if you scroll down under this all the way down there is a thing called serial console so if we click on that it will give us the same access as if it was SSH I believe now uh, it's going to ask us for our password so we can actually have access to our console but once we go in there uh, it's just the easier way to accessing it as soon as it comes up here it's going to ask us for our password and we're going to be able to you know browse it uh, it's just that you know once you the way the only difference is that it's it's not a pop-out window you know and for me it actually works out for me to show you like this and uh, okay log in I'm going to type in my login name and I'm going to type in my password I'm gonna hit enter and as soon as it thinks about it we will have access and there it is we have full access to this server so if we do for example ls a it's going to show us what's inside of these different uh, folders and we can make adjustments you know updated do all kinds of different things we can create more monitoring we can install different uh, get app um, system analysis monitoring things that we can do okay anyways this is how you can access the Linux server and just kind of you know go through it and and, and look at different things but right now we're just going to show you some uh, let's see here CDVR VAR LS and it just kind of to show you that you can go in and browse if you want to you know run something you you know you can just type in sudo you know which is super user invoking a super user 
and then I don't know we can just type in sudo I don't know vi and this is going to create a new uh, document this is just you know regular document that you can create and you know in you know install on there and whatnot and um, yeah so there you go guys this is the intro to Microsoft Azure virtual machines I hope you like this video let me know what you think let me know if you like my style of teaching I, it, this is it's really hard to teach without being super technical so I'm really uh, trying to try my best not to sound too confusing because if I was to go into Linux here and, and try to do all kinds of different things it would be way too much in just one video for a person to absorb not I'm not saying everybody because you know a lot of people are knowledgeable and that they would like to see this type of stuff but I do want to teach everybody you know at least give them some kind of confidence to get and kind of get into this type of stuff to start with and once they get into it then they can you know learn more about it on their own or you know watching or, or learning or you know from other people and this and that but the best way to learn is to actually get in there and, and try you know do things uh, on it all right um, in the next video uh, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it I will talk about uh, storage containers we're going to use some scripting to add the storage containers we're going to create some file shares and how to go in there and add them to different machines and it's it's pretty cool stuff guys all right thanks so much for watching have a good day bye bye Hello my dear friends, welcome to the best all-in-one refresher course for IT professionals. Information presented is in question and answer format in order to simplify the memory retention. This video contains basic IT knowledge for the following categories. Desktop support, network administration, system administration, web development, and help desk. If you appreciate this valuable information, please return the favor by sharing it with friends. And now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this fun video. Because this information is derived from previous videos that are based off interview questions and answers, I will be omitting first question because it relates to job interview. You've received a trouble ticket that PC monitor is not working. What is the first thing you should do? The first thing you should do is check to see if all cables are plugged in correctly. First check power, then video signal cable, and if both check out, make sure the computer itself is powered on. If asked for further troubleshooting steps, Explain that there is a possibility that video driver or PC hardware could be causing the issue. Question number three. What is safe mode? How do you get to it? And what is it used for? In order to reach safe mode, computer must be restarted. And by pressing F8 key before the OS loads, you will arrive at a selection screen at which you will scroll up to select safe mode. Safe mode is used to troubleshoot driver issues, hardware issues, and remove viruses or unwanted software. Question number four. What is an IP address and how to find it? IP address is a number assigned to your computer to identify its existence or location on a network, meaning that DHCP server will assign a number to each computer connected to a network as part of identification. You can find your IP address by opening a command prompt window, CMD, and type in ipconfig forward slash all. Alternatively, you can look at, a, at network adapter properties. Question number five, what is a default gateway? You can see what the default gateway is by performing an ipconfig forward slash all command through CMD. Default gateway serves as path to reach other networks. 
For example, in order to reach the internet outside of your business or home, you need a gateway that will open the way for you. Default gateway in a business environment is typically a proxy server. Question number six, what is Active Directory? Active Directory is a feature of Windows Server OS and contains user accounts, objects, host names, group policies, and the main services. For example, Active Directory will have information about a user login credentials. In addition, it can contain group policy that will apply different permissions to user accounts that belong to specific groups within organization within a domain. Question number seven, what is a domain? Leading in from the previous question, domain is a group of computers and users connected to a network. A user will have domain login access once their credentials are created, added to the specific domain within Active Directory. In other words, your PC login will most likely be a domain login. As a side note, PC host names must be added to the same domain, but user can still log in even if the computer is attached to another domain within the same network. Question number eight. You receive a trouble ticket that states, my printer is not working properly. It prints out weird pattern on the paper. Please assist. This issue is caused by a bad or wrong printer driver. Solution is to acquire and install a correct printer driver. Question number nine. What are some commonly used LAN cables? There are four different types of LAN cables. CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, and CAT6A. CAT speeds are up to 100 megabits per second. CAT5E up to 1000 megabits per second. CAT6 up to 1000 megabits per second certified gigabit. And CAT6A up to 10,000 megabits per second. All the speeds are based off 100 meters maximum distance. Question number 10. What is blue screen of death? Blue screen of death is most commonly caused by bad hardware. The error appears as a blue screen crashing the computer. Blue screen of death can be caused by hardware, software, or driver issues and conflicts. In order to troubleshoot blue screen of death, you will need to run a full hardware diagnostic on the PC and update all of the drivers. Question number 11. What is DHCP? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, and it deals with handling of IP addresses for all computers connected to a network. Each computer is allowed to have connection to the network or internet resources after DHCP server assigns an IP address dynamically. Dynamic type of IP address can change at any point. Question number 12, what is DNS? DNS stands for Domain Name System, and it reroutes known host names to IP address that hosts its service. For example, DNS for www.microsoft.com is located at 104.90.84.14, but it can change randomly. You can say that it serves as an address book for the host names, which are then translated into numbers in order for computers to understand it. In this example, it assigns and routes web address names to web hosting services. Question number 13. What is VPN? A virtual private network is commonly used as a secure way to connect from remote location to network resources in your business or company. For example, 
You can take your laptop to a coffee shop, start a VPN, and through it securely connect to a PC at work or access company's email and files. Question number 14. What is a ping command and its use? Generally, the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. Through command prompt, type ping www.microsoft.com. This function sends four packets of data which are sent back as acknowledgement of successful connection. It also provides the latency results measured in milliseconds. Question number 15. What is a group policy? Active Directory assigns a group policy to each new user added into the database. For example, if you work in desktop support, your user login credentials and permissions will be assigned to a group policy. In Active Directory, you can take any user and place them into a group that has predetermined settings. Group policy can restrict read, write, or execute, and restrict access to network resources. Question number 16. What is a PST file? .pst is a file extension used by Microsoft Outlook archive file. An email archive would be commonly known as a PST. Question number 17. How would you change folder permissions? You can change folder permissions through group policy, but it can also be done at local level with administrator privileges. Under Folder Properties, select Security tab and then Edit button, after which a pop-up will provide an ability to add users and allow for read, write, execute, or full permissions. Question number 18. What is a difference between a switch and a hub? There are a couple of main differences between switch and a hub. Hub can be used to connect multiple computers to a single network, while switch can be used to create multiple segments of the same network. Second difference is that with a hub, all computers connected to it receive the data packets at once, which create latency issues. Switch can regulate this by only sending the packets to computer that requested it. Question number 19. How would you recover data from a virus-infected computer? In order to successfully and safely recover data, you would extract the hard drive from the infected computer slave it to a second computer that has updated virus definitions, updated Microsoft patches and drivers. From there, you would scan the drive for viruses, and once virus is removed, you can extract the data that needs to be recovered. Question number two. Explain the role of Windows Server. Windows Server is an operating system that uses a centralized computer that provides specific functions, predetermined rules for users, and computers connected to a network. Question number three. What is Windows Domain? Windows Domain is a centralized location for user accounts, computers, printers, and security features as part of database controlled by a domain controller. Question number four. What is DNS and which port does it use? DNS stands for Domain Name System and it's mostly used to interpret domain names into numeric IP address. DNS uses port 53 TCP or UDP. Question number five. How many queries does DNS perform and which ones? D 
DNS performs two types of queries, iterative and recursive. Question number six. What is Active Directory? A service of Windows Server operating system, Active Directory is used for user and computer authentication within a domain. It can also enforce security policies and install software to computers connected to a domain. Question number seven. Active Directory database is located where? Using file name ntds.dit, it is located in the system root folder ntds. Question number eight. What is a lingering object? If an object is deleted from Active Directory, while the main controller is offline, it can create a lingering object. When object is deleted from Active Directory, a tombstone, which is a temporary file, is created, which then has to be replicated by the main controller before it expires. Question number nine. How do you backup Active Directory? Active Directory can be backed up by using NT Backup Tool that comes with 2003 server. With 2008 server, a command prompt is used to perform backup. Type wb admin space start space system state backup space dash backup target colon e colon question number 10 do you know what garbage collection is garbage collection is a process designed to free space inside active directory this is performed by default every 12 hours, a defrag function. Question number 11. Do you know what sys vol folder is? System volume folder is a directory that houses a copy of the main files found on a local hard drive within the main controller. This data is shared for purpose of replication across the main, for example, user logon scripts and Windows group policy. Question number 12. What is RAID? stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks and is used to provide data redundancy mirroring across multiple hard disks. It can also be utilized to improve read-write performance across the server by using striping configuration. For example, RAID 1, two or more disks with identical data store redundancy. RAID 0, two or more disks, data distributed evenly to improve performance, no redundancy. Question number 13. Which commands would you use in command prompt to test network connectivity? To test network connectivity, ping and IP config commands are used. Question number 14. What does Interly Mirror do? 
As part of Windows Server operating system, Interly Mirror provides assistance in managing user data, computer information, applications, and settings. This is used by user group policy that defines business roles, group memberships, and locations. For example, if a user moves to a different computer, the applications, settings, and stored files will follow. Question number 15. Explain what group policy is. A group policy is used to control users' desktops and computer configuration by creating a default template for specific members of the group. This makes it easier to control and process large groups of users. Question number 16. Can you name different types of email servers and which ports do they use? You can have two types of email servers. Incoming mail server, POP3, port 110, IMAP port 143, HTTP port 80. You can also have outgoing mail server, SMTP.